Welcome to I.O. I'm Raghavan, a product lead on Firebase. This talk is how to grow your app with Firebase. So as you know, Firebase is a suite of products to help you develop your app, grow your user base, and make money. Our goal at Firebase is to make app success simpler. And this includes a range of tools to help you develop your app. But we also care about helping you grow your business. And the new Grow Pillar in Firebase is our first step in that direction. To see how it can help, let's meet Mary, who's building a brand new app. Her focus in the beginning is not user acquisition. Her focus is to figure out, is there a market for her app? Her questions are like, are people using it? What are they doing with it? And does it solve a problem for them? Firebase Analytics can help her answer these questions. She integrates the core Firebase SDK, and Analytics starts tracking key metrics like usage and retention. And as she iterates with her app, it shows her how her metrics change by cohort. And once she gets to product market fit, then she's ready for growth. Her approach to growth is to focus first on retention and then on user acquisition. She understands there's no point in acquiring users if you can't actually keep them. So her goal is to ensure that when she acquires a group of users, a good fraction of them stick around and become long-term users. Once an app has good retention, then effort spent on user acquisition is worth it. From every cohort that she acquires, a good fraction stick around. And this is what leads to growth. To help you with growth, Firebase has five products that help you acquire and engage on Google Search, on devices that have the app installed, on with web, email, and SMS channels, wherever you can use URLs, and with paid ads. These products to help you acquire and engage are complemented by two products that help you measure what's happening and that lets you, let you quickly iterate through experiments. So Mary decides to start integrating with Firebase, to start her, her journey on growth by integrating and trying out the first and easiest product, which is get her app into Google's index. By doing this, Google Search can surface her app whenever it's relevant. To tell us more about app indexing, please welcome Jennifer Lin. Thanks, Raghavan. Hi, I'm Jennifer Lin, the Eng Lead for App Indexing. So what is App Indexing? It's similar to indexing the web, but for apps. We index content from Android and iOS apps, and then we rank and serve the app content on Google Search. So why should you care about app indexing? Well, there are more than 100 billion searches per month on Google. And more Google searches take place on mobile devices than on computers in 10 countries, including US and Japan. So how can you get these billions of mobile searches to your apps? The answer is app indexing. App indexing brings organic traffic from Google search to your Android and iOS apps. It not only drives re-engagement, but it also helps increase installs. Let's see how app indexing achieves this with examples from integrated apps. Users that have these apps installed can see search results that are enhanced with your app icon and your app name. These search results are also ranked higher. Tapping on them takes users directly to the right content within the app, such as the Homes for Sale page in Realtor.com app, the Kokari restaurant page in the TripAdvisor app, or the top 10 Tokyo hotels page in the Expedia app. App indexing not only brings you organic traffic from the Google search result pages, but also from search auto completions. Let's say some users signed up on their Eventbrite app to attend the Maker Fair event. And a day before the event, they wanted to check the details. While typing in the Google search box, they get a search auto completion result for the Maker Fair event. And tapping this opens the right page within the Eventbrite app. 
In addition to driving re-engagement from search auto-completions, app indexing brings you organic traffic from Google Now on tap, both of which are currently available only on Android. Let's say my friend received an email to watch a movie. When she taps and holds the Home button on Android, Google Now on Tap slides up with the relevant content, including her installed apps like IMDb and Wikipedia, which are our best guess of what might be helpful for her in the moment. Tapping on the IMDb app icon takes her straight to the Martian page within the app. So once you've integrated with app indexing, Google Search re-engages your install base from the search result pages, search auto-completions, and Google Now on tap. But what about the users who haven't installed your apps? Yesterday's keynote announced Android Instant Apps, which run instantly without requiring installation. When an app becomes an instant app, users can now discover it on Google Search. The search results will still show the app icon and app name, but now with the text instant. Tapping on them takes you directly to the right place within the instant app. And later on, users can upgrade to installing the app. By publishing your app in the Play Store and the App Store, Google Search shows results for installing your app, like these. It's possible that the search result for installing an app like Cookpad isn't ranked high. Here we see search results from Cookpad's website and knowledge panel. But after integrating with app indexing, the search result for installing Cookpad is now ranked higher. So app indexing can help you influence the ranking of your search results so that you can get more installs from Google Search. So how is app indexing doing? We first launched app indexing in December 2013 with 13 apps. And two and a half years later, tens of thousands of apps like Pinterest, Twitter, Cookpad, and Mintra have integrated. We now have over 200 billion app URLs in the index. We also have success stories from apps like The Guardian, Etsy, AliExpress, and Amoeba. All of them have seen increased traffic to their app content. For example, AliExpress, a shopping marketplace, increased their transaction value by 200% from users who ordered from app URLs compared to users who ordered from mobile web URLs. As introduced in yesterday's keynote, app indexing is now part of Firebase. This means you'll now access app indexing from the Firebase SDK. Uh, this is the same app indexing product for those of you who've already integrated. So what do you need to do to get the benefits of app, of app indexing? There's two steps to integrating with app indexing. First, you need to get your app content on Google Search. You can do this by adding HTTP URLs to your app. We discourage custom scheme URIs because we think it's easier and cleaner to maintain one set of HTTP URLs for cross-platform content. Second, <clears throat> second you, need, you can get your app content ranked higher on Google Search in order to get more installs and more re-engagement. You can do this by calling the App Indexing API. Now I'll briefly go over each step, first for iOS apps, then for Android apps. On iOS, the first step is to implement universal links, which was introduced in iOS 9. In your entitlements.p list, you need to associate your iOS app with your domain. In this example, seatgeek.com. Then you need to create and host an Apple App Site association file that associates your domain with your app ID and includes the HTTP URLs that your app can handle. In this example, seatgeek.com slash star dash tickets. The second step is to call the app indexing API with your iTunes ID. So Google can show your app icon and app name in the search results to your install base. You can find this API in the Firebase iOS SDK. On Android, the first step is to implement app links. In your manifest, 
every activity that you want Google Search to send traffic to needs to specify the HTTP URLs that your app can handle. In this example, events.google.com, IO2016, schedule star. Then you need to create and host an assetlinks.json file that associates your domain with your app package name. In this example, we're associating events.google.com with the Google I.O. app. You can find, oh, I'm sorry. And then the second step is to call the app indexing API with the title and the HTTP URL of the page that the user viewed. This is so Google can rank your search results higher. And you can find this API in the Firebase Android SDK. Next, you can verify your app indexing integration with the Search Preview tool. This tool lets you preview what your search results will look like for a given app URL. Otherwise, it returns error messages to help you fix your implementation. Now you're done. Within 24 hours to a few days, Google Search will start indexing your app. Once that's completed, you can go to the Google Search Console to measure your app's performance on Google Search. The Search Console provides search, uh, search impressions and clicks for your app content, as well as any error reports for, from indexing your app. We've also started an early access program with partners like Viber and LinkedIn to index personal content, such as messages and documents. To learn more and to sign up, please attend our deep dive session on app indexing today at 2 PM at stage 7. At this point, Mary's Android and iOS apps get organic traffic and more installs from the billions of mobile searches on Google. The next thing Mary can do to increase user retention is Firebase remote configuration and Firebase notifications. To tell us more, please welcome Francesco. Thank you, Jennifer. Good morning. Let's see how remotely configuring your application can actually help you drive user engagement. If you recall, at the beginning of this session, Raghavan talked about Mary focusing on retention before acquisition. That's because retention plays a really big role in a success story of application development. Mary has a problem. Her users, when they try the application, they stop midway during the sign-up flow. And this is a common problem. Sign-up flows, onboarding flows, they tend to have a lot of friction. Raghavan himself, before joining Google, he was working on an application called Odyssey that lets you manage and upload photos in the background. And the big day when it came and they launched the application, he saw that only 30% of the population would complete the sign-up flow and use the app. So what they did is they went back, packaged a new APK, published in the App Store, back and forth every two or three weeks. Now you fast forward seven months, and they reach the staggering result of 80% sign-up flow completion, which is a pretty good result for all of us and Mary. But what Mary doesn't like is the churn, the investment, the seven months that took to get there. But Mary is lucky, because now there is Firebase, and she doesn't need to do so. Let me introduce a new service called Firebase Remote Config which lets you instrument your application so that you can change the values of the variables that you use in the application and change the behavior or, or of your application on the fly. Firebase Remote Config is a, a web console where you can go and, and manually change all the variables that you use to instrument. And then you can select populations of devices, like different groups of devices at the same time, where you can apply those new values. So you can select groups of devices based on language, country, application version, operating system type, and more. And for each of these set, you can specify a small percentage of population that gets the new values first. So you can do staged rollouts. Staged rollouts are important for two main things. One, if you activate a new code path or change the behavior, you might have a bug. And you can contain the damage on a small population. And two, you can collect early feedback for your features. So let's say that Mary has a buy button in the application. But she doesn't get much traction. She wants to try if the label to 
get or try gets more traction. So she can do so with staging the rollout. And this last example will be very useful for Mary to target the population of users that actually made the purchase. We integrated Firebase Remote Config with Firebase Analytics, so now we can do that. In the sign-up flow, Mary could target those users that initiated the sign-up flow and then fell off to try a new flow. Firebase Remote Config works for both iOS and Android. And to get started, it's really simple. You pull in the Firebase SDK. And this is an Objective-C example in iOS. You initialize Firebase Remote Config. You do an initial fetch when the application opens. And now you can play with your variables throughout the code. We have a deep dive session tomorrow about config. Uh, please join us if you want to learn more. But you can use it today for free, and it's available to everybody. Now, back to our sign up flow example. Mary now can do A B testing to see what works and what doesn't. And in every A B testing experiment, there is the lucky population that gets to exper experience the good flow on A, and the not so lucky population that gets a not so good flow on B. So how does Mary get those users to try the application again now that figures out the good flow? One very powerful tool to do so are notifications. Notifications are those messages that get displayed in front of a user. They grab their attention, and they let them do something. Notifications are really powerful. Uh, there are studies that show that users that opt in into notifications are 90% more likely to come back into the app as opposed to those that don't. A few years back, we launched a very powerful tool that lets you send messages and notifications called Google Cloud Messaging. You guys aware of it? Anybody use it? We launched a new version of it this year at Firebase called Firebase Cloud Messaging, which is a very similar service, just a richer API. This service lets you send all the messages that you want. But sometimes sending too many messages drives the opposite effect. We overwhelm our users and they either silence the notifications or uninstall the app. So it's very important to figure out when we should send a notification, who should we target, and what is the content of the notification. And it's not an easy task. So to help you in this task at Firebase, we decided to build a new product on top of Firebase Cloud Messaging called Firebase Notifications. Firebase Notification is a web console where Mary can go in and type, hey, please, come back, try a new flow. And you can target users based on language, country, application version, and more. And it's also integrated with analytics. So she can target the users that try the sign up flow first and then drop off. Firebase Notification is a, a, compo a composed analyze feedback loop where you can keep improving your engagement strategies by analyzing what worked and what not with analytics. In fact, Firebase Analytics comes right away with a funnel analysis. In our example of try the sign up flow again of Mary, what Firebase Notification tells her is during the campaign, how many messages have been sent so far. And also, out of the box, it tells how many users opened that notification and came back to the app. Now, what's important to Mary is to know of those users that came back, how many do complete the sign up flow. So she goes on the Firebase notification, set up the goal, and Firebase notification tells her, like, of those 500 and plus, now 300 got completed at Cineflow. When we built these products in Firebase, we partnered with some early access partners that helped us shape the products and gave us feedback. One of these partners was BusBud, which is an application that lets you buy bus tickets. And they use Firebase notification in a very similar way as Mary did. When the user starts a purchase of a ticket and then doesn't complete it, they send a notification to get them back to the app. And their conversion event is those users that finally made the purchase. Another partner is Aces. They build a home management application. And they use Firebase notification to notify the users when there are new features. As I mentioned, Firebase notification is built on top of Firebase Cloud Messaging, so it's available for both iOS and Android. And to use it to get started, you don't even have to write code. You just make sure that you pull in the dependency. This is a pod 5 for iOS of Firebase Cloud Messaging. Here is a great little example for Android. And you're done. If you want to learn more, there is a session 
this afternoon called Firebase Notifications, where we're going to show some demos of how easy and powerful this product is. So now back to Mary. He has a very engaged population because they use app indexing, remote config, Firebase Notifications, and their next goal is to increase the population. How she, does she acquire new users? One powerful tool is dynamic links. Please welcome back Raghavan to tell you all about that. Thank you, Fran Thank you, Francesco. So Mary is now ready to start active marketing for her, her app, which now has great, atten great attention. And this includes basically putting posts on social media, by email, by SMS, even some physical sources like putting URLs and NFC tags on billboards, perhaps. But all these marketing sources have one thing in common. They're, they are based upon URLs being posted. And Mary wants two things first from these URLs. First, these URLs need to have analytics and attribution so that she can figure out how they are performing and which users are coming from which channels. The second, she wants them to be short so that she can post them on uh, SMS and Twitter and, and media that require short sources. But she also wants the URLs to tackle some other problems. When the URL is tapped, Mary really wants to provide the best possible experience. And this best experience depends on a few things. When the app is installed, she may want to open the app. And opening the app actually depends on is, is the link being clicked on a modern platform that supports HTTP URLs or not. And even if it is, if the link is clicked, for example, on a web view inside iOS 9, it doesn't automatically obey universal links. You have to use a custom scheme. If it's an older platform, like pre-Android M or iOS 8, you have to use custom schemes. If the app is not installed, she may want to choose, should I take them to an app install flow, or should I take them to mobile web? And if she does take them to mobile web, what page she shows would actually depend on where the user is and what they were doing. So doing all this can get complicated. So Firebase Dynamic Links provides a single URL that handles all these cases. It does two things. First, it lets you configure for each of these cases what you want the user to experience. And second, when the link is actually tapped, it detects a client that is trying to access the link and then execute the right code so that the user gets the right experience on that particular client. So we are launching this today with a limited set of core features. So when Mary starts using dynamic links, her app gets its own subdomain under app.goo.gl. And once she has her subdomain, she can actually put this in her app and make this a universal link or app link so that clicks on this will open in the app if the app is installed. So with this URL, she can then start adding query parameters to configure what the URL does when it's actually clicked and to configure the behavior. Here, the URL has one parameter, which is basically a deep link that needs to be given to the app when it's opened. So we recommend a two-step process to start using dynamic links. Step one is to set up regular deep linking in your app. This is basically using your own domain to deep link into the app to create deep links which open the app and they're installed. And if the app is not installed, it just goes to mobile web. These links don't provide tracking or any of those features, but that is the first step to get started. Step two is to set up dynamic links. This requires getting an app code, just like we saw earlier, and, and then calling our APIs which we'll go into briefly in a little bit. So dynamic links have three properties. They're dynamic, which means that first, as we talked about, you can specify the behavior you want. And second, the link will detect the client where, that is accessing it and try to make that behavior possible. Okay? Some other things that you can do with these links is you can ask it to check, is the right Android app version installed? If it is not, take the user through an upgrade flow. You can configure different apps to be installed depending on the platform, iOS or, or you know, on iPhone or iPad. You can, on desktop, you can make sure it behaves properly even though it's meant to be a mobile link. It behaves properly on, on most, most platforms, Android Preem, iOS 8, whether the link is clicked in a web view in all these cases. So with all these parameters, here's an example of a link uh, with a few more parameters specified. And as you add parameters, the link can get pretty long. And this is fine if the link is being used as a href in an email or in a web page. But if the link is being used in a text message 
or on Twitter, you want something shorter. So dynamic links has a built-in URL shortener, which lets you shorten these links on the same subdomain that the app has been allocated. And you can post these wherever you want. The second property of dynamic links is that they're durable. This means that the links can survive app installs. So let's take a look at a few, a few apps that have used both these features to provide a great experience for their users. So here is an app where a user landing from an email finds out that the app is not installed. And so he has to go through an app install flow. And after the app install, since the app doesn't know why they came here, it takes the user through an onboarding flow. And at the end of it, the user has to go back, has to find a search screen in the app, and then search for the content they came for. Right? It takes them over a dozen clicks to get to what they want when they actually clicked on the link. With dynamic links, the app knows why the user installed the app on first open. And it can directly take the user to the desired screen, reducing it, in this case, to four clicks. So what benefit does this bring? So one of our partners who actually improved their onboarding, a link-based onboarding with this flow, saw that retention after four weeks increased by 92% for users who came from links. So this is, this is one more use case, and this is Shazam, uh, who is running a very interesting promotion on Android where they have Coke bottles, and you can scan a special text or logo on the Coke bottle, which takes you to a very special lip syncing experience. And once you record your lip sync, you can share it on social media. When you tap and your friend taps on that social media share, they are taken to a mobile web view where they can play that shared video. And then they are given the option, a call to action allows them to actually make their own video. But making the video needs the app. So if you didn't have dynamic links, this particular use case would require multiple buttons here. One for the case, I have the app, OK, click on the link and take me to the app. And a second for the case, I don't have the app, so take me to the app store to download it, and then I hope I'll find the experience in the app. With dynamic links, it handles both these use cases with a single click, and in both cases, takes the user to the right experience. This is a third use case where if you have a lot of users on your desktop app, then you can use dynamic links to convert them to mobile app users if that can get them to a better experience. So if the user has searched for some, some content on the desktop, then you can offer them the option to email that to themselves, which is what they're doing over here. Right? And when they get that email, the email can be clicked on any platform. And if it happens to be a phone, an iOS or Android device, then it that email contains a dynamic link which detects, is the app installed? If it is, open the app at the right place. If it is not, install the app, and the app can take them to the right place on first open. And if it ends up on a platform where there is no app for that particular service, then it can take them to a default web page for that particular platform. So the third property of dynamic links is attribution. Dynamic links are built for growth. And growth is all about measurement. So dynamic links come with analytics and tracking. You can specify UTM parameters on the link. And these parameters automatically show up and propagate to Firebase Analytics. And you can, track, you can attribute a conversion events to figure out, hey, this particular conversion event that happened, you know, which source medium campaign it came from. Firebase Console also shows you all the links you have created and the number of clicks on each one and their trend lines as to how they are performing. We also know that one of the big use cases of these links is app installs. And installs do show up on Firebase, but sometimes you also want the installs to show up properly attributed in the app store itself. So we can do that too. So Firebase, so on each link, you can add, this is an iOS example, you can add the affiliate tracking parameters. So if this link results in an iOS app install, then in the iOS App Store, it will be properly attributed to these campaigns that you have on the link. So what does it take to actually implement dynamic links? So we already saw that we start off the first two steps, which is to get going with the regular deep links and to get an app code. What's left 
is to actually call our API. And we'll go over that very briefly here. So since dynamic links are part of Firebase, setup is straightforward. They get set up as part of Firebase. Once they are set up, you need on iOS, our API needs to be called in two places, in open URL and in continue user activity. In both those places, the API call lets you check the URL that came, is that a dynamic link or not? And if it is, you, the link is given to you for you to process and handle. It's similar on Android. On Android, once an app is installed, you can actually open the app from three places. It could be opened directly from the Play Store. It can be opened from the notification that comes where, that says, hey, a new app has been installed. Or you may open it for the first time from the launcher. So to make sure that the deep link propagates properly, in all these three cases, we have a new API called Get Invitation, which needs to be called in your main activity on Create. Okay? So for more details on these APIs and for any questions about this, please be sure to come to our session that's about dynamic links and invites today at 11. So in this section, we have seen how dynamic links provides Mary with powerful URLs for marketing. One of the big use cases for her, her user acquisition with dynamic links is actually sharing, uh, sharing by users who already have the app. And this is such an important use case and such a common use case that we had actually built an out-of-the-box flow for this called App Invites and, uh, and announced that at last I.O. So App Invites is now part of Firebase as Firebase Invites. Okay? So Invites now leverages Google Smarts and dynamic links to provide a very effective invite flow for email and SMS from start to finish. Let's take a look at how this works in, in a sample app, and this is Yumly. So each content screen has a share button, and tapping on that leads to a share sheet. And in the share sheet, Firebase Invites allows you to have a single button for sharing by both email and SMS. Having a single button that lets you do both increases the number of shares by 10%. When you tap on the Invite button, it leads to the UI, the Composer UI. And in the Composer UI, Invites actually shows the user suggestions on who they should share with. The users from this list are 40% more likely to actually engage with the email than the everyone list that comes later. For each person in this list, Invites also suggests the best channel to reach them is an email or it is an SMS. Invites now allows you to fully customize the email. So you can have a rich HTML email. In this case, they are showing a nice uh, recipe. And a call to action that says, hey, open this, this particular uh, item in the app. The link used inside this is a dynamic link. So when the app opens, it knows why the user came in here for. So the app can show the context. It can show the item they came in for and take the user to the, to the desired experience. And we already know from dynamic links that delighting the user like this on the first open has a very big impact on retention. So what does it take to implement invites? On iOS, the first step is to basically create an invite dialog object. And then you set it up, and then you just call it. So an and Android is equally straightforward. You create an intent builder. You create intent from an intent builder, and then you activate it. So let's take a look at one app that is using invites to, as part of a very effective sharing flow. This is Skyscanner, which is an app for business travel. And what they have done is they have actually used Firebase Analytics to identify the users who like their app. So in the app, they ask them, do you like this app? And they, get, they ask you to rate the app from 1 to 5. Right? And people who rated 4 or 5 are the people who love the app. So they, they make an audience of these people who like the app. And they, then they target these people. Hey, you know, since you like the app so much, why don't you invite this, your friends to also try the app? Maybe they can might benefit from it. And that flow leads them through the Firebase invites flow. Okay. What, the, what they have found from early results is that the invite sent from this flow result in about so 70 to 80% of the invites sent from this flow are resulting in actual app installs. So it's an amazing conversion rate from this flow. To learn more 
about both invites and dynamic links. We have a dedicated session at 11 today. Please join us there. So by now, Mary's app has got high LTV. It's got great, you know, it has got great, great retention. She has organic channels for acquiring users. So she is now ready for paid growth. So Firebase offers AdWords as a great channel for paid growth. So millions of customers discover and engage with apps on Google properties throughout the day. Right? And AdWords now has universal app campaigns that make it really easy to target these users on all these different channels, on Play, on YouTube, searching on Google, you know, engaging with apps, on AdMob, and even while surfing the web. So universal app campaigns from AdWords are built to drive app installs. So their models continuously evaluate signals from the app that come into Firebase Analytics and will continuously tune the ads and how they are shown and, and, who, and who they are shown to to make sure you get the most effective installs at the lowest cost. To learn more about AdWords, they have a session tomorrow at 11. To recap, in this talk, we looked at two products that help Mary measure how her apps are performing and how her users are using her app. And then we looked at remote config that helps her quickly iterate through experiments. These two products work with five products that help her acquire and engage users on Google Search, on devices that have the app installed, through all channels that take URLs, and using paid ads. For more information, please head over to our documentation and support. Every product we discussed today also has its own session, and we look forward to seeing you all over there. Thank you. And I think uh, we have time for questions. So. Innovative things to share with you right here on the live stream between sessions. And if you want us to track down somebody with your question, use the hashtag AskDevShow. Hello and welcome to The Developer Show. I'm Timothy Jordan and I'm standing here with Mary Grove, Director of Google for Entrepreneurs. Hi, Timothy. Hi, Mary. How are you? I'm great. Thanks for having me. <laughs> Thanks for being here. Absolutely. Okay. Let me jump to a question about Google for Entrepreneurs. It's been on my mind for a little while because developers ask it right. and I think it's fair and I think we should give them an answer. Why is Google doing this? It's a great question. I'm yeah. glad you asked. So there's two ways that I look at that. One is if you look at Google's own history, our own journey as a company, it's entrepreneurship is such a core part of our DNA, right? Google began as a startup in a garage now almost 20 years ago. We are a company founded by entrepreneurs, built by entrepreneurial people, and then it makes sense that we are passionate about empowering the next generation of startups like Google to become successful, to launch, to use the internet to grow their business. So that's the first reason. Mm -hmm. The second reason, though, is actually an economic one. Right? We believe that by investing in communities, long-term investing in startup communities, these are the next set of companies who are going to come online, use the internet, leverage Google's products as well. So really it's this notion that all boats rise and long, long-term it's also going to benefit our own business too. Now before you were the director of this huge amazing thing, you were a BD principal at Google. And I'm curious, what did you learn um, doing those global partnerships that brought you into this new job? Sure. So my actual, my personal story with entrepreneurship begins with my parents. So my parents are both immigrants from Thailand, and they moved to America, sort of personify the quintessential American dream. They were entrepreneurs and really showed me firsthand that you can really, you know, create whatever future you dream for yourself. Mm -hmm. So at Google, fast forward many years later, I was working in new business development, as you said, looking at emerging markets for Google. And everywhere we worked, we looked for three things. One is how can we increase access, so internet and mobile penetration. Two is how can we increase content created from these regions. And the third bucket, which was my personal sort of passion, was entrepreneurship. So mm -hmm. how can we work with students, developers, any emerging entrepreneur ecosystem to really help them create the next generation of companies and really create and grow their own economies? So let's say you are a budding entrepreneur out there with an early stage startup, what's your first step getting help from Google? 
there's many ways to look at that, right? There's so many amazing groups and networks that Google has. Of course, Google developer groups being one of them, women tech makers being another great example. We, at the heart of it, are a technology company, so we hope that our products, our platforms can help you be successful. Beyond that, in the Google for Entrepreneurs umbrella, our mission is really about bringing together startup communities. So working mm -hmm. with partners of all types, whether that's physical space, co-working, tech hubs, to accelerators and educational curricula, we try to knit together this global partner community of about 50 organizations who are supporting entrepreneurs. So we encourage you to get involved with one of them. For example, Techstars is a global accelerator running all sorts of programs ranging from Startup Weekend to their vertical accelerators. And you can find all these resources on our website, which is google.com slash entrepreneurs. Awesome. Is there anything else that you'd like to say about the program that you don't often get to talk about? You know, I think that we're based here in Silicon Valley, but Google is truly a global company. The internet has really democratized access to entrepreneurship, right? You can launch a company from Sao Paulo, Brazil, and have users in Seoul, South Korea, instantly. And so what I would say is, is we passionately believe that entrepreneurship's thriving all over the world. It's about getting more access, getting more opportunity, and helping companies really go global from day one and think about their market opportunity as not just their city or their, their country, but really the whole world. Mary, right, thanks for joining me today. Thanks, Timothy. Thanks for having me. For more information about Google for Entrepreneurs, make sure to check out the show notes for all the links that you need. I'm Timothy Jordan, and I'll see you next time. We all know from experience that people love to share things about themselves, such as photos, videos, and GIFs that express their feelings. So what do you do to let them store and share these files through your app? That's where Firebase Storage can help. Our storage API lets you upload your users' files to our cloud so they can be shared with anyone else. And if you have specific rules for sharing files with certain users, you can protect this content for users logged in with Firebase authentication. Security, of course, is our first concern. All transfers are performed over a secure connection. Also, all transfers with our API are robust and will automatically resume in case the connection is broken. This is essential for transferring large files over slow or unreliable mobile connections. And finally, our storage, backed by Google Cloud Storage, scales to petabytes. That's billions of photos to meet your app's needs, so you will never be out of space when you need it. So give your users space to share their lives with Firebase Storage, available right now for iOS, Android, and web applications. And to learn more about Firebase Storage, check out the documentation available right here. So service workers are powerful for offline caching, but they're also really good for giving you um, instant loading performance benefits when it comes to repeat visits. Yep. Right. And you can achieve that using an application shell architecture. Yeah. Now, so that's kind of the idea of kind of separating content from the actual visual UI. So in my head, it's kind of like native apps. You always have the banner. You've got the navigation drawer at the side. You yeah. might have some other bits. That could be common through like 90% of your app. Yeah. You always want it there. So when we talk about the shell, we're talking about the HTML, the CSS, and the JavaScript that's making up the bulk of your UI. Yeah. Stuff exactly. that, you know, if you cache that, you can still just like load up content in the very middle. Yeah. Um, and save yourself having to constantly reload that stuff, right? Yeah. And it's super nice when it comes to like, let's say they're visiting a page they've never been to before. If you know the layout's always going to be the same, you can still load that while you go and get the content in the background. Um, and it just makes sure that your user has like really good perceived performance. Yeah. Um, so the first time your app loads, you might show, you might like, um, you're going to have to render the shell itself. You'll cache that in your service worker. And you might show like a toast just to let them know, hey, this application now works offline. Yep. And that means that when they come back another time, like let's say they're you know, in airplane mode, uh, that shell will load up really, really quickly. Um, and then it might go to the network to fetch the rest of the content. You can then cache that content so that you know, that entire view is then available whenever they try accessing it without a network connection. Yeah, exactly. Spot on.
We've got some performance testing we've done with the application shell model. Um, this is using web page tests. So on first visit, we've got um, a relatively fast uh, time to first meaningful paint. And this is super important because I, I think that there can be scenarios where someone might take advantage of service worker to be like, ah, don't worry about your first load, but I'm just going to serve up like megabytes of stuff that yeah. I'm going to cache. Afterwards, you'll be super fast. But that first load, if that takes so long to the point where the service worker doesn't even get registered, that's pointless. And plus, for other browsers that don't support service worker, you're then kind of just damaging yourself. Yeah, that's so, going to make your users go and cry in a corner. Exactly. You don't want that. So you still want to be serving up just that static render of your site, just so then it just loads up as fast as humanly possible, and then progressively enhance with service worker to then use the app shell model. And if you are using the app shell model, as you can see here, we've got um, really good. We've actually slashed our load times um, for first meaningful paints on repeat visits. Uh, speaking of like actually taking a look at what impact server side rendering has on this. Uh, you don't have to use Service Worker um, you know, to actually be able to get good gains. If you're building uh, with the App Shell model in mind, with server-side rendering in mind, you will get like, a really good first paint, even in like, Safari and um, like, mobile Safari on iOS. Yeah, all the other browsers that just don't have Service Worker. Yeah. Now, if you're wondering, OK, well, should I be using the Application Shell model on all of my applications, um, there are going to be types of apps, like super simple apps. This, this might be overkill. Yeah. But if you're building something that's you know, a little bit more complex, a little bit more dynamic, this type of model makes a ton of sense. Um, at Google, we're using it for things like Inbox. and It's working really well there. Yeah, I think it's one of those things you end up falling into the sit there and figure out whether it makes sense for your site or not. But I think it's a good overall model that works for a lot of different scenarios. There's a whole ton um, behind this model that you know, we, we way too much to explain in just one video. But we wrote up. Uh, a Pretty amazing article on this, if we do say so ourselves. Well, you wrote it up, and I just read it. So you you just added your name to the end of it. Yeah, that's how pretty I wrote. Pretty much. <laughs> Impact. Um, that's worth checking out. That's the format. This it's show a mediocre article at best, but it's got pretty graphics. Yes, it does. Um, people should go check that out. Yep. Learn more about App Shell. Um, and then there's also the Getting Started Guide for your first progressive web app, where it actually talks about the application shell model, how you can make, like, take advantage of it, as well as how it applies to the demo app that you can build in this lovely code lab. Yeah. And in that article, we also link out to tools that can help you get started with the application model like, really quickly um, that yeah. we're working on. So check that out. Yeah, build a weather app. So what if I told you there was a way you could compress nearly any stream of data by a factor of 10x or more? Wouldn't that be something you'd be interested in? Yeah, I thought so. Let's find out more on this episode of Route 85. So I want you to take a look at this array of numbers here. Imagine that we wanted to send this array of integers from a server to your user's device. Looks like just a bunch of random numbers, right? Well, that word random is actually the key to compressing these in an incredibly efficient manner. As you probably know, a random number generator isn't truly random. Supply a random number generator with the same seed, and you'll get the same results out every time. And we can take advantage of that fact to recreate that list of integers using a random number generator. You see, all I need to do to regenerate that array on a device is to supply three parameters. The seed for an agreed upon random number generator, an upper bound to apply to these results, and the length of the list. I simply supply those numbers to a method that looks a little like this and I can recreate that original number stream. Just like that, I've built my array of 30 integers using just two integers and an int 32. That's a 92% compression rate. Now granted, finding that initial seed did take some work, but you know what? That work can happen in the cloud, so it doesn't really matter. What's important is that on the device, I'm able to decompress that number stream in order and time. And then of course, once you start looking around, you can see that there's a ton of data you can compress this way. I may need to compress a text string, well, what's a string but a stream of encoded integers? Once I have my stream of integers, I simply figure out what seed I need to generate them, and voila, I've compressed my string down into just three numbers. It's a pretty amazing savings, right? Anybody with the username of stidjexmissdizixgoodquibpubpa will be singing your praises in their reviews. And uh, my gosh, if you think about it, an image is really just a stream of numbers broken out into uh, several channels. Take a look at this image here, and you can see how, using our random number generator, I've been able to replace it with just three sets of integers for the red, green, and blue channels, respectively. Now, once again, finding the right seed can take some time, and 
I haven't found the perfect seed just yet. So if you look at the results carefully, you can see that this is not quite a lossless compression scheme. But I think you'll agree that for this kind of savings, these trade-offs just might be worth it. Anyway, I hope you consider using this technique the next time you have data that needs to be compressed. Remember, the more efficient you are with your user's data, the more they'll love you. Thanks again for watching. Be sure to check out other episodes of Route 85. And uh, remember that, as my coworkers on the Android team like to say, perf matters. All right, thanks guys. I think we're done. Uh, who let him into the studio again? I just, I couldn't say no to Elijah Wood. But that's... Elijah Wood. Last episode, we used a decision tree as our classifier. Today, we'll add code to visualize it so we can see how it works under the hood. There are many types of classifiers you may have heard of before, things like neural nets or support vector machines. So why did we use a decision tree to start? Well, they have a very unique property. They're easy to read and understand. In fact, they're one of the few models that are interpretable, where you can understand exactly why the classifier makes a decision. That's amazingly useful in practice. To get started, I'll introduce you to a real data set we'll work with today. It's called IRIS. IRIS is a classic machine learning problem. In it, you want to identify what type of flower you have based on different measurements, like the length and width of the petal. The data set includes three different types of flowers. They're all species of iris, Setosa, Versicolor, and Virginica. Scrolling down, you can see we're given 50 examples of each type, so 150 examples total. Notice there are four features that are used to describe each example. These are the length and width of the sepal and petal. And just like in our apples and oranges problem, the first four columns give the features, and the last column gives the labels, which is the type of flower in each row. Our goal is to use this data set to train a classifier. Then we can use that classifier to predict what species of flower we have if we're given a new flower that we've never seen before. Knowing how to work with an existing data set is a good skill, so let's import Iris into Scikit-Learn and see what it looks like in code. Conveniently, the friendly folks at Scikit provided a bunch of sample data sets, including Iris, as well as utilities to make them easy to import. We can import Iris into our code like this. The data set includes both the table from Wikipedia as well as some metadata. The metadata tells you the names of the features and the names of different types of flowers. The features and examples themselves are contained in the data variable. For example, if I print out the first entry, you can see the measurements for this flower. These index to the feature names, so the first value refers to the sepal length and the second to sepal width, and so on. The target variable contains the labels. Likewise, these index to the target names. Let's print out the first one. A label of zero means it's a setosa. If you look at the table from Wikipedia, you'll notice that we just printed out the first row. Now, both the data and target variables have 150 entries. If you want, you can iterate over them to print out the entire data set like this. Now that we know how to work with the data set, we're ready to train a classifier. But before we do that, first we need to split up the data. I'm going to remove several of the examples and put them aside for later. We'll call the examples I'm putting aside our testing data. We'll keep these separate from our training data. And later on, we'll use our testing examples to test how accurate the classifier is on data it's never seen before. Testing is actually a really important part of doing machine learning well in practice, and we'll cover it in more detail in a future episode. Just for this exercise, I'll remove one example of each type of flower. And as it happens, the data set is ordered so the first setosa is at index 0, and the first versicolor is at 50, and so on. The syntax looks a little bit complicated, but all I'm doing is removing three entries from the data and target variables. Then I'll create two new sets of variables, one for training and one for testing. Training will have the majority of our data, and testing will have just the examples I removed. Now, just as before, we can create a decision tree classifier and train it on our training data. Before we visualize it, let's use the tree to classify our testing data. We know we have one flower of each type, and we can print out the labels we expect. Now let's see what the tree predicts. We'll give it the features for our testing data, and we'll get back labels. You can see the predicted labels match our testing data. That means it got them all right. Now keep in mind this was a very simple test, and we'll go into more detail down the road. Now let's visualize the tree so we can see how the classifier works. 
To do that, I'm going to copy paste some code in from Scikit's tutorials. And because this code is for visualization and not machine learning concepts, I won't cover the details here. Note that I'm combining the code from these two examples to create an easy to read PDF. I can run our script and open up the PDF, and we can see the tree. To use it to classify data, you start by reading from the top. Each node asks a yes or no question about one of the features. For example, this node asks if the petal width is less than 0.8 centimeters. If it's true for the example you're classifying, go left. Otherwise, go right. Now let's use this tree to classify an example from our testing data. Here are the features and label for our first testing flower. Remember, you can find the feature names by looking at the metadata. We know this flower is a setosa, so let's see what the tree predicts. I'll resize the windows to make this easier to see. And the first question the tree asks is whether the petal width is less than 0.8 centimeters. That's the fourth feature. The answer is true, so we proceed left. At this point, we're already at a leaf node. There are no other questions to ask, so the tree gives us a prediction, setosa, and it's right. Notice the label is zero, which indexes to that type of flower. Now let's try our second testing example. This one is a versicolor. Let's see what the tree predicts. Again, we read from the top, and this time the petal width is greater than 0.8 centimeters. The answer to the tree's question is false, so we go right. The next question the tree asks is whether the petal width is less than 1.75. It's trying to narrow it down. That's true, so we go left. Now it asks if the petal length is less than 4.95. That's true, so we go left again. And finally, the tree asks if the petal width is less than 1.65. That's true, so left it is. And now we have our prediction. It's a versicolor, and that's right again. You can try the last one on your own as an exercise. And remember, the way we're using the tree is the same way it works in code. So that's how you quickly visualize and read a decision tree. There's a lot more to learn here, especially how they're built automatically from examples. We'll get to that in a future episode, but for now, let's close with an essential point. Every question the tree asks must be about one of your features. That means the better your features are, the better a tree you can build. And in the next episode, we'll start looking at what makes a good feature. Thanks very much for watching, and I'll see you next time. So constraints, they're a great way for you as a developer to deal with the ever-expanding number of screen sizes, device rotations, and new form factors like slide over in the iOS world. But one unfortunate casualty in this brave new world of alignment has been the way we animate views. See, it used to be we could go around setting a UI view's position or frame with a fun little UI view animate with duration method and watch our view scoot around the screen. Oh, well, that was fun. Uh, but that's harder to do in a world full of constraints. Constraints don't necessarily play nicely with a view whose frame you're setting explicitly, as you can see here. Well, that leads us to this episode's quick tip sent in by Jacob Cho, a fan of Route 85 and a software engineer at Ensemble, a mobile app developer located in beautiful Vancouver, British Columbia. Jacob notes that many iOS developers forget that in addition to the old way of animating a view's position, you can also animate constraints in iOS. Let's look at how you might do that. Here's my storyboard, and as you can see here, I've got everything set up nicely using constraints. Now to move my UI image view on and off screen, I'm gonna to wanna to change this constraint here, the one that sets my image's leading edge to the leading edge of my super view. Right now it's set to minus 180, so it's off screen. So first I'm gonna control drag from this constraint into my view controller to make it an IV outlet of type NS layout constraint. This allows me to access it in my code. Now I can adjust it with a standard UI view animate with duration call. In this case, I'll change the constant of the constraint from minus 180 to zero so that it appears on screen, and now we can give it a try. Huh, well that's weird. The, the constant definitely changed, but what happened to my animation? Well, it turns out to get this constant to animate nicely, I need to call layout if needed on my view controller's view within this animation block. We'll give it one more try, and oh, that's much better.
Hello. Welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, my name is Mike. I'm a product manager on Daydream. It's awesome to be here. So just to start things off, how many of you just attended the talk on Google VR? Yeah, I thought so. A lot of people. That's great. For those of you who weren't there, in that talk, we just announced Daydream Labs, our rapid prototyping effort. We're excited to tell you all about it, so we'll dive right in. At Google, we spend a lot of time thinking about what works well in VR. Our industry has come a long way exploring the possibilities, discovering its killer use cases, learning how to design a great experience. And part of what makes VR so exciting right now is that it's still early days. There is so much left to explore. So last year, we started Daydream Labs. Our goal is to experiment with VR and share what we learn with everyone. We do research and rapid prototyping on lots of things like hardware and usability. One area we focus on is app experiments. We build bite-sized prototypes that allow us to quickly test a single hypothesis about VR. We don't focus on any particular product or platform, and we love building on all kinds of hardware, HTC Vive, Oculus, Daydream, and more. For each experiment, we try to pick the right tool for the job. And we try to move pretty fast. On average, we build two new app experiments each week. And if you're interested in learning a little bit more about the process for our rapid prototyping, we have another talk today at 4 PM that's all about it. Check it out. Just a quick overview of how we work. For each app experiment, we pair one engineer with one designer. They start the week building stuff. By the end of the week, they'll share it with a bunch of people, get their feedback, and see what we learned. And then we share those lessons within Google. Today, we're so excited to start sharing these lessons with everyone. In this talk, we'll walk through what we've learned across three areas. First, interactions. The amazing things you can do in VR with a controller. Second, immersion. Your environment in VR and all of the things that contribute to a sense of presence. And finally, social. What it's like to share these experiences with other people. So with that, I'll hand it over to Stefan to talk to you about interactions. Thank you. Hi, everyone. It's great to be here. My name is Stefan Welka. I'm a software engineer on Daydream. Let's talk about interactions. To set some context, in VR, the main way people interact is by using a controller that is tracked in 3D space. What's awesome is that these controllers can look and act like any tool. Your controller can be a laser pointer that makes it possible to reach things that are far away. And that can be across the room or even across the whole galaxy. Controllers can also become your virtual hands. But there's no reason to limit yourself to these common input types. Your controller can also turn into a hammer, a tennis racket, a fishing rod, or even a frying pan. Come on, this is crazy. Your controller can become any tool or toy. In a sense, the visual representation drives its use. And since we humans are naturally good at using proxy objects, like tools to manipulate the world, controllers also feel very natural. With accurate tracking in VR, the skills needed to interact with objects in the real world or in VR are already present in everybody. So nobody has to learn how to use a controller. Let's walk through a few of the interaction models that are possible. One of our first lessons was that direct manipulation of objects, for example, picking something up in the real, in, with your hands, is one of the most natural and satisfying input methods. In this experiment, we let you play drums, which was fun. 
We also gave people the ability to grab and move the drums by, gra by grabbing them with a controller. We learned that height adjustment and ergonomic positioning is really easy in VR. People quickly built their dream drum kits and started to play. There's no feeling like building your own drum fort and hiding inside it. We also found that everybody really likes throwing things in VR. <laughs> Gestural input is a very powerful concept. In this proto prototype, you scoop up seeds and you water them with a watering can. People already know how to use a real watering can, so they expect the same behavior of these VR objects. There's no need for any buttons here. We then took it even a step further. In this experiment, people weren't holding a controller at all. They were holding a real watering can where we stuck a Vive controller inside. We matched the geometry, so it is really satisfying to touch an object in VR and in the real world at the same time. We added some weight, so it's weighted with a bag of water. And we expected that people would set it down because it would feel heavy. But it connected, them. it connected for them the real world and the virtual worlds together in a delightful manner. You can only imagine what kinds of objects could be tracked in VR in the future. Designing environments is much more natural when you are in the environment yourself. In this living room example, we give the user superpowers, like lifting heavy objects or even scaling them with a simple stretch gesture. Doing these things on a traditional 2D user interface with a mouse would be pretty hard, yet they're very intuitive given positional controller input. In this experiment, we also learned that giving users creative freedom can lead to unexpected outcomes. In the app, we added a clone button. People started to replicate objects lots of times. They were very creative. They built trees out of speakers. But ultimately, we learned that this creative freedom can also distract from the app's core use case. As a developer, you should consider that if you want to direct the user to perform certain tasks in your app. Controllers for VR have become incredibly precise and responsive. But just because this precision is possible, we don't require everyone to be precise all the time. Fluid interactions can be supported by allowing throwing or snapping together of objects. In VR, imprecise actions can lead to an ordered result instead of chaos. In our photo experiment, you can throw things at a wall to create a wallpaper, toss them around the room to share them, or scoop up a whole mess of photos just with one fluid motion. You can create an, a really neatly organized folder. To the user, it feels like the system is reading their minds, and it just works. We call this one drum keys. This is a volumetric keyboard. The buttons give visual, sound, and haptic feedback to the user. This makes the keyboard feel responsive and fun to use. The feedback may seem very subtle, but it is very noticeable when it is missing. Just for kicks, we made a game out of them to see who had the highest words per minute. There's so many new things you can learn and do with a VR controller. You should really try it yourself. It's really eye-opening to use computers in this way. With this, I'm going to hand over to Manuel to talk about immersion. Thanks. Hello, my name is Manuel Clement. 
I'm a designer slash crazy prototyper on Daydream. Um, in VR, there are many things that contribute to a sense of immersion. Your environment, how you move around, audio, and more. Let's look at a few things we've tried um, and learned about creating the sense of immersion and even increase it. This prototype demonstrates the importance of fluid, reactive environments. In VR, your environment is everything around you. In this case, a simple floor, a wall, and the sky. People naturally want to interact with their world, manipulate it. They push, they pull, <clears throat> they reach, and they even throw stuff. The more reactive your environment, the more immersive it will be. People will feel connected. It's so amazing to see a virtual world respond, come to life, obey, or even break the laws of physics. After, inter after interacting with our environment, the first thing people want to do is move around. The challenge is that many of the uh, techniques that allow people to move around in large virtual environments can also make them lose context, which breaks immersion. In this case, you're looking at a technique commonly called uh, teleportation. It works in most cases. Like, at one point, there's a Google logo. I want to go here. Oh, well, there you go. Uh, when there's a Google logo and you go there, because you have a frame of reference, it works fine. But if you're advancing through a forest and everything kind of looks the same, it's hard to understand what just happened. So we tried many things. We explored things to enable movement while preserving context when moving around large environments. We call this one slides and ladders. Pay attention to the top left corner. You can see a video of myself moving around in RR, real reality. Notice how small the room is. It's about 5 feet by 12 feet, not very large. There's slides that do what you expect. When you sit down on them, they go. There's ladders you just reach and pull to climb. There's a virtual gondola you can ride, and even you can float on a cloud across the sky. When people took off their headset, they were stunned to see how small the room was. They had forgotten because the VR environment they had experienced was massive. They never lost context. They traveled through a huge space there. We can't wait to see what you all will come up with to, um, to do teleportation and movement in VR. Here, we built a conveyor belt game. It lets you soar through cubes and eat donuts. What's important here is that it shows how even a flat-looking environment needs texture and shadows to feel real. In real reality, we never encounter flat colors. Let's, let's imagine that a large object fills our field of view in VR, like a wall. It needs texture to maintain your sense of depth and scale. Look at the conveyor belt. You'll see that it's moving because it has a simple, noisy texture. What does it mean to you all? Stay away from flat colors and materials. Now we're going to do a little exercise. Let's all try to be quiet for a few, mi a few seconds, not minutes. Uh, I'm going to count down. Ready? Three. Two, one. As you probably noticed, the real world is never truly silent. Now let's all go somewhere else. I hear birds right there, and there was water all around me. In VR, technologies like spatial audio allow you to have audio coming from specific 3D locations. 
audio is so important. We have a talk tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. Do not miss it. For those of you who are used to 2D experiences, it's worth pointing out that in VR, the world is your 3D stage. You can have 2D UI like the map on this wall, where it makes sense. Additionally, the 3D map in the middle of the room displays dynamic data over time. In this case, US population per state. Users can walk around. They can inspect things and compare data points. 3D makes it easy to understand sizes and relationships intuitively. OK. We're all here today. That means that our ancestors at one point, they were in Savannah. And they were able to tell the difference between a kitty cat and a lion. So bring on 3D UI. The goal should not always to be replicating reality. Really is great in many cases. However, as humans, a few crazy elements, ingredients, to create these environments that really make you want to stay immersed in them. How about floating apples and bananas? Let's be serious for a second. We call this one fruit salad. Time and again, we saw people more engaged with playful environments. They were more delighted to invest time in the experience and explore. Don't be constrained by reality. When you design your environments, consider multiple vantage points, different scales. We call this one dollhouse. And when people realized they could be called tiny, they scream with joy. The kid inside them had always wanted to do this. It's amazing. This reminds me of my own daughter. She loves to make fairy houses in our backyard. And her deepest wish is to experience its magical worlds, to become a fairy. What if you were as big as the galaxy, or as small as an atom? I mean, you notice VR is a unique opportunity to experience the impossible. And now I'm going to hand it over to Robbie, who will talk about social in VR. Thank you so much. Thanks. Hey, everyone. I'm Robbie Tilton, a designer and prototyper on the Daydream team. We've talked about interactions and building immersive worlds. Let's talk about social. Our industry has already explored many possibilities with social and VR. Social apps really let you feel like you're in the same room as someone else, regardless of where you are in the world. We've done some experiments, too, and we're really excited to share some of what we've learned. Let's start with avatars. There are many ways to represent people in VR. First, we found even simple avatars can be extremely expressive. This avatar's head only has a pair of eyes, and it's still able to communicate a lot of emotion just with the way it moves. When you combine this with hands and voice, all things come together to give a real sense of shared presence. You really feel like they're there in the room with you. Let's talk about eyes in a little more detail. In this video, you see the avatar blink which is programmed to happen at a random interval. When the head turns, the pupils move in the direction it's headed. Even without other facial features, like a mouth or eyebrows, we were surprised by how connected we felt to this other individual. Eyes amplify face-to-face -face communication. They give people a clearer place to look to and speak toward. And we called this one googly eyes. When you're in VR and your avatar only has a head and hands, one of the first things you'll do is look down and ask yourself, where'd my body go? One thing we tried 
which really didn't work well, is showing full body avatars. Most VR systems today track head and hands. So by showing the body, we're basically predicting where the legs, arms, and torso should be. And most of the time, we got this wrong. People expected their body to be in one place, and when they looked, it was in a different place than they expected. It feels really weird. Full body avatars are really hard to get right. If you're going to use them, be thoughtful about the design and how they move. Let's talk about designing social interactions. We tested our social experiments with a lot of people. Just like in real reality, sometimes people end up in the same room and just had nothing to talk about. So to remedy this, think about giving users a shared objective. Giving them something to play with together makes it easy for them to socialize and break the ice. It was also interesting for us to see how free people felt in VR. <laughs> if you, in case you don't recognize him, that's Manuel Clement, who just spoke before me, dancing like no one's ever going to live stream this. <laughs> Sorry about that, Manuel. <laughs> Time after time, we saw people willing to have fun with others, dance around, jump, and get goofy. This is one of my favorite parts about social in VR. It's just a ton of fun. When you put a few people in a virtual room, one of the first things we saw is that people try to physically connect with each other. For example, people love high-fiving. As a developer, explore ways to amplify physical contact in VR. As just one approach, in this app, we combined haptic feedback with a fireworks animation every time the hand's connected. Not everything in VR is fun in games. We noticed that some simple interactions that may seem innocent can come across as trolling in VR. Here you see a shopping experience where two people are trying on different hats and accessories. One user decides to playfully put a hat in front of the other user's eyes. While this may seem harmless, this can cause serious issues in VR. This user couldn't see anything. They felt like they lost control and even had to take their headset off. Another common problem is people getting too close to each other and invading personal space. So be cautious, test your apps out, and make sure users feel comfortable in social experiences. And with that, VR designers need to start thinking about rules and logic to prevent trolling. In this example, you see two dogs playing poker. Player one is about to lose a bet, and you'll see that they get up in frustration, intending to take their chips back. <laughs> you'll also notice, when they get out of their seat, the world turns gray. They disappear from the scene, and they can no longer interact with the world. By design, players can only see each other when they're both seated. This prevents things like stealing chips, or even something worse like physical confrontation. This is just one approach. We'd love to hear more ideas from you to encourage fair play. Especially in these early days, not everyone will have access to a VR headset. But many people want to participate in the experience. One thing we tried is to let users film and share from inside VR with a virtual camera. It's like filming your own TV show. You just grab the camera and point it at whatever you want your audience to see. This lets anybody watch the VR participant in the virtual world from any screen, like a phone or laptop. For another example of this, 
check out the spectator camera in Tilt Brush. We're super excited about social in VR. And we're even more excited to hear your ideas and what you guys are going to build. Now I'll pass it back to Mike. Thank you. So just to recap, we've talked about interactions, immersive worlds, and social. And when you bring these all together, you can build some pretty compelling experiences. So to close this talk, we're going to walk through a few more experiments that show how we can combine these things. People had so much fun with the drums experiment that we built another prototype all about playing music with friends. You can play a virtual xylophone, a harp, drum kit. Of course, you can move these around however you like. And you can do things that you can't in real life with real drums, like stack five of them on top of each other and strike them all at the same time. We call this one Architect. Many architecture firms use VR today to preview a 3D model that they design on their desktop computer. So we played with the idea of letting you design that model in VR. You can grab materials and pieces with direct manipulation and get tactile feedback. And when you place a piece in a certain spot, it just snaps right in, inter interpreting your intention. When you want to preview your design, you can step inside and get a whole new perspective. There are many examples of using VR for storytelling, especially in VR video. This prototype lets anyone be a storyteller in VR. Here, you can animate virtual toys into moving, lifelike characters. Inspired by motion capture systems used in Hollywood films, you grab a couple of toys, in this case, Android figurines, maybe a plane. You move them through space and time and then you replay the scene and step into the world that you've built. It is make-believe on a whole new level. And that dog always cracks me up. We also love the notion of a pure thrill. And sometimes people will get skeptical of a VR experience that's a little straightforward. Where's the narrative? Where's the utility? We learn that sometimes just being someplace amazing is enough. In this experiment, we attached two controllers to your shoes and asked you to go for a walk off a diving board 53 meters in the air. And it is absolutely terrifying. And not everyone can do it, but it's a lot of fun. In this experiment, we use social to teach you a new language, in this case, Mandarin. You interact with the teacher who gives you a new word to say. You repeat it back. And when you do a good job, you get verbal and nonverbal feedback from the teacher. You can also have a nice uh, interaction with another student in the classroom. VR lets you see products at their true scale. This is especially powerful for larger, three-dimensional, more expensive things, like furniture. VR also lets you design your store however you like. So for this experiment, we imagine what it would be like to shop for furniture in a 3D model of a home. You sample the different products, see how much they cost, maybe check out a couple of chairs, and then drop a specific speaker in a specific spot to see how it looks. Or I, I guess you can make a tree out of speakers. Hashtag speaker tree. And finally, we built an experiment for rehearsing performances and presentations with Google Slides. And we may have modeled this room and maybe used it for this specific talk. So that's the last thing we have to share with you today. Before you go, we have two quick things. First, we have a lot of great talks about VR today and tomorrow. 
Uh, we hope you check them out. Later today, we have a talk on monetization and distribution for Daydream. We have a talk on designing for the Daydream controller, where you can learn how to make your own frying pan. We also have a talk on VR design process, where you can learn more about how we do our rapid prototyping at Daydream Labs. This is just the start of a conversation. We're going to be posting regular updates to our blog, which is linked to here. We really look forward to staying in touch and hearing your feedback. Thank you so much. We can't wait to see what everyone builds. Thank you. Or do you? Well, well, no. No, you don't. You see, one pretty great feature about Google Cloud Messaging that a lot of people don't know about is that GCM can relay to APNS any notifications you want to send to an iOS device. Now, granted, you'll need to do some setup work, like upload your APNS certificate to GCM, and make sure your client sends its device token to the GCM service. But once you've done that, you can use GCM to send all of your notifications, no matter what platform your target device is, and GCM will deliver your notifications to the correct device using the appropriate service. What all this means is that you don't need to care about what device your user has anymore. You just, has, you just have to write and maintain one code path, and as we all know, less code means less room for mistakes. But it's not just about using less code. By using GCM to handle your messaging for you, you can take advantage of some of the other nice features that GCM offers to developers, like topics. Topics allow your app to subscribe to notifications about any particular topic that you or your users want to. For example, let's say you've got a weather app and I, as a loyal weather fan, want to be notified whenever there's extreme weather happening in my zip code. Well, in the old way of doing this, you'd probably need to set up a database where you keep track of each one of your users and their devices and their zip codes and do this whole select users where blah 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 query, then loop through the results and send notifications to each device that you get back from this database query. But with topics, none of that's necessary. Instead, your app simply tells GCM that you're interested in subscribing to, say, the weather 94043 topic. Then, next time there's rain in California, for us that, that counts as extreme weather. Oh my gosh, there's something coming down from the sky! I don't know if it's water, if it's acid! I can't go out! I don't know how to drive anymore! Yeah, that seems about right. So yeah, with topics, your server simply tells GCM to send notifications to all devices subscribed to the weather 94043 topic. And I will get notified along with all other devices subscribed to that topic. So there's no database required. Go ahead and throw it out. Oh, uh, as long as you weren't using it for anything else, I guess. I probably should have mentioned that earlier. GCM has other useful features too, like upstream messaging, which allows your app to communicate to your server through GCM. This can be helpful in cases where you might want some lightweight communication from your clients to your server, but don't feel like dealing with the hassle of setting up and maintaining a full-blown server open to the entire world. Or read receipts, where in some, but not all, situations, you can be notified that a user has received your message, something you can't normally do through APNS alone. Oh, and in case you're wondering, all this is free, as in please send us zero dollars, uh, and it's using much of the same infrastructure that Google uses for its own apps, so it'll probably scale for yours. So there's a lot to learn when it comes to notifications, and I encourage you to get started here with our Google Cloud Messaging documentation for iOS. We also have a couple of sample applications for you to look at. There's Friendly Ping, our cross-platform chat app powered entirely through Google Cloud Messaging, as well as the GCM Playground, which lets you easily experiment with sending calls through the GCM service. And keep watching Route 85. Maybe you'll see another Google Cloud Messaging video pop up in the future. If only we had, we had some way of letting you know when that happened. Well, I'm stumped. Consider the simple URL. A few years ago, these were pretty straightforward. You clicked on one, and nine times out of ten, you went to a web page. Then things changed. People started using their mobile devices for, well, everything. And these devices in turn started supporting the idea of deep links. Click on one of these deep links, and it could take you not just anywhere on the web, but anywhere in an app as well. So you could use a deep link to point directly to a specific restaurant inside a reservation app, or give your new customers a personalized welcome based on the link that brought them to your app in the first place. At least, that's how they worked in theory. In practice, deep linking had issues. 
The same link wouldn't necessarily work on an iOS or Android device, and they behave very differently, or didn't work at all, for users who didn't have your app installed. And for people who did install your app through a deep link, all of that great link info was typically lost during the installation process, leaving your personalized warm welcome out in the cold. So while deep links were great in theory, their uses were a little more limited in practice. Enter Firebase Dynamic Links. Firebase Dynamic Links are deep links that work the way you want them to. So you can create one single link that behaves one way on iOS, another on Android, and even a third on a desktop browser, and it will take you to a place that's appropriate to that platform. You can also set up dynamic links to change their behavior depending on whether or not your user has your app installed. For users who don't have your app installed, maybe you send them to your website, maybe you take them to the Play Store, or maybe you show them an interstitial describing the benefits of your app before you take them to the App Store for a smoother transition. More importantly, these links can survive the App Store installation process. So if your user installs your app when clicking on a dynamic link, all of that information is still available to you when your user opens up your app for the first time. So what does this mean? It means you can use dynamic links the way you've always wanted to use deep links. You can use them in marketing campaigns, from email to social media to banner ads to, heck, even QR codes. And in addition to install attribution tracking, you know, the kind that lets you know which campaigns are getting you the highest quality users, you can also give your users a customized first-time experience based on the campaign that brought them there. So if a user installs your music app because you showed them an ad for classical music, you can make sure your app takes them right to Chopin's latest hits when they first open it up. Dynamic links are great for sharing, too. Your users can use them to share recipes, links to their favorite level in your game, or even coupon codes. In fact, dynamic links are the technology that powers Firebase invites. And because dynamic links are a Firebase product, you can see their stats directly through the Firebase console. Find out how many people clicked on a link, or use Firebase Analytics to find out which of your users first opened your app through a particular link. To find out more about Dynamic Links, check out the documentation here and give them a try. And deep link away. Bitcoin represents a way to transfer money anonymously and at almost no cost. And since it's an arbitrary currency, with no nationality attached to it, you're free to exchange it with anyone in the world. What is money? Resources are limited, and they hold explicit value to people. Most resources are physical, and such needed to be traded in a physical form. Diamonds, gold coins, chickens, or bikes. At some point, it becomes too difficult to physically transact those objects, and it's easier to agree, collectively, on the value of cash instead of gold. As we know today, this has many advantages. Credit cards and the modern banking basically gave us another abstraction layer on top of cash. There is a centralized system which defines who owns what resources. All of these trades are made virtually. This is the backbone of why Bitcoin is a valid idea. What is Bitcoin? Bitcoin is the centralized, anonymous, digital-only currency that recently received public attention. Bitcoin was originally developed in 2008. Like in any good mystery, someone using the alias Satoshi Nakamoto published a paper describing how Bitcoin could work. There's a very interesting story about this guy too. He must be very smart, but he never came forward to claim ownership or any part of the revenue. Just one year later, in 2009, Bitcoin started being traded. Where do they come from? Think about gold. You could buy it or mine it and it's the same concept with Bitcoin. You do this by using your computer to hunt for 64 digit numbers. By having your computer repeatedly solve complex mathematical puzzles, you're competing with other miners to generate the number that the Bitcoin network is looking for. If your computer generates it first, you receive Bitcoins. The Bitcoin system is programmed to generate a fixed number of Bitcoins per unit of computing time. It is also self-sustaining coded to prevent inflation, and encrypted to prevent anyone from disrupting its code. In the year 2140, the total number of Bitcoins in circulation will be capped at 21 million. So how much is a Bitcoin worth today? You'll need to Google it. Just type Bitcoin in US dollar, for example. You could also check it out at priv.com. Why are they anonymous? 
Bitcoin are pseudo-anonymous because they are built upon this centralized system. The Bitcoins themselves are anonymous, the wallets are not. Here is why. The base algorithm creates anonymity, but as the recent court cases show, if your Bitcoin wallet is identified and attached to a person, then someone can go through and track every transaction you've made. Bitcoins exist entirely on their own because there's no central infrastructure to shut down. You are identified by nothing more than your Bitcoin wallet address, a string of randomized letters and numbers. There are absolutely no identifying characteristic beyond that. For the paranoid dude, you can simply create a new wallet for each transaction. Here are some interesting startups that push the technology forward. We are still in the initial phase of Bitcoins, and there are many challenges and opportunities ahead. Exchanges, wallets, merchant services, security, and more. But this is something for another episode. Until next time, eat your vegetables and listen to your partners. One word that's the bane of both the novice and expert programmer alike, threads. I'm Joanna Smith, and threading can be one of the greatest perf improvements you make, but it will also likely drive you crazy. Tom Sawyer illustrated threading perfectly a long time ago when he needed to paint that fence, because when you've got a large chunk of work to do and it's the same work over and over again, you call on some friends to get it done quickly. So for computations that are taking a long time, consider calling in reinforcements with threads. By allowing multiple threads of execution to operate on your data set in parallel, you reduce the overall time required to complete the task. With Android, threading becomes especially important because the entire app runs on the main thread, which is also called the UI thread because it updates the UI. And when the UI stops responding, users stop using your app. So when you want to perform some complex action in response to a button being pushed, for example, you'll want to move that off the main thread until it is finished so that the user can continue to interact with your app. Because there are a few things worse than the dreaded application not responding dialog. However, Integrating threads into your system is not for the faint of heart. You're going to have to rethink your entire approach to computational complexity and to your memory model in order to properly integrate threads. So to avoid the rabbit hole, take advantage of the Android framework, which has been built to help you out. Careful thought and planning about your app's structure and flow will enable you to determine whether a thread should affect the UI or be entirely hidden. APIs like Async Task and Thread both help you manage the work and keep your app from hanging, but Async Task will also allow you to affect the UI, like when you want to display a progress dialog. So take a walk through your own app and see if there are places where it stops responding or gets exceptionally slow in response to a user action, and then move all of that extra work off the main thread. But, you know, thoughtfully. Don't just change things willy-nilly. Because while threading may be intimidating, it shouldn't scare you. What is scary, though, is bad performance, which is why you should check out the rest of our Android Performance Patterns content and consider joining our G community for tips, tricks, and help. But most importantly, keep calm, profile your code, and always remember, perf matters. And welcome to Supercharged. Now, this is a kind of TLDW. Last week, I did a live stream with Surma where we made some swipeable cards. Now, you probably recognize swipeable cards from things like Google Now, where you just kind of take a card and you dismiss it. And you can actually see what I've got on screen. This is what we ended up making. There you go, you see? Dismiss it and all that kind of good stuff. Now, the idea is if you've not got an hour to watch that live stream back, although if you can, I would recommend it, and you can find the link to that below. If you can't, that's exactly what this is for. I want to step through the things that we learned, the things that we did. Um, and just so you can get an insight into what actually went into it. So before we actually get started, what I want to do is I want to step over to Theory Corner. Oh yeah, theory. Love theory. And what we can do in Theory Corner is discuss what we need to do. Join me. Welcome to Theory Corner. You can tell it's Theory Corner because there's some theory in a corner. Now, this is what we have. We've got the cards. You can tell it's a card because it says card. The cards have will change transform on it. The idea I, I have here is that we want each card to be transformed around the screen. And so we want to give each card its own layer. The compositor then can move those around with the help of the GPU. So long as we stick to transform, opacity, and we set will change, we should be good. 
So we move the card as you touch and swipe. But as you get across to this side, we have this marker of like 0.35. Now I picked that at random. You could pick a different number. 0.35, if you go past that point, we basically say, well, this card is being dismissed. So we slide it off to the side. The other thing that we're going to do is we're going to change the opacity. So the further you go across, the lower the opacity in both directions. So that works there. OK, so we're going to put each card on its own layer, and shift it side to side, and fade it out. Let's go back to reality. What we're going to do here is we're going to step into the code so you can actually see bit by bit what we actually did. Here's the cards. And what we do, first of all, is we basically create an array from the cards that we've got in the document. So we'd have to have some kind of code that adds or removes those cards later on. But don't worry about that. We'll just get on with what we've got here. The next thing to notice is that I've got these named functions on start, on move, on end, and update. Now, the first three are our input events. And I choose to do it this way. What I do is I take a copy of it by calling dot bind on this. And that takes it from the prototype into the actual instance. But it does another thing for me as well. It means that it's bound to the instance so that in those functions, when I say this dot whatever, it's actually applying to the instance and not to the target's event. No, wait, the event's target. Oh, one of those two. So it also does something else for me. It means that I can do add event listener and remove event listener. And I can call it by name. I can say like this dot on start, for example. You can see that down here in the add event listener. So I do add event listener for touch start, touch move, touch end, mouse down, mouse move, and mouse up. All of them. Yay. And I can just basically say on start, on move, on end, and so on. And if I wanted to do the remove event listeners, I could do that. And that would just work out fine for me. So. We've got our event listeners, and we have a bunch of variables here that are just sort of housekeeping, things that we need to keep a track on. The other thing I do is I start a request animation frame where I busily sort of kind of do an update. Now, if you're doing this in production, I would suggest you don't do it quite like this. I would start the request animation frame when the user starts interacting, and then when the animation's finished, I would stop doing the request animation frame loop. But for the case of this, just to keep things simple, I just start it right at the start, and I do a kind of busy loop through. So what do we actually do in the on start, on move, and on end event listeners? Wow, saying event listeners over and over and over and over and over again, that's not confusing for me. No. What are we doing those? Well, first, in the on start, the main thing is this. We basically take a marker for the start position of the interaction. Where does the user put their finger down on the screen? And then we get that with page x. The other thing we do is we take a copy of that for the current position. Because as we move our finger, we're going to update the current position so we know where we started and where we currently are. And the difference is how far we want to transform the card. The other things that we do in this is we set the dragon card to say true. But as we discussed in Theory Corner, we set will change to transform. Now, we can check that that actually works by going back to the code, bringing up DevTools. And in the rendering settings, we're going to show layer borders. Anything that's got its own layer is going to go orange around its border. You ready? So when I click, you can see that we immediately the card gets its own layer, which is really cool. That means that we can transform and move it around cheaply, like we discussed over there in the theory corner. Here's what we've got in the on move. It's fairly straightforward. All we do is we take the current position of the input, and we basically say that's the current x. Now, inside the update, what we can do is we can say if they're dragging the card, the screen x, which is basically the position of the card on the screen, is the current minus the start. That's basically how far they've moved. And we can apply the transform to account for that. Ta -da! Now, when the user stops interacting, we actually have to make a decision. If you remember over in Theory Corner, we said if the user is past that 0.35 marker, so it's a sort of a 0 to 1 range, 1 being the full distance of the card, 0 being not at all. If they go past 0 0.35, which is what I've chosen, but you could choose a different number, what we want to say is they are dismissing the card. And we do this by setting a target x, which we use later on in the update. And here we do screen x plus equals the target minus the current screen x over 4. What this is going to do is it's going to ease the card to that final position, which will either be the center or it'll be off to the side, depending on whether we've decided that they've gone past the point of dismissal or not. Then there's some a little bit of tidy up that we do here. We basically normalize the drag distance, and we use that to set the opacity so that the further across you get, the more fady the card is. Ta -da! So far, so good. 
So the last little bit is what we do when you dismiss the card, because what we want to do is we want to slide all the other cards into place. And we do that with this animate other cards into position function. Let me show you what it looks like without that. Let's switch off the layer borders. OK, here's what it looks like without that. You see all the other cards just snap into place, which you could do, but doesn't look quite so nice. So what we need to do is we need to transform them down quickly to where they moved from, which will be the height of the card plus the margin. And you can see that here. So we take every card that's after the current one, which is this, and we basically say translate yourself the height of a card plus 20 pixels, which is the margin. And again, this is hard coded, so you'd probably make this more dynamic in production. And then we basically go from that to no transform at all. And we use an easing of this cubic bezier and a duration of 150 milliseconds. And all we need to do is just say card.animate with those settings. And then when you've finished, we say the animation's complete, at which point we can just reset the target and call it a day. And the animation's done. So with that switched on, you can see we get a nice, smooth animation. So the only other thing to notice is when I'm dismissing the cards, you can see that the other ones get their own layer temporarily. This is because we're using element.animate and we're using a transform, and that means that those get temporarily promoted to their own layer. Cool. That means that it's also doing the same thing that we had over in Theory Corner. We're getting its own layer, which means it happens nice and performantly. And then when it's finished, the browser automatically demotes them back, and we're all good. So there you have it. That's swipeable cards. If you've got time, make sure you watch the live stream. There's loads in there. There's us finding and fixing bugs. There's just chatting about the general approach. All sorts of goodies in there. Hopefully you've, uh, you've enjoyed this little TLDW. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel, and I will catch you on the flip side. Welcome to this supercharged TLDW. I'm Paul. If you didn't catch the live stream with me and Surma last week, well, basically we built a side nav. Let me show you what we built. So you've got your standard app bar here. You can click on this sidebar. You can click on the background, or you can dismiss it with a sort of drag gesture like that. Awesome stuff. So let me show you how we built it. But before we do that, as usual, we're going to head over to, yep, you guessed it, Theory Corner. Join me. Hello, welcome back to Theory Corner. So this is what we've got. We've got our page, and we've got a container element. The container element is going to be the home for the side nav and the background. And what we're going to do, first of all, is we're going to put overflow hidden on this. We're going to make it take up 100% width and height. So it's got overflow hidden because this is going to transform out to the side, and we don't want any scroll bars. So we put that in place. The background, we're just going to transition its opacity from 0 up to 1, and we'll set it to have a transparent black color, or semi-transparent black color in the background. The other thing is the side nav. We want this to slide in from the side, so we need to have will change transform on it so that it gets its own layer, very much like we did with the swipeable cards, and then we can transform it in and out. We're also going to need some uh, buttons for bringing it in and out, and we're going to have to have some touch events so that we can do the dragging stuff. All cool? Let's go back to reality. Welcome back to reality. Oh, yes. Yes, reality. That's where you'll find us today. Pragmatic to the end. Code. OK, so the markup and the CSS is pretty much what we discussed in Theory Corner. We've got an aside. We've got a few JS classes here so that we can pick it up in the JavaScript. But mostly, it's pretty much what you'd expect. There's a button for closing. There's a button for opening. We've got a title here for the side nav. And then we've got the list of the side nav content. In terms of the CSS, here's what we've got for the background. You can see it's actually done with a before pseudo element. And you can see that it's got a background of black with an opacity of 0.4. We switched on will change opacity because we know we're going to be changing the opacity. So we're going to say will change opacity. Didn't say will change pasty. That would be a different thing entirely. <laughs>
Hello, everybody. Hi, oh, thank you. Thank you. Big warm welcome to everybody who's here in person and a big shout out to everyone watching online. Hi, Mom. This is What's New in Android Wear 2.0. I'm Dan Kulamzine. I'm the tech lead for System UI on Android Wear. And I'm Brett Leiter. I'm the design lead for Android Wear. And so for Android Wear 2.0, we want to redefine what it means to be a great, useful smartwatch. And we want to enable you developers to build great experiences for it, for users. And so to talk about what's new in Android Wear, we're actually going to reflect back a little bit on the things that we've learned over the last two years since Android Wear came out. So when Android Wear first came out, it was very much tethered to the phone. And this was a great solution two years ago when Wi-Fi and cellular seemed really far out for us. But in listening to users and listening to de developers, they have higher expectations for a smartwatch. They want the watch to be able to do stuff on its own. And so with Android Wear 2.0, we're introducing the concept of untethered experiences, where the watch can talk to the cloud, your cloud, over cellular and Wi-Fi. And of course, Bluetooth to the handset is still great for many things. It's, it's about adding and evolving the platform. Second, so we call this concept standalone. So second, uh, Android Wear has been about personal expression from the beginning. We have over 100 physical designs that you can buy, and we have over 4,000 watch faces on the Play Store. And so when it comes to watch faces, we really believe that you should be able to choose what you want to be your watch face. But we want more than that, and users wanted more than that. They want utility and personal expression. And so we're evolving the watch face with Android Wear 2.0 to put glanceable information and action right on your watch face. So this is the new Android Wear 2.0 watch faces. And Android Wear has always been great at quick replies about messages that are coming your way from people that you care about. But we heard from people that they wanted a lot more than that. They wanted conversations. They wanted to be able to express themselves in a, in a multitude of ways and have those conversations live on over their watch over the course of the day. So we call this messaging, making messaging great. And we're going to talk about that as well. And finally, Android Wear launched with activity tracking. Google Fit does a great job of keeping track of your walking, your running, your biking in the background. But we heard from people and from developers that they wanted to do more than that. They wanted activity tracking with insight. And so with this example, this a thing that I've done this morning, which is nervously eat a little too much breakfast. Whoops. And a fitness app can say, well, you know, you did that. And you can get back on track towards your fitness goals by doing the following. So this is helping users with insight that's meaningful. So we talk about this as building great fitness experiences for Android Wear. And together, these are Android Wear 2.0. So we're launching a developer preview. You want your, your feedback. And we're going to go into detail on all of these topics. So fitness, messaging, the watch face, standalone apps. And we've got a new user interface for both the system UI and apps to tie it all together. And so to start, we're going to give a tour of that new user interface. And let's uh, roll the video, please. So here I am. I'm starting out on my watch face. Now, this is an Android Wear 1.0 style watch face. It's got the time. It's got the date, but not a lot else that helps me get through my day. So with a, a simple left to right swipe, on my watch face, a sideways swipe. I'm going to zoom out to the watch face picker. Any second now. Here we go. So just like that, I'm zoomed out to the watch face picker. And if I keep sliding to the, to the left, I'm actually on my next watch face. And I've selected Elements Analog. The Elements Analog is a watch face that we built to show off the capabilities of the new watch face API. So I've already customized it with four different things that help me. And let's say I wanted to change one of these. I wanted to change this calorie tracker uh, over to something else. So I'm just going to do a sideways swipe, tap on the gear icon at the bottom, and I'm editing the settings for this watch face. So I tap on complications, the left-hand dial, and LifeSum is a partner that we've worked with, and they help me track things like how much water I've drunk through the day. So let's tap on that and set that as my complication. So with a few swipes and taps, I've made my watch face more my own. 
And it looks like I'm a little behind on uh, drinking water, and I'll, I'll get to that as soon as I get off the stage. So that's a watch face we've built, but what, what can third parties do? So let's, let's check out a third party watch face. So again, a left uh, a sideways swipe gets me over to my next watch face. And here's Ranger from Zuhandan. And Ranger's got a very unique aesthetic. Zuhandan's really good at, at making Ranger sing on its own. And so we wanted to give watch face developers the power to style these bits of data that we call complications exactly the way, the way they want to. So Zuhandan's got its own color scheme, its own typeface. And as a user, I can also customize the watch face to have different complications on different watch faces to suit different aspects of what I need for my watch. And Dan's going to tell us a lot more about this. So now let's go check out how to add other favorite watch faces to my watch. So I swipe over to the right, and I browse my watch face drawer. And so I just tap on Elements Digital here, and I've added it to my favorites. So cool. I've got four favorite watch faces. But you know this 1.0 style one, this one that doesn't have actionable information on it? I'm going to get rid of it. So all I have to do is toss it up. It's gone. So Elements is, is my watch face now. I want to cover another important aspect of Android Wear 2.0, which is a, a basic navigational concept of how to get the user back to the watch face. And so for anywhere on Android Wear, all you have to do is hit the hardware button on the side of the device. So let's say I, I scroll to the bottom of my watch face picker here, and nothing's really resonating for me. So I decide to go back. I hit the hardware button on the side, and I'll go back to my list of favorites. And I hit the hardware button on the side one more time, and I'll be back at the watch face. So hardware button equals back. And now let's check out Quick Settings. So Quick Settings is the place where you can quickly get your watch to do what you want it to do kind of at the system level. So all you have to do is drag down from the top of the watch. And we've made Quick Settings a lot more compact and put all the actions that you want right in one place. And we've especially gone deep on brightness controls. So if you tap on the little brightness control here on the left, you get up and down paddles. And as you start interacting with them, we give you a live preview of what that brightness control is going to do to your currently selected watch face. It's a, it, and it's, it's pretty gratifying in person. So I'll hit the hardware button to go back. And I'll hit the hardware button to go back again. And I'm back on the watch face. So let's check out uh, app launching. That's something we also wanted to make better in Android Wear 2.0. So from the watch face, again, I hit the hardware button. And that will open the app launcher. And let's, uh, let's, we'll go back, hit the, hitting the hardware button again, and get it, go into it again. And you can see that it actually comes out from where the hardware button is on the side of the device and has this really nice circular reveal. And of course, the app launcher that itself takes advantage of the fact that it's on a circular watch, and it lays itself out accordingly. And we've made it, managed to make the app launcher have more icons on it. Um, and you can tap anywhere to wa launch an app. So here I've scrolled down to Strava, and I can tap it, and it zooms into Strava. And when, when, done, when I'm done recording my hike or my ride, I can hit the hardware button to go back, and I'm back in the launcher. And I hit the hardware button to go back one more time, and I'm back on the watch face. And let's say you know, I want to app launch Strava again. So how could I do that? I just go into the app launcher, and Strava is right at the top. So we keep track of the apps that the user launches the most and put them right at the top of the launcher. OK, so let's get into the bread and butter of Android Wear, which is notifications, and especially messaging from people that you care about. So if my watch was in its always on mode, telling me the time and showing me the data in my complications, let's say I got a message from a, a colleague. What would, what would that experience be like? So here's the always on mode, and I'm going to get a message from Crystal. So Crystal's message takes over my watch face in ambient mode for a few seconds. And if I don't interact with it, it goes away. And then later, you know, maybe when I'm done talking to all of you, I would wake up the watch face. And Crystal's avatar and the app that she sent that message from would come up and visit the watch face. And now if I scroll up, her avatar will re-enter on top of the, the notification card for this conversation. So yeah, let, let's, let's reply to Crystal here. So I've got this conversational detail view on the, on the notification. If I tap on Reply, I can do a voice reply, emoji, smart reply. But let's go use the QWERTY keyboard. And with a few taps, P and R gets me the word I want pretty. G gets me good. 
S gets me so, and it's predicted far, and so with like four or five taps, I've got the sentence I want, and I'm done. And with the new notification API in Android Wear, my message has been appended to the conversation, and Crystal's already replied to keep this conversation long-lived. And Dan's going to talk a lot more about that. So I'll hit the hardware button to go back. I'm back in the card stream. And now I can scroll and check out the rest of my notifications. So here's one from Alexandra. And then here's one from Google Fit. And you can see is as I'm scrolling, I'm getting a scroll bar on the side with a thumb that tells me exactly where I am in the card stream, helps me orient myself, tells me how many notifications I have. So I'll hit the hardware button to go back, get taken right back to the watch face. And that's the tour of the, the new system UI. Uh, let's go back to the slides and check out how this relates to app patterns. So material design for apps is something we're introducing with Android Wear 2.0. And we're really excited what this will do for app developers. So with Android Wear 1.0, we had the concept of users navigating a relatively big two-dimensional space. Users could scroll down. They could scroll up. They could scroll left. They could scroll right. That had a lot of power. But we found that just a little too often, users would get a little confused. Where should I go next to get more content, to get more action? So we've doubled down on the concept of a vertical layout, where users start out anchored at the top, so they always know exactly where to go to get more. It's to scroll down. And this is reinforced, of course, in the system UI, where you start on the watch face and scroll down for notifications. And you start in the app launcher, and you scroll down for your apps. So we think this consistency from system UI all the way through apps will really help users navigate Android Wear even more quickly and get the most out of your app. So look at this in a little more detail. We've got these classic isomorphic drawings that we in the material design team love to make. Uh, so your app is, is mostly this content view, the main piece of information or action that your app is responsible for. And what you can do if you need to add actions that the user needs to take, um, you can add a wearable action drawer to the bottom. And when the user reaches the bottom of the content view or changes scroll directions, this, this component can peek into the view. And if you have a more complicated app that has you know, multiple views that are necessary to render in it, you can add a wearable navigation drawer to the top of the app that peeks in when the user reaches the top. So the main benefit of this is that the, the relatively small screen of a Wear device is maximized by having the content be front and center. And then actions are available just off the screen, and navigation is available just off the screen. So let's, let's take a look at this from the end user's point of view. So here's a user scrolling down in an app. And they reach the bottom, and the drawer is right there for them to grab. And we'll loop that around again. So they scroll down. They either change scroll direction or reach the bottom, and the drawer is there. And there's a primary action there that they could have tapped if that's what they wanted. But if they want to explore more actions, they just drag that drawer up. Let's look at the navigation drawer. And we'll wait for this animation to come around one more time. And so here's the user at the top of their app. And they drag down for their navigation drawer, and they can change views. We'll watch this one more time for clarity. They drag down. They're in their navigation drawer, and they can change views. So now that we've talked about layout and functionality, let's talk a little bit about aesthetics. Android Wear 1.0 apps have generally taken their design cues from handset, which generally means bright, white apps. And we think this is, this is great, but we want to make something that's really specific for wearables. And that means that we're recommending that all apps develop a dark, app, a dark color palette. There's two, two big benefits for this. One is that OLED displays are actually very powerful on Android Wear devices, and they're very popular. Um, and OLED displays consume a lot less power when they're set to emit less light. So if you, choose, if you have a light, a light, light, less, <laughs> light less light emitting, you'll, you'll save the user power. The other main benefit um, is social appropriateness. There's just a lot of contexts where emitting a lot of light is just not good design. So if you're watching a movie in the evening or out at a restaurant at night, you don't want your watch throwing off a lot of light. And we'll make this easy for you developers to adopt. All you have to do is tell us your primary app color, and we can compute all the other shades that you need for your app. And finally, oh, and this works for more than like the, the purpley apps out there. It works for all the apps on the rainbow. Uh, and yeah, don't forget that Android Wire apps are real apps. They have access to the entire Android SDK. 
And Android Wear apps are even more powerful than actual normal Android apps in that they have always on capabilities. So what this means that if I've got visitors from out of town uh, that like their Marmite, and I go to the store to shop for it, and I bring that up on my wrist, and I'm wandering the store, and my, my short-term memory is not great. So I'll just forget what I was shopping for. But my watch goes into always on mode, and it reminds me what I'm shopping for. It's great for to-do lists. It's great for fitness apps. Uh, definitely take advantage of always on. And to talk, oh yes, to wrap up on system UI and material design, we've got a new watch face picker, a new app launcher, a new notification stream, a new navigation model, material design patterns for wearables. We really want to hear what you have to th uh, think about all of this. And I'm going to turn it over to Dan for more about standalone apps. Thanks, Brett. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all right, so. Standalone apps, as Brett mentioned before, we think that the independence of the watch is going to be really key for experiences in Android Wear 2.0. So that's going to let a user slap on their watch and go for a run. They can count their steps. They can uh, track their progress. And they can actually stream music, all without having to bring their phone so they get faster times. Uh, and this is also really going to dramatically change the developer experience that you guys have. Um, and that's because we're going to be able to bring a more Android-y development experience when it comes to cloud and data, authentication, notifications, and distribution. So for cloud and data, here's how it used to work. If the watch needed some data from the cloud, it would start with a request to the phone. And then the phone would get the data from the cloud, download it, put it back in the wearable data layer, take it over to the watch, and then the watch could then display it. Well, with uh, standalone apps, you'll be able to use the network connection directly on the watch. Uh, so you'll be able to use HTTP, TCP, UDP, whatever you want. And you don't have to worry about whether that device has a Wi-Fi or cellular radio, because uh, no matter what, we'll still be able to, uh, if we need to, proxy the network from the phone. And so you'll be able to take all the development patterns that you know from Android phone and tablet development, um, use all the libraries like Volley, and uh, you'll maybe even be able to use some reuse some code from your uh, phone and tablet apps right on the watch. And of course, you'll still want to use the best practices you've learned from writing phone and tablet apps. And I just want to call attention to two. Uh, one is don't grab data that you're not going to use. Uh, one mistake we see sometimes is uh, people get images that are way larger than their screen. Well, there's no sense in downloading data you're not going to show the user. So just in general, avoid that. It'll hurt latency and uh, battery life. Also, I want to talk a little bit about Doze and Doze Lite. So those are coming to Android Wear 2.0. Um, they're important ways that we manage the battery life of the, of the watch. And so you definitely want to play nice with those. They, they are responsible for minimizing the wake ups, which are really um, battery impacting. And so you can schedule jobs using Job Scheduler. This is our recommended practice. Um, you'll be able to schedule those jobs on the basis of time, whether or not you need a connection to the internet, or whether or not you need power for long running tasks or things like that. And so this is really great uh, already for things like downloading the weather from the cloud and showing that to users. But if you're wanting to do more uh, uh, maybe privacy sensitive things, uh, maybe a messaging application, then you want to worry about authentication. Um, and so uh, with Android Wear 2.0 for standalone apps, the watch will be managing its own authentication. Uh, we have several patterns available uh, that you can look at. There's, uh, there's patterns that all the, the, all the patterns balance developer time, user experience, and flexibility in terms of what platform is running on the phone. Uh, I'm not going to go into all the nitty gritty. Uh, there's tons more information available at uh, the standalone talk later today and online. So do check that out. So on to notifications. So notifications have always been the lifeblood of uh, Android Wear. Um, and the magic of the experience comes from them being the same experience uh, in terms of the notification between uh, the, wear, the, the watch and the phone. So if you uh, get a, a notification from an app, it appears in both places. If you take action on either of those places, it's reflected in the other. Uh, and of course, if you dismiss from one place, it's gone from the other as well. Um, and that has been achieved in the past with notification bridging. And that's still definitely an option for you. But now that you've got the network, you may want to manage notifications directly from your standalone app. Um, and uh, so you can, by the way, use Firebase Cloud Messaging, formerly known as GCM, Google Cloud Messaging, uh, to actually have the server wake up your watch, and then the watch can notify the user. So now that you're able to generate notifications directly from the watch, uh, you may want to shut off notification bridging. Um, and there's an API for that. And also, we have some patterns on helping to keep that uh, 
replicated experience so that interactions seem to happen in both places. So now on to distribution. So this is a big change uh, in Wear 2.0. Um, it used to be that to ship watch software, you would embed it in your phone APK. Um, and this meant unnecessary, unnecessary stuff for users to download. Uh, and it, of course, affects disk space. Um, and now in Android Wear 2.0, watches can download and install apps directly from the Play Store. Uh, and not only does this fix the problem of uh, growing uh, phone APKs, but it also makes it possible to uh, ship apps to uh, watches without having to worry about what operating system is running on the paired phone. So you'll be able to reach a lot more users. And so, yeah, it's great news. So standalone is a really big change. Not only does it let users interact with their devices in more ways, but it's also a huge change for developers. Uh, so now you can just do so much more on the, uh, on the watch itself, and we're really excited uh, to see what happens now with you guys taking advantage of this. All right, on to watch faces. Now, watch faces have always been a really key part of Android Wear. Uh, from the very start, we had always on watch faces, so the watch is always ready to tell you the time. Uh, and you developers really ran with our watch face APIs and that there are thousands of watch faces available on the Play Store that let users really customize how their watches look. Super important, considering this is something we wear. So, uh, and then the interactivity applies that, uh, APIs that we added last year really made the watch face a tool. So it's, it's not just for showing data, it's for interaction as well. And so we wanted to take that and bring it to all the apps that run on Android Wear. Uh, so imagine if all the apps could participate in, on the watch face, show information, and then generate those user experiences. So we're adding this complications API in Android Wear 2.0. So the term complications comes from traditional watchmaking. And it refers to any informative element on the uh, watch face that's not just telling you the time. So on traditional watch faces, this could tell you the day of the week or the day of the month, when your alarm's going to go off, or maybe the faces of the moon. Faces of the moon. Super important to have that. Yeah. If you're a werewolf hunter, very important. Um, so and we think for smart watches, they should be able to do smart watchy things, these complications. So they should tell you smart watch types of data, like how many steps you've taken, how many calories maybe you've eaten, if you have incoming messages. Um, and of course, they should also react to touch. So touching that notification should drive me to an experience where I can then act on it. And so the Complications API is an API for data providers and watch face developers. And it lets the two work together to provide both form and function to the watch face. And there's no need for them to know anything about each other in advance, no biz dev deals to sign for data or anything like that. So for data providers, this is a big deal. It's going to let you get your interactions and your data on a lot more watch faces. In fact, you'll be able to have your data rendered by top fashion brands and other experts in making beautiful watch faces. Uh, and of course, you can drive users back to your applications by, uh, when they touch the uh, complications because you assign a pending intent that gets sent when they do that. So LifeSum has been able to add some complications to watch faces uh, that can do things like track Brett's uh, drinks of water, let him know how he's doing with his goals. Um, so, and, and you get back to LifeSum to log all that. And watch face developers are going to be able to concentrate on making really beautiful uh, watch faces. And they don't have to acquire a ton of experience with fitness or messaging in order to provide that functionality to users. So here's how it works. Android Wear acts as a broker, so the two never really talk directly to each other. It starts when it decides it needs to have a complication drawn. It sends an update request to the data provider. The data provider gets that request. It uh, fills out this complication data object and sends it back to Android Wear. Android Wear then forwards it on to the watch face, which then can draw it with whatever aesthetic it wants, because it owns the entire drawing part of that. And um, the way they coordinate on the general idea of the presentation is through the type that's on that complication data. So, uh, there's lots of different types for lots of different use cases. Uh, I'm going to walk through just a few of them. So if you want to show the day of the month, how many messages you have, or maybe the temperature outside, you can use the short text type. And this is just a little bit of text and maybe an icon. If you can go even simpler, then maybe you want to use the icon type. 
Uh, this just shows a picture. So for example, it might tell me it's uh, sunny outside if I see a sun. Uh, and of course, since these complications receive touches, they can also be used as just icons so the user knows it's like a launcher back to your app. And there's also a range value type. Think of this as a value between a minimum and a maximum, maybe a percentage, how many of my daily calories I've eaten, or how much gas is in my car. And there's lots more examples. Uh, you can read about them uh, online, or you can uh, uh, talk to us in the sandbox later. Um, and so if you're a data provider, you want to be thinking about all the different kinds of data that you have that you can show users. And you want to think about what action they can take when they touch those complications. And if you're a watch face developer, you want to think about how you can make these things really beautiful for users. So I want to show you a few examples from our partner, Us2. Uh, they've taken here, uh, there's three examples. In this first one, they've taken a um, existing watch face that so they already shipped, and they've upgraded it to use complications. You can see they've added them to the left and the right there. Uh, they found some space to their existing face and added them. And, um, and it fits right in. And it's, I think it's pretty nice. This next example uh, is a new watch face that they've written to take advantage of the, uh, take advantage of the complication API. Um, and you can see that it makes obvious reference to mechanical watch faces. And uh, of course, it has that classic looking dial uh, complication. And uh, so if you want that classic look uh, on your watch, this is a great um, choice. This last one is, uh, takes a lot more creative liberty with data visualization. Uh, it's using the background and the color of the background, the texture and color of the background, to uh, render some data. So if they were to hook this up to a ranged value type, then um, uh, maybe as it gets warmer outside, it get, uh, the watch face gets redder. Our watches were red all yeah, day yesterday. Our watches were red all day yesterday. And I think my face may have gotten redder in the sun, too. All right. So watch faces 2.0, it's a, it's a nice, uh, it's a huge change, actually, to the way watch faces are going to be uh, uh, as user experiences and as developer experiences on Android Wear 2.0. I think it's really going to unlock some great form and function for the watch face. All right, let's get on to messaging. So Android Wear has always been a great platform for receiving and replying to messages. We, we, will, we wanted to make that um, experience last longer and make it more conversational. Uh, so you could get back to messages as you go through your day. So we started by looking at what we have today. And I just want to walk you through what we saw. So here I've gotten a message from my friend Jim. Uh, we've been chatting about my friend Charles's new dog. And he's asking me, what's the name? So I'm going to swipe over. Uh, I'm going to touch reply. And I'll speak my reply. The dog's name is Brooklyn, which is a pretty cute name for a dog. Uh, and then I get this nice check mark that tells me that the message has been sent. And I feel great. And then I realize, actually, my friend with the dog, Charles, is looking for a dog walker. So I'd like to actually tell Jim, hey, maybe this, is, maybe this would be awesome for you. And so I go back to the stream and look for that card, and it's gone. And this is actually because the messaging app has uh, marked the conversation as read because I've acted on it, and it's withdrawn the notification. So now I kind of have the hassle to get back to my friend. So let's see what we've done now in Android Wear 2.0. Uh, you can see that there's a big visual change. Um, and we've added, I, I just want to draw your eye to this icon at the bottom. That's actually a, uh, an inline action. Uh, in this case, it's a reply action. And it's super easy for users to discover. It's right there on the card. And when they touch that, they're going to get to this new remote input UI. As you can see, we're offering choices now on, um, on the input method that you pick to, to talk um, or to respond. And voice is still there in case you're on the go or don't have your hands available. But we also now have touch-based input methods. And it's, it's an entire input method framework. So uh, our, creative, uh, our partner, TouchPal, has made this uh, nice new watch face. Um, and you'll be able to make watch faces. And when users download and install them, they'll be ready to go uh, for when users want to type. And so now I've sent my message. I see it up here right on the card. And the card doesn't go away. And this happens for two reasons. The first is we're using the new messaging style for notifications that's been added in Android N and it's also on Android Wear 2.0. Um, and that's going to allow the UI to take that reply and just put it right in the card. It knows where to put it because of, of the clearly defined semantics of the message. And also, we're asking developers not to retract messages until they know that the user has dismissed them. And we think that that's going to create that longer running conversational experience. And in general, notifications on Wear 2.0 are going to be a lot more like they are on phones and tablets. 
On a phone or a tablet, you have this expectation that if you swipe down on the shade and you touch a notification, you get to an experience that, you know, for, for the app that submitted the notification, you get to a part of that app where you can then act on whatever you've seen. And we want that to work the same for Android Wear. So we're asking uh, developers to set the content intent to drive users back to your carefully crafted experiences. Now, if you're using notification bridging, what happens? So in this case, there isn't an app on the watch. Uh, but we have a solution. So we decided to make a great expanded notification uh, experience. And this works for all notifications. When you touch a notification, you launch into it. Uh, and it kind of stands in for the app. Uh, and for messaging especially, uh, we're able to pr present an experience that's a lot like the best of what we see in messaging apps. So because of all the data you add in your messaging style for that notification, we can show you conversation history, your messages come in in the right place. And we've also added a smart replies API that lets Android Wear insert uh, contextually appropriate possible replies. And it does that using the machine learning model right on the device. And of course, as you use your conversational apps more, they show up on uh, the launcher in the recent section, so they're easy to get back to. And the new uh, complications uh, will allow users to add shortcuts to conversations and people they care about right on the watch face. So my partner is just one touch away. So messaging just got a lot more conversational. Uh, we now have inline actions that are easily discoverable and easy to use. We have inline replies, so messages show up right in the right place. We have content intents that launch apps. And of course, expanded notifications that stand in for those apps when they're not there. The app launcher is much faster uh, to get back to conversational apps. And save conversations. You can save your conversations and put them right on the watch face so you can get back to them easily. All right, back over to Brett uh, for uh, hearing about the Fit platform on Android Wear. Thank you. So as we've heard from users and developers, users want more in terms of want more from their uh, wearable experiences in terms of helping them reach their fitness goals. And developers wanted more out of the Fit platform in terms of being able to help users. So we've heard that feedback. And we have a bunch of stuff to talk about in the fitness platform. So we're doing uh, three things in 2016. Real-time data update notifications so that you can drive contextual notifications and experiences for users. Real-time gym activity recognition, so that untapped experience of being in the gym can get a lot better with the, with the wearable fitness app. And the one I'm really excited about, a really magical one, which is real-time walking, running, and bicycling recognition. So let's talk about these. So real-time real -time data update notifications allow you to set a pending intent to get updates on any of these data types in the Fit platform. Concretely, it means that an app like LifeSum can look for when I've stopped a, a fitness activity, like the, the walk I went on this morning. And it can say, hey, you should have a glass of water based on the length of that activity. Or if I did a long bike ride, it might say, you should have two or three glasses of water. And to call back to our earlier experience, if I've overeaten a little bit uh, and log that in an app, another app can look at that and say, hey, to get back on track, maybe eat a little less or do a little bit of a workout. So these kind of real-time, contextually-driven notifications are just a lot more possible in Android Wear 2.0. And we're looking forward to what you do with them. Second is that we're working on an API for launching later this year that actually recognizes the actions that people are doing in the gym. So that means that bicep curl, uh, deadlifts, push-ups, squats can all be recognized in real time, and that you, and you can build fitness experiences around that for, for people's gym time. Third is recognizing outdoor activities such as walking, running, and cycling. This means that the user, just by wearing their wearable and starting a run, the app that they want to launch when they start that activity will just launch and support that activity. So for me, that's Strava. And I can't wait to actually use this so that I don't have to like, you know, fiddle with my watch to, to, to launch an app to support my run. We're really excited about this one. So that's all the fitness stuff for Android Wear 2.0. And then just in summary, we've made a lot of improvements across the entire platform. Fitness, messaging, the watch face, 
standalone apps, and a new user interface and app patterns to tie it all together. So, but this is a developer preview, so we want to hear from you. So come talk to us. Come talk to Dan and I after the talk. Go to g.co slash where preview, and you can download developer guidelines, designer guidelines, the new emulator, and system images for a couple of watches. Yeah, and uh, this developer preview is really, uh, it's not just about us telling you what to do. We also want to hear what you need from us. So please do, uh, let's start the conversation uh, real soon, immediately. Yeah. So just want to call out, this is the first Android Wear talk today, but back to back all afternoon from 1 p.m. to 5 p.m., there are five more talks, or sorry, four more talks. And so you can, if you want to go deep on Android Wear today, go get your lunch eat it, and put your butts in your seats all afternoon for Android Wear. And those will be online, too. Mm -hmm. And with that, let's, uh, we'll do Q&A. And so if anyone has questions, there are four mics in each of the aisles. And while people line up, um, I just want to plug that we're really serious about wanting you know, your feedback on Android Wear 2.0, your bugs, your API suggestions. And come talk to us at the Sandbox. Um, and when Wear is over, uh, sorry, two, uh, I O is over. Uh, join the join the online community. So uh, we'll start with the hand wave. I think I saw over here. For the example you're classifying, go left. Otherwise, go right. Now let's use this tree to classify an example from our testing data. Here are the features and label for our first testing flower. Remember, you can find the feature names by looking at the metadata. We know this flower is a setosa, so let's see what the tree predicts. I'll resize the windows to make this easier to see. And the first question the tree asks is whether the petal width is less than 0.8 centimeters. That's the fourth feature. The answer is true, so we proceed left. At this point, we're already at a leaf node. There are no other questions to ask, so the tree gives us a prediction, setosa, and it's right. Notice the label is zero, which indexes to that type of flower. Now let's try our second testing example. This one is a versicolor. Let's see what the tree predicts. Again, we read from the top, and this time the petal width is greater than 0.8 centimeters. The answer to the tree's question is false, so we go right. The next question the tree asks is whether the petal width is less than 1.75. It's trying to narrow it down. That's true, so we go left. Now it asks if the petal length is less than 4.95. That's true, so we go left again. And finally, the tree asks if the petal width is less than 1.65. That's true, so left it is. And now we have our prediction. It's a versicolor, and that's right again. You can try the last one on your own as an exercise. And remember, the way we're using the tree is the same way it works in code. So that's how you quickly visualize and read a decision tree. There's a lot more to learn here, especially how they're built automatically from examples. We'll get to that in a future episode, but for now, let's close with an essential point. Every question the tree asks must be about one of your features. That means the better your features are, the better a tree you can build. And in the next episode, we'll start looking at what makes a good feature. Thanks very much for watching, and I'll see you next time. So constraints, they're a great way for you as a developer to deal with the ever-expanding number of screen sizes, device rotations, and new form factors like slide over in the iOS world. But one unfortunate casualty in this brave new world of alignment has been the way we animate views. See, it used to be we could go around setting a UI view's position or frame with a fun little UI view animate with duration method and watch our view scoot around the screen. Oh, well, that was fun. Uh, but that's harder to do in a world full of constraints. Constraints don't necessarily play nicely with a view whose frame you're setting explicitly, as you can see here. Well, that leads us to this episode's quick tip sent in by Jacob Cho, a fan of Route 85 and a software engineer at Ensemble, a mobile app developer located in beautiful Vancouver, British Columbia. Jacob notes that many iOS developers forget that in addition to the old way of animating a view's position, you can also animate constraints in iOS. Let's look at how you might do that. Here's my storyboard, and as you can see here, I've got everything set up nicely using constraints. Now to move my UI image view on and off screen, I'm gonna to wanna to change this constraint here, the one that sets my image's leading edge to the leading edge of my super view. Right now it's set to minus 180, so it's off screen. 
So first, I'm going to control drag from this constraint into my view controller to make it an IV outlet of type NS layout constraint. This allows me to access it in my code. Now I can adjust it with a standard UI view animate with duration call. In this case, I'll change the constant of the constraint from minus 180 to zero so that it appears on screen, and now we can give it a try. Huh, well that's weird. The, the constant definitely changed, but what happened to my animation? Well, it turns out to get this constant to animate nicely, I need to call layout if needed on my view controller's view within this animation block. We'll give it one more try and, oh, that's much better. I now have a constraint that I can change within an animation block and everything animates smoothly to its final position, except in cases where I want to adjust something besides my constraints constant. Let's take a look at another example. Here, I want to adjust this center square to expand or shrink to be either twice or half the width of its neighbors. Now, I could do that in theory by adjusting the multiplier on the center view's width constraint, but it turns out that changing that multiplier in code doesn't work. See, constraint multipliers are a get only property, and Xcode will give me an error. So, how do I change it? Well, the answer is I don't. Instead, I, can cre I create two completely different constraints and enable or disable either one as necessary. As long as I'm still calling layout if needed in my animation block, this kind of change will still animate. Now, there are two ways I can accomplish this constraint swapping. One way is to create both constraints in Interface Builder, like so. Now, Xcode will complain that these are incompatible, and it's right. So first step, we'll uninstall one of them by checking this box here. Next, we'll control drag both of these constraints into our code to make them IV outlets. And then I can enable or disable these as necessary in my animation block, like this. Once again, you'll notice I make sure we're calling layout if needed in our animation block, and we end up with a nice smooth looking animation. Look at that. The other way to accomplish this would be to create a completely new constraint in code. This is useful when I don't know in advance what I'm going to want this multiplier to be, and I need to create it dynamically. So let's see that in action. This time in my animation block, I'll first remove the old constraint. Next up, I can create a new multiplier. Let's make it slightly random just for fun. Ooh, hey, that is fun. Okay, next I'll create a brand new constraint with this new multiplier and assign it to my center view width property. And then I can add it back in again to my view. Finally, I call layout if needed on the super view in the animation block. And I once again have some nicely animating views that use this new constraint that I've created. And because this is all done using constraints, you'll notice this works as intended on an iPhone, an iPhone in landscape mode, or even, say, a slide overview on an iPad. And once you understand that this trick simply involves removing an old constraint and adding a new one, you might discover a whole new world of animation is available to you simply by turning on and off various constraints. For example, on this screen, I can change all my views to be either left aligned or right aligned simply by adding and removing two different groups of constraints and then calling our now familiar layout if needed method. Pretty neat, huh? Oh, by the way, one fun little quirk about all this, if you add your new constraints before you remove the old ones, iOS will complain about all the incompatible constraints it has to deal with in those like few milliseconds. So always make sure you remove the old ones first before adding the new ones. So thanks to Jacob for the quick tip. Jacob, you're gonna get a very stylish Google t-shirt in the mail, but hang on, we're not done yet. You see, now that you know all about constraint animation, I have a couple more quick tips from one of Google's engineers about more efficient ways to implement it. So follow me on to the next video, because we're not done learning just yet. Click here. Click here. And uh, otherwise, I'll see you on Route 85. Bye. People love to use different mobile devices in different ways that suit their situation and lifestyle. Michael uses a phone to play games on the go, while Tony enjoys using a large tablet as he relaxes on the sofa. And Jen carries a small tablet in her purse for reading on the bus. But they all want to use your app on the devices they prefer. So you'll want to make sure they each have a great experience, regardless of screen size, OS version, and the features of the app they use the most. It can be taxing to test each one of these situations so that all your users can be happy. We know you'd rather not have to buy and store stacks of devices and test your app in all these circumstances. That's why we built Firebase Test Lab for Android to make it easy and affordable for you to test your app with a variety of devices and be sure it works great for all your users. Our device lab, hosted in the cloud, offers a variety of physical devices ready to test your app. The selection of devices is always growing, so your tests will stay current with the latest hardware and operating systems. 
The easiest way to use Firebase Test Lab is to run a robo-test. This is an intelligent, automated test that crawls your app to discover and exercise its features. You won't need to write any additional code to make use of a robo-test. For more advanced testing, you can also script the interactions with your app to simulate specific use cases and verify that everything works as expected. Test results include a detailed report for each device used, including screenshots, device logs, and any crashes that may have occurred during the test. This allows you to verify that your app is working correctly on the variety of devices and configurations you selected. It's easy to make Firebase Test Lab a part of your daily development routine. And we have multiple ways to help you test regularly and spot errors early. First, you can use the Firebase console to upload and test your app. There is also a command line interface for testing with continuous integration servers, so you can automatically test every build. During Android development, you can deploy your app directly to Firebase Test Lab using Android Studio 2.0. And finally, in the Play Store developer console, there is a special automated launch test that will run for Android apps published to an alpha or beta channel. To get started using Firebase Test Lab and learn how to regularly test your app on different devices and configurations, you can start with the documentation available right here. Happy testing! Welcome to the Googleplex. This is an incredible place with lots of great stuff being worked on every single day. Before I worked here, I always wondered what it would be like to come to the Googleplex, meet up with a Googler, and have coffee with them, and just chat about what they do, how they do it, and why they do it. And today we're going to do exactly that. Welcome to Coffee with a Googler. I'm Lawrence Moroni, and I'm here in New York City to meet with Roman Nurek. And Roman Nurek is one of our material design gurus here at Google. So material design, tell me, what, what's it all about? Oh, Lawrence, what is material design? Um, yeah, it's, I, you know, it's, it's kind of hard to explain. There's actually a, a video uh, okay. with a bunch of the original designers that created material design, and they get asked the same question, and they don't know how to answer it. <laughs> um, it, is a, it is a complex kind of thing. There's a lot of things going on. Um, I guess at the most basic level, it's, it's a design language. Okay. It's a design system. Um, it's, it covers visual interaction and motion design. I feel like most design systems, design languages, are treated as just visual languages, like right. here are the colors you should use and so on. But okay. you know, material is is much more than that. It it really kind of covers the the model, the underlying physical model of a UI. Okay. So it basically tries to establish this this physical environment within which your apps should live, on a phone, on a tablet, on a computer, um, basically any sort of screen. Um, and then it, it basically establishes this physical environment in a set of basic rules and principles. Um, and I like to think of it along these kind of four basic axes or four basic principles. And that's uh, tangible surfaces, or okay. kind of the material metaphor. We okay. could talk about what material is at some point. Um, also, bold graphic design, this idea that you know, we, should, we should take some of the best design ideas from the print world and see how that can help us you know, make really great apps on, you know, on digital devices. Right. Right. Um, and the third is meaningful motion, basically how all these things, how um, the surfaces and the, the ink on that surface, the, the, the graphic design stuff, how that all kind of you know, moves in a consistent way mm -hmm. to help communicate what's going on. And the fourth thing, which is to me one of the most important things, is, um, is adaptive design, which is how can we take all these, these first three things and make sure that they work consistently and coherently across different devices, phones, okay. tablets, and everything else. Now, you have a video, right, of some really good examples yeah. of material design being used. So shall we, shall we roll that? Let's roll it.
So some pretty excellent examples yeah. there, but it's like, you know, how does somebody reach that level? For someone like me, I'm a developer and my design skills are non-existent. So if I, if I want to become somebody who can build apps with those kind of design, how, how do I get started? And well, how do it, I learn this stuff? It's a, it's a great question. Um, I think, first of all, I just want to, I guess, recognize some of those apps, are, they're doing amazing jobs and they have, they have yeah. large teams. They, some of them right. actually have very small teams. Uh, some of those apps are you know, created by one person. Mm -hmm. So you can absolutely reach that level of quality from these amazing showcase apps, regardless of your team size. Okay. Um, but I'd say for the developers and designers out there that are just getting started, there are a lot of great resources out there. Um, you know, there's a, there's a great Udacity course that okay. uh, me, uh, Nick Butcher, um, also from, uh, from the Google team here, um, and James Williams from Udacity put together. Um, and that's available at udacity.com slash Google. Right. Um, and there's also a bunch of amazing resources on design.google.com, uh, which will kind of tell you about how to come to Android if you're doing iOS stuff, okay. for example, or how to kind of get started understanding what material design is. There's obviously the, the entire material design guidelines are there. Okay. So um, I'd say that the, the first thing, the, the Udacity uh, course, is probably the, the best kind of first step in getting started. Um, but there's there's a whole lot of resources okay. out there, and we link to others from the Udacity okay. course. And Udacity courses, if you're not familiar with them, they are very Socratic in how they teach, right? It's it's short videos and then challenging you to do something, and then a short video and then getting you to do something. And it's a good way that someone can incrementally learn rather than be thrown into like a huge design doc or something yes. like that, right? So yeah, it's it's definitely there's a very clear progression. We specifically design that course so that you can kind of start with some of the basics, the most elementary basic things about a screen, like what is a pixel, mm -hmm. what is a density independent pixel, and then you kind of ramp all the way up to how do I make everything work on phones, tablets, and so on. Right, and I have to assume that a design course is well designed, right? Uh, we, have some, <laughs> we have some very nice color choices in our, in our slides or our tablet drawings, so cool. hopefully. <laughs> so, so, so back to material design again, it's like why, why material? What is it that... So material goes back to that first principle. Right. Um, so the, this idea of uh, tangible surfaces, this idea that you know everything on a you know on on your screen and your device exists on a on a surface. Mm -hmm. uh, we like to think of them as pieces of paper. Um, so basically, you can think of um, a basically a sheet of material or um, the word material representing one of those pieces of paper. And the reason we don't just call it paper is because it actually is. It's a lot more than just paper. In the real world, paper, you know, once you rip it up, you can't really just you know, put it back together. And paper can't go from being you know, a circle to a square or to a mm -hmm. rectangle. Um, and so we like to think of our digital pieces of material or sheets of material um, as kind of a, a smarter paper, a more kind of, you know, a still a constrained paper. You can't just do anything. You can't, it can't just you know, do all sorts of crazy things. But it is a physical thing that exists inside of this kind of you know environment, this this right. kind of like faux environment, but it it is something that that has a lot of thought put into it. And so the word material, you know, to me really means the the sheets of paper that everything in this world exists on. But for me, the the main thing you know to think about the the reason that motion is so important in material design is that you know motion should always have meaning. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, try not to. You know, like you know, just do a, like a flip of a button or like a double rotation or something, just to kind of draw attention. Every every time something moves, it attracts our attention, and so it needs to be really thoughtful and, and really kind of carefully planned out. And so, in material, we use motion, or we kind of use just enough motion to convey the change in some object's state, or you know, try to get a little bit of attention, but. You know, just enough motion, not too little, not too much. I understand Android Studio has some templates to allow developers to at least get started with uh, building material design into Absolutely. Apps. So one of the one of my philosophies for a long time has been, you know, we can write about, you know, a material design. We can write about a thing. Um, mm -hmm. We can make suggestions about that thing, and we can try to teach people about that thing. But one of the best ways to get, you know, the thing into people's hands. Uh, you know, in this case, material design is to actually just you know build it into the tools. Just mm -hmm. make sure that you know, as a developer that's just getting started, even just on Android, um, if I just go to File, New Project, or New App, right, I should be able to get the latest and greatest. Mm -hmm. And so, in you know, in Android Studio now, we're actually seeing um, new templates uh, for material design. So you could do 
file a new project, and then your default activity templates are going to come with material design in them. Okay. So it's going to use the material theme. Um, it's going to use some of the some of the latest uh, support libraries for material design. So things like the Android Design Support Library, things like App Compat. Cool. And so you're you're just going to get a lot of great stuff for free right off the nice. bat. Nice. So for someone like me, I'm I'm a coder, not a designer, <laughs> and so but so I can use Android Studio, get the, the effectively the scaffolding done for me in exactly. these templates, and then learn from something like the Udacity course. Exactly. I, I definitely suggest you know, even before you do the Udacity course, file new project, right? Just look yeah. around the code, um, see what you get. Um, I think that, that's a great way to get started. I always valued, as a, as a kid and you know, growing up learning programming and stuff, I always valued experimentation. Mm -hmm. So definitely experiment with that. Um, but as soon as you kind of you know, uh, you know, hit some sort of, you know, if, you, if you hit an obstacle or something, obviously take a look at the guide and the reference and all that. But the Udacity course is a great way to say, you know what, let me just kind of see what Google thinks is the right way to kind of approach okay. understanding this, this okay. uh, system. Awesome. Well, thanks, Roman. This this has been a whole lot of fun, and I've learned more about material design <laughs> in the last five minutes than I'd had in in a year beforehand. So this is fun. I, and so I can much. I can always talk about this. Stuff. So <laughs> they've um, told me that about you. <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this is my favorite thing to talk about. <laughs> it's cool. It's been I'm, awesome. Last and time. I'm going to check out that Udacity course, and I recommend that you do so too. And if you're an Android developer, take a look at those templates. If you have any questions for me about this, or if you have any questions for Roman about material design, or other aspects of building for material design, just please drop us a line in the comments below. Thank you for watching this episode of Coffee with a Googler. Uh, for more great episodes of Coffee with a Googler and for more great videos on developer topics, please tune to the Google Developers channel on YouTube. Thank you. You just finished your app and it looks great. So let's call it a day because you're ready to rest, right? Wrong. I'm David East, and I'm here to convince you that you aren't done yet, because you need to build a widget. But first, what exactly is a widget? Well, a widget just consists of a single view that is passed to other apps, such as the home screen app, and this view gets displayed as a portion of their layout. And that single view has now become a window to your app from the home screen or even the lock screen. And this is where the magic comes in. Because you can use that widget to display information that your users will care about and to trigger actions that will bring them back into your app. This means that you have an opportunity to become the core part of your user's mobile experience. And how cool is that? Consider a simple non-interactive widget, like for a weather app. It can display the current temperature overlaid on a sunny sky to show the weather outside in a single glance on the home screen. Now you just gained a grateful user because they don't actually have to open up the app just to check the weather. But widgets are about doing things, not just showing off. So give that informative view a job to do. A click on the view should trigger a deep link into your app, but don't just open up your main activity. Instead, consider is there a better point of entry, such as the view for this week's forecast. Another use for a widget could be a control toggle. Perhaps you want to show how strong the Wi-Fi signal is right now. That's your view. And a click on that view could toggle the Wi-Fi on and off without ever directing the user into the settings app, which is super useful. But these are still only scraping the surface of what widgets can do for you and for users. Think about a calendar widget. The view can adjust to fill whatever size the user gives it, listing out all the events for today. Clicking on an event can open up its detail view, and scrolling through the list can show you everything that doesn't fit in the view. And just because you're showing a list doesn't mean you can't provide space for a quick add action to easily create a new event in a single click. Widgets are great because they empower you to make your app useful to users even when they haven't specifically opened it. And then you can easily get users back into your app because you're enticing them with completing an action. So check out the documentation on widgets to learn how you can get started and what widgets can do for you. But most importantly, just continue to build better apps. I got to do it, man. <sighs> Why in-app payments are important? Well, as you all know, users like free applications. However, 
You need to make a living out of your work. Life is not as easy as it seems, right? For that, we got you covered with in-app payments. You can see it in many examples, Clash of the Clans, Netflix, Spotify, and many more. In this episode, you'll learn how to perform common in-app billing operations for your Android applications. In-app billing is a service hosted on Google Play that lets you charge for digital content or for upgrades in your app. You can request product details from Google Play, issue orders for in-app products, and retrieve ownership information based on your user's purchase history. Google Play provides a checkout interface that makes user interaction with the in-app billing service seamless. It provides a more intuitive experience to your users. So now you need to set up. Before you can start using the in-app billing service, you'll need to follow these three steps. Add the library that contains the in-app billing API to your Android project. Why? Well, it's the definition of the interface that in-app billing expose. This will enable us to call its methods. Then, set the permissions for your application to communicate with Google Play. Last but not least, establish a connection between your application and Google Play. Now, you can place products for sale. Before publishing your application, you'll need to define the product list of digital goods available for purchase in Google Play Developer Console. Once your application is connected to Google Play, you can initiate purchase requests for in-app products. Google Play provides a checkout interface for users to enter the payment method so your application does not need to handle payment transactions directly. When an item is purchased, Google Play recognizes that the user has an ownership of the item and prevents the users from purchasing another item with the same product ID until it is consumed. You could also query Google Play to quickly retrieve the list of purchases that were made by the user. To ensure that in-app billing is functioning correctly, you should test the application before you publish it on Google Play. Early testing also helps to ensure that the user flow for purchasing in-app items is not confusing or slow, and that users can see their newly purchased item in a timely way. Want to know more? Follow the links below. Until next time, Eat your vegetables, use in-app payments, and listen to your partner. Developing a successful app isn't easy. To reach a broad audience, you'll need to consider your iOS, Android, and mobile web users. And to build for these platforms, you'll need a back-end server to store data and support the apps. Of course, you want to get your users logged in, hopefully lots of users, which means your backend will have to scale. Then after you've solved your scaling problems, you have to find more ways to spread the word to get new users. But have you found a way to measure all this activity? And oh no, your app is crashing and causing servers to meltdown, and you haven't even made a dime yet. <sighs> Don't you wish this could be easier? This is why we built Firebase. It has all the tools you need to build a successful app. It helps you reach new users, keep them engaged, scale up to meet that demand, in addition to getting paid. From the beginning, with Firebase, you'll have test lab and crash reporting to prevent and diagnose errors in your app. Your backend infrastructure problems are solved with our real-time database, file storage, and hosting solutions. Acquiring new users is easy with invites, AdWords, and dynamic links. And using the authentication component, you can get those users logged in with minimal friction. Once installed, you can keep your users engaged with notifications, cloud messaging, and app indexing. Then, with Remote Config, you'll have the freedom to experiment with new features and optimize the user experience in real time. And of course, you can earn money with the same AdMob component that's been monetizing great apps for years. Last, but certainly not least, our all-new Analytics component, designed uniquely for Firebase, brings insight into how well these components are working for you and your users. With Firebase Analytics, you can measure and optimize your advertising campaigns, discover who are your most valuable users, and understand exactly how they are using your app. Now, all these components work great on their own and provide a solid infrastructure to build out your app, but they work even better when combined in creative ways. So let Firebase handle the details of your app's backend infrastructure, user engagement, and monetization while you spend more time building the apps your users will love. To get started right now with Firebase on Android, iOS, or the web, follow these links for more information. Then, 
To manage and monitor your apps connected to Firebase, there's a web console to view crashes, set up experiments, track analytics, and a whole lot more. And to learn more about Firebase and all of its components, you can read the documentation right here. We can't wait to see what you build. Hey folks, welcome to Totally Tooling Tips Season 3. Come check us out. We're going to be talking about progressive web apps, uh, some of the tooling around them. On first visit, we've got um, a relatively fast uh, time to first meaningful paint. Module bundling, accessibility. Do you know what the top four things to look at when it comes to web accessibility are? Uh, no, I can only think of two. Like, I only think of audio and then visual. So there's visual, hearing, mobility, and cognition. The first episode will be out on April the 27th. So subscribe to the YouTube channel, check out season one and two before season three starts, which will be happening soon. We promise that season three is going to be equally as mediocre as seasons one and two. So constraints, they're a great way for you as a developer to deal with the ever-expanding number of screen sizes, device rotations, and new form factors like slide over in the iOS world. But one unfortunate casualty in this brave new world of alignment has been the way we animate views. See, it used to be we could go around setting a UI view's position or frame with a fun little UI view animate with duration method and watch our view scoot around the screen. Oh, that was fun. Uh, but that's harder to do in a world full of constraints. Constraints don't necessarily play nicely with a view whose frame you're setting explicitly, as you can see here. Well, that leads us to this episode's quick tip sent in by Jacob Cho, a fan of Route 85 and a software engineer at Ensemble, a mobile app developer located in beautiful Vancouver, British Columbia. Jacob notes that many iOS developers forget that in addition to the old way of animating a view's position, you can also animate constraints in iOS. Let's look at how you might do that. Here's my storyboard, and as you can see here, I've got everything set up nicely using constraints. Now to move my UI image view on and off screen, I'm going to want to change this constraint here, the one that sets my image's leading edge to the leading edge of my super view. Right now it's set to minus 180, so it's off screen. So first I'm going to control drag from this constraint into my view controller to make it an IV outlet of type NS layout constraint. This allows me to access it in my code. Now I can adjust it with a standard UI view animate with duration call. In this case, I'll change the constant of the constraint from minus 180 to zero so that it appears on screen, and now we can give it a try. Huh, well that's weird. The, the constant definitely changed, but what happened to my animation? Well, it turns out to get this constant to animate nicely, I need to call layout if needed on my view controller's view within this animation block. We'll give it one more try and, oh. That's much better. I now have a constraint that I can change within an animation block and everything animates smoothly to its final position, except in cases where I want to adjust something besides my constraints constant. Let's take a look at another example. Here I want to adjust this center square to expand or shrink to be either twice or half the width of its neighbors. Now I could do that in theory by adjusting the multiplier on the center views width constraint. But it turns out that changing that multiplier in code doesn't work. See, constraint multipliers are a get only property, and Xcode will give me an error. So how do I change it? Well, the answer is I don't. Instead, I, can cre I create two completely different constraints and enable or disable either one as necessary. As long as I'm still calling layout if needed in my animation block, this kind of change will still animate. Now, there are two ways I can accomplish this constraint swapping. One way is to create both constraints in Interface Builder, like so. Now Xcode will complain that these are incompatible and it's right. So first step, we'll uninstall one of them by checking this box here. Next, we'll control drag both of these constraints into our code to make them IV outlets. And then I can enable or disable these as necessary in my animation block, like this. Once again, you'll notice I make sure we're calling layout if needed in our animation block, and we end up with a nice smooth looking animation. Look at that. The other way to accomplish this would be to create a completely new constraint in code. This is useful when I don't know in advance what I'm going to want this multiplier to be, and I need to create it dynamically. So let's see that in action. This time in my animation block, I'll first remove the old constraint. Next up, I can create a new multiplier. Let's make it slightly random just for fun. Ooh, hey, that is fun. OK, next I'll create a brand new constraint with this new multiplier and assign it to my center view width property. And then I can add it back in again to my view. Finally, I call layout if needed on the super view in the animation block, and I once again have some nicely animating views that use this new constraint that I've created. 
And because this is all done using constraints, you'll notice this works as intended on an iPhone, an iPhone in landscape mode, or even, say, a slide overview on an iPad. And once you understand that this trick simply involves removing an old constraint and adding a new one, you might discover a whole new world of animation is available to you simply by turning on and off various constraints. For example, on this screen, I can change all my views to be either left aligned or right aligned simply by adding and removing two different groups of constraints and then calling our now familiar layout if needed method. Pretty neat, huh? Oh, by the way, one fun little quirk about all this, if you add your new constraints before you remove the old ones, iOS will complain about all the incompatible constraints it has to deal with in those like few milliseconds. So always make sure you remove the old ones first before adding the new ones. So thanks to Jacob for the quick tip. Jacob, you're going to get a very stylish Google t-shirt in the mail. But hang on, we're not done yet. You see, now that you know all about constraint animation, I have a couple more quick tips from one of Google's engineers about more efficient ways to implement it. So follow me on to the next video, because we're not done learning just yet. Click here. Click here. And uh, otherwise, I'll see you on Route 85. Bye. Bitcoin represents a way to transfer money anonymously and at almost no cost. And since it's an arbitrary currency with no nationality attached to it, you're free to exchange it with anyone in the world. What is money? Resources are limited and they hold explicit value to people. Most resources are physical and such needed to be traded in a physical form. Diamonds, gold coins, chickens or bikes. At some point, it becomes too difficult to physically transact those objects, and it's easier to agree, collectively, on the value of cash instead of gold. As we know today, this has many advantages. Credit cards and the modern banking basically gave us another abstraction layer on top of cash. There is a centralized system which defines who owns what resources. All of these trades are made virtually. This is the backbone of why Bitcoin is a valid idea. What is Bitcoin? Bitcoin is the centralized, anonymous, digital-only currency that recently received public attention. Bitcoin was originally developed in 2008. Like in any good mystery, someone using the alias Satoshi Nakamoto published a paper describing how Bitcoin could work. There's a very interesting story about this guy too. He must be very smart, but he never came forward to claim ownership or any part of the revenue. Just one year later, in 2009, Bitcoin started being traded. Where do they come from? Think about gold. You could buy it or mine it, and it's the same concept with Bitcoin. You do this by using your computer to hunt for 64 digit numbers. By having your computer repeatedly solve complex mathematical puzzles, you're competing with other miners to generate the number that the Bitcoin network is looking for. If your computer generates it first, you receive Bitcoins. The Bitcoin system is programmed to generate a fixed number of Bitcoins per unit of computing time. It is also self-sustaining, coded to prevent inflation, and encrypted to prevent anyone from disrupting its code. In the year 2140, the total number of Bitcoins in circulation will be capped at 21 million. So how much is a Bitcoin worth today? You'll need to Google it. Just type Bitcoin in US dollar, for example. You could also check it out at Priv.com. Why are they anonymous? Bitcoin are pseudo-anonymous because they are built upon this centralized system. The Bitcoins themselves are anonymous, the wallets are not. Here is why. The base algorithm creates anonymity, but as the recent court cases show, if your Bitcoin wallet is identified and attached to a person, then someone can go through and track every transaction you've made. Bitcoins exist entirely on their own because there's no central infrastructure to shut down. You are identified by nothing more than your Bitcoin wallet address, a string of randomized letters and numbers. There are absolutely no identifying characteristic beyond that. For the paranoid dude, you can simply create a new wallet for each transaction. Here are some interesting startups that push the technology forward. We are still in the initial phase of Bitcoins, and there are many challenges and opportunities ahead exchanges, wallets, merchant services, security, and more. But this is something for another episode. Until next time, 
eat your vegetables and listen to your partners. Hey there, Polycasters, Rob here. So before coming into the studio, we tweeted out a question to see what folks wanted to see in the next episode of Polycast. And a lot of folks wrote in and said they wanted to know how to lazy load Polymer elements to improve the performance of their apps. So that's exactly what we're going to cover today. Now to do that, we're going to start off over here at the Polymer docs. And we're going to go down to the API reference. And some folks might not even realize that we, we have an API reference, but it's, it's kind of hidden down here in the sidebar for the documentation. You can go click on that. And that's going to take you to this sort of uh, kind of classic Polymer doc layout, if, if you've seen this before on other elements. And this is where you can find all of the properties and methods of the Polymer object itself. So a lot of really cool stuff inside of here. This is also where, for instance, like the Polymer templatizer documentation is. So if you wanted to create your own uh, version of DOM if or DOM repeat, you could use templatizer to do that. Just a helpful tidbit there. But what we're interested in here is this Polymer base object. And Polymer base is sort of the base prototype for all Polymer elements. And it's where we hide interesting like methods and properties and stuff like that. The one I'm into is called import href down here. We can hit the embiggen button to make it larger. And so what import href is going to do, it's going to give us the ability to dynamically load an HTML import at runtime. It's got a few arguments that it takes. The first argument is we're going to give it an href, so basically just a path to some component or some uh, HTML import that you want to pull in at runtime. And then it wants callbacks for on success, on error. And lastly, it takes an option, which specifies whether or not you want the link tag to have an async attribute on it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use import href, and I'm going to build sort of a sample application. This is the app that I have thrown together. It is called Polymeal. It's a social network for foodies. And I guess people that like uh, stir fry, because um, there's a lot of pictures of stir fry. And uh, you can either go to the sort of the, the browse section, and you see here that I've got all sorts of yummy photos, or you could go to the activity feed, and you could see maybe like I'd be posting status updates from all the cool, awesome restaurants that I am eating at, right? Now, the main thing to take away from this is that these two sections have very, very different content, right? This one is, is a whole bunch of cards with some paper buttons on it. Right? And this activity feed is instead just sort of these like little, little status blurb things. So there's no reason to load all of this, uh, all these card elements if the user is just starting off in the activity feed. Right? It would just make more sense to load that at runtime to kind of like uh, reduce the bandwidth for our total application. So to do that, we're going to use import href over here in our code editor. So this is my X app element that I have started off with. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to have an X app element. Inside of XAP, I will chuck in a little iron pages here. And inside of uh, iron pages, we'll have sections for the different bits of our app that we are interested in. So I've got a browse section and an activity section. And we've also got the page.js router loaded into XAP as well. So if we go down to the JavaScript definition, we can see that I've got kind of a, a basic route stubbed out. And what I want to do is, when the route changes to either the browse section or the activity section, I'm going to call Polymer's import href method, load in my element definition. Once that's loaded in, I will then tell Iron Pages to switch over to that section. Now, the first thing I want to do, though, since we're starting off just at like slash, uh, right now what we're doing is we're actually just loading a shell that looks kind of like this, right? We don't have, uh, you know, we're not hitting either the browse or the activity section, so the users kind of got, you know, nothing to look at. So we'll start off by redirecting them, page redirect over to the Browse section. So this way, we just have kind of like a nice starting point. I'm going to write another handler for Browse, so page slash Browse. And you'll notice here that I'm using uh, ES6 fat arrow functions. That just makes it a little bit easier to, uh, to deal with the scoping of the this value inside of these handlers. So I'll say uh, page.browse. And what I first want to do is see if the element has already been loaded. Has this page been loaded before? Because if it has, there's no reason to import it again. So we'll call Polymer's isInstance method. And this is something that I don't even think it's, it's well documented. It might seriously not even exist anywhere in our docs. But I spoke with our tech writer. This is a thing. You can use it to sort of check to see if an element is an upgraded Polymer element. So because both our browse element and our activity element have IDs, 
We can reference them using automatic node finding. And we could say this.$browse. So if this is already a Polymer element, let's just go ahead and return. No reason to do anything. No, no importing or anything like that is needed. Uh, but we will set the selected value to browse. And then what that's going to do is that's going to tell our iron pages up here to switch to that section. As you can see, we're, we're binding its selected attribute to that property. Okay. Now, if the element has not been loaded, if it hasn't been upgraded yet, now we're going to import its definition. So we'll call uh, polymer.base.importhref. And we're going to pass it a path to the HTML import for the browse section that we want to load. So elements slash xbrowse slash xbrowse.html. And then we'll give it a success handler to run. So we're going to say, all right, cool, the element loaded in. Let's now set the selected state to browse. That'll tell Iron Pages to update. And now we can return, exit our, our route here. We should be good to go. If we go back and we look at our application now and we refresh the page, it should redirect to the Browse section, and it should start loading in all of those cards. Awesome, right? Uh, now we need to do the same thing for the Activity section. So I can just grab this entire route right here and uh, do, some, do some dangerous copy and paste work here. We're just going to go through, and any place where it says Browse, we'll just flip it out for Activity. Activity. Thank you, spell check. So when we go to slash Activity, we're going to check to see if the Activity element is upgraded. If it is, return. If it's not, import it. Let's go give that a look. So refresh the page, and we see our Browse section looking good. We go to the Activity section, and boom, we got our status feed showing up right there. Now. There's still a lot of unanswered questions to this. I kind of showed you the, the quick and dirty version of using import href. But what we didn't talk about was, you know, do we need to vulcanize these things into different bundles? And if so, how do we exclude common dependencies? Or can we just use HTTP2 to maybe like server push all the things or multiplex stream all of our dependencies? So there's still a lot of things that uh, remain to be worked out. And what we're going to do is we're going to talk about those in an upcoming episode of Polymer. But today, for what we've done here, if you have any questions, please leave them for me down in the comments. Otherwise, you can always ping me on a social network of your choosing at hashtag AskPolymer. As always, thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time. Otherwise, you can ping me on a social network at... Take two. I'll keep all the, the fun stuff up here, top two thirds of the screen. Last episode, we used a decision tree as our classifier. Today, we'll add code to visualize it so we can see how it works under the hood. There are many types of classifiers you may have heard of before, things like neural nets or support vector machines. So why did we use a decision tree to start? Well, they have a very unique property. They're easy to read and understand. In fact, they're one of the few models that are interpretable, where you can understand exactly why the classifier makes a decision. That's amazingly useful in practice. To get started, I'll introduce you to a real data set we'll work with today. It's called IRIS. IRIS is a classic machine learning problem. In it, you want to identify what type of flower you have based on different measurements, like the length and width of the petal. The data set includes three different types of flowers. They're all species of IRIS, Setosa, Versicolor, and Virginica. Scrolling down, you can see we're given 50 examples of each type, so 150 examples total. Notice there are four features that are used to describe each example. These are the length and width of the sepal and petal. And just like in our apples and oranges problem, the first four columns give the features, and the last column gives the labels, which is the type of flower in each row. Our goal is to use this data set to train a classifier. Then we can use that classifier to predict what species of flower we have if we're given a new flower that we've never seen before. Knowing how to work with an existing data set is a good skill, so let's import Iris into Scikit-Learn and see what it looks like in code. Conveniently, the friendly folks at Scikit provided a bunch of sample data sets, including Iris, as well as utilities to make them easy to import. We can import Iris into our code like this. The data set includes both the table from Wikipedia as well as some metadata. The metadata tells you the names of the features and the names of different types of flowers. The features and examples themselves are contained in the data variable. For example, if I print out the first entry, you can see the measurements for this flower. These index to the feature names, so the first value refers to the sepal length and the second to sepal width, and so on. The target variable contains the labels. Likewise, these index to the target names. 
Let's print out the first one. A label of zero means it's a Satosa. If you look at the table from Wikipedia, you'll notice that we just printed out the first row. Now both the data and target variables have 150 entries. If you want, you can iterate over them to print out the entire data set like this. Now that we know how to work with the data set, we're ready to train a classifier. But before we do that, first we need to split up the data. I'm going to remove several of the examples and put them aside for later. We'll call the examples I'm putting aside our testing data. We'll keep these separate from our training data. And later on, we'll use our testing examples to test how accurate the classifier is on data it's never seen before. Testing is actually a really important part of doing machine learning well in practice, and we'll cover it in more detail in a future episode. Just for this exercise, I'll remove one example of each type of flower. And as it happens, the data set is ordered so the first Satosa is at index 0, and the first Versicolor is at 50, and so on. The syntax looks a little bit complicated, but all I'm doing is removing three entries from the data and target variables. Then I'll create two new sets of variables, one for training and one for testing. Training will have the majority of our data, and testing will have just the examples I removed. Now just as before, we can create a decision tree classifier and train it on our training data. Before we visualize it, let's use the tree to classify our testing data. We know we have one flower of each type, and we can print out the labels we expect. Now let's see what the tree predicts. We'll give it the features for our testing data, and we'll get back labels. You can see the predicted labels match our testing data. That means it got them all right. Now keep in mind this was a very simple test, and we'll go into more detail down the road. Now let's visualize the tree so we can see how the classifier works. To do that, I'm going to copy-paste some code in from Scikit's tutorials. And because this code is for visualization and not machine learning concepts, I won't cover the details here. Note that I'm combining the code from these two examples to create an easy-to-read PDF. I can run our script and open up the PDF, and we can see the tree. To use it to classify data, you start by reading from the top. Each node asks a yes or no question about one of the features. For example, this node asks if the petal width is less than 0.8 centimeters. If it's true for the example you're classifying, go left. Otherwise, go right. Now let's use this tree to classify an example from our testing data. Here are the features and label for our first testing flower. Remember, you can find the feature names by looking at the metadata. We know this flower is a Satosa, so let's see what the tree predicts. I'll resize the windows to make this easier to see. And the first question the tree asks is whether the petal width is less than 0.8 centimeters. That's the fourth feature. The answer is true, so we proceed left. At this point, we're already at a leaf node. There are no other questions to ask, so the tree gives us a prediction, Satosa, and it's right. Notice the label is zero, which indexes to that type of flower. Now let's try our second testing example. This one is a versicolor. Let's see what the tree predicts. Again, we read from the top, and this time the petal width is greater than 0.8 centimeters. The answer to the tree's question is false, so we go right. The next question the tree asks is whether the petal width is less than 1.75. It's trying to narrow it down. That's true, so we go left. Now it asks if the petal length is less than 4.95. That's true, so we go left again. And finally, the tree asks if the petal width is less than 1.65. That's true, so left it is. And now we have our prediction. It's a versicolor, and that's right again. You can try the last one on your own as an exercise. And remember, the way we're using the tree is the same way it works in code. So that's how you quickly visualize and read a decision tree. There's a lot more to learn here, especially how they're built automatically from examples. We'll get to that in a future episode, but for now, let's close with an essential point. Every question the tree asks must be about one of your features. That means the better your features are, the better a tree you can build. And in the next episode, we'll start looking at what makes a good feature. Thanks very much for watching, and I'll see you next time. So constraints. They're a great way for you as a developer to deal with the ever-expanding number of screen sizes, device rotations, and new form factors like slide over in the iOS world. 
but one unfortunate casualty in this brave new world of alignment has been the way we animate views. See, it used to be we could go around setting a UI view's position or frame with a fun little UI view animate with duration method and watch our view scoot around the screen. Well, that was fun. Uh, but that's harder to do in a world full of constraints. Constraints don't necessarily play nicely with a view whose frame you're setting explicitly, as you can see here. Well, that leads us to this episode's quick tip sent in by Jacob Cho, a fan of Route 85 and a software engineer at Ensemble, a mobile app developer located in beautiful Vancouver, British Columbia. Jacob notes that many iOS developers forget that in addition to the old way of animating a view's position, you can also animate constraints in iOS. Let's look at how you might do that. Here's my storyboard, and as you can see here, I've got everything set up nicely using constraints. Now to move my UI image view on and off screen, I'm going to want to change this constraint here, the one that sets my image's leading edge to the leading edge of my super view. Right now it's set to minus 180, so it's off screen. So first I'm going to control drag from this constraint into my view controller to make it an IV outlet of type NS layout constraint. This allows me to access it in my code. Now I can adjust it with a standard UI view animate with duration call. In this case, I'll change the constant of the constraint from minus 180 to zero so that it appears on screen, and now we can give it a try. Huh, well that's weird. The, the constant definitely changed, but what happened to my animation? Well, it turns out to get this constant to animate nicely, I need to call layout if needed on my view controller's view within this animation block. We'll give it one more try and, oh. That's much better. I now have a constraint that I can change within an animation block and everything animates smoothly to its final position, except in cases where I want to adjust something besides my constraints constant. Let's take a look at another example. Here I want to adjust this center square to expand or shrink to be either twice or half the width of its neighbors. Now I could do that in theory by adjusting the multiplier on the center views width constraint, but it turns out that changing that multiplier in code doesn't work. See, constraint multipliers are a get-only property, and Xcode will give me an error. So how do I change it? Well, the answer is I don't. Instead, I, can cr I create two completely different constraints and enable or disable either one as necessary. As long as I'm still calling layout if needed in my animation block, this kind of change will still animate. Now, there are two ways I can accomplish this constraint swapping. One way is to create both constraints in Interface Builder, like so. Now, Xcode will complain that these are incompatible, and it's right. So first step, we'll uninstall one of them by checking this box here. Next, we'll control drag both of these constraints into our code to make them IV outlets. And then I can enable or disable these as necessary in my animation block, like this. Once again, you'll notice I make sure we're calling layout if needed in our animation block, and we end up with a nice smooth looking animation. Look at that. The other way to accomplish this would be to create a completely new constraint in code. This is useful when I don't know in advance what I'm going to want this multiplier to be, and I need to create it dynamically. So let's see that in action. This time in my animation block, I'll first remove the old constraint. Next up, I can create a new multiplier. Let's make it slightly random just for fun. Ooh, hey, that is fun. OK, next I'll create a brand new constraint with this new multiplier and assign it to my center view width property. And then I can add it back in again to my view. Finally, I call layout if needed on the super view in the animation block, and I once again have some nicely animating views that use this new constraint that I've created. And because this is all done using constraints, you'll notice this works as intended on an iPhone, an iPhone in landscape mode, or even, say, a slide overview on an iPad. And once you understand that this trick simply involves removing an old constraint and adding a new one, you might discover a whole new world of animation is available to you simply by turning on and off various constraints. For example, on this screen, I can change all my views to be either left aligned or right aligned simply by adding and removing two different groups of constraints and then calling our now familiar layout if needed method. Pretty neat, huh? Oh, by the way, one fun little quirk about all this, if you add your new constraints before you remove the old ones, iOS will complain about all the incompatible constraints it has to deal with in those like few milliseconds. So always make sure you remove the old ones first before adding the new ones. So thanks to Jacob for the quick tip. Jacob, you're going to get a very stylish Google t-shirt in the mail. But hang on, we're not done yet. You see, now that you know all about constraint animation, I have a couple more quick tips from one of Google's engineers about more efficient ways to implement it. So follow me on to the next video, because we're not done learning just yet. Click here. Click here. And uh, otherwise, I'll see you on Route 85. Bye.
people love to use different mobile devices in different ways that suit their situation and lifestyle. Michael uses a phone to play games on the go, while Tony enjoys using a large tablet as he relaxes on the sofa. And Jen carries a small tablet in her purse for reading on the bus. But they all want to use your app on the devices they prefer. So you'll want to make sure they each have a great experience, regardless of screen size, OS version, and the features of the app they use the most. It can be taxing to test each one of these situations so that all your users can be happy. We know you'd rather not have to buy and store stacks of devices and test your app in all these circumstances. That's why we built Firebase Test Lab for Android to make it easy and affordable for you to test your app with a variety of devices and be sure it works great for all your users. Our device lab, hosted in the cloud, offers a variety of physical devices ready to test your app. The selection of devices is always growing, so your tests will stay current with the latest hardware and operating systems. The easiest way to use Firebase Test Lab is to run a robo-test. This is an intelligent, automated test that crawls your app to discover and exercise its features. You won't need to write any additional code to make use of a robo-test. For more advanced testing, you can also script the interactions with your app to simulate specific use cases and verify that everything works as expected. Test results include a detailed report for each device used, including screenshots, device logs, and any crashes that may have occurred during the test. This allows you to verify that your app is working correctly on the variety of devices and configurations you selected. It's easy to make Firebase Test Lab a part of your daily development routine. And we have multiple ways to help you test regularly and spot errors early. First, you can use the Firebase console to upload and test your app. There is also a command line interface for testing with continuous integration servers, so you can automatically test every build. During Android development, you can deploy your app directly to Firebase Test Lab using Android Studio 2.0. And finally, in the Play Store Developer Console, there is a special automated launch test that will run for Android apps published to an alpha or beta channel. To get started using Firebase Test Lab and learn how to regularly test your app on different devices and configurations, you can start with the documentation available right here. Happy testing! Welcome to the Googleplex. This is an incredible place with lots of great stuff being worked on every single day. Before I worked here, I always wondered what it would be like to come to the Googleplex, meet up with a Googler, and have coffee with them, and just chat about what they do, how they do it, and why they do it. And today we're going to do exactly that. Welcome to Coffee with a Googler. I'm Lawrence Moroni, and I'm here in New York City to meet with Roman Nurek. And Roman Nurek is one of our material design gurus here at Google. So material design, tell me, what, what's it all about? Oh, Lawrence, what is material design? Um, yeah, it's, I, you know, it's, it's kind of hard to explain. There's actually a, a video uh, okay. with a bunch of the original designers that created material design, and they get asked the same question, and they don't know how to answer it. <laughs> um, it, is a, it is a complex kind of thing. There's a lot of things going on. Um, I guess at the most basic level, it's, it's a design language. Okay. It's a design system. Um, it's, it covers visual interaction and motion design. I feel like most design systems, design languages, are treated as just visual languages, like right. here are the colors you should use and so on. But okay. you know, material is, is much more than that. It, it really kind of covers the, the model, the underlying physical model of a UI. Okay. So it basically tries to establish this, this physical environment within which your apps should live, on a phone, on a tablet, on a computer, um, basically any sort of screen. Um, and then it, it basically establishes this physical environment in a set of basic rules and principles. Um, and I like to think of it along these kind of four basic axes or four basic principles. And that's uh, tangible surfaces, or okay. kind of the material metaphor. Okay. We could talk about what material is at some point. Um, also, bold graphic design, this idea that you know, we, should, we should take some of the best design ideas from the print world and see how that can help us you know, make really great apps on, you know, on digital devices. Right. Right. Um, and the third is meaningful motion, basically how all these things, how um, the surfaces and the, the ink on that surface, the, the, the graphic design stuff, how that all kind of you know, moves in a consistent way mm -hmm. to help communicate what's going on. And the fourth thing, which is to me one of the most important things, is, um, is adaptive design, which is 
how can we take all these these first three things and make sure that they work consistently and coherently across different devices, phones, okay. tablets, and everything else. Now, you have a video, right, of some really good examples yeah. of material design we being used. So shall we, shall we roll that? Let's roll it. Some pretty excellent examples yeah. there, but it's like, you know, how does somebody reach that level? And for someone like me, I'm a developer, and my design skills are non-existent. So if I if I want to become somebody who can build apps with those kind of design, how, how do I get started? And well, how do it, I learn this stuff? It's a it's a great question. Um, I think first of all, I just want to, I guess, recognize some of those apps are they're doing amazing jobs, and they have they have yeah. large teams. They, some of them right. actually have very small teams. Uh, some of those apps are. You know, created by one person. Mm -hmm. So you can absolutely reach that level of quality from these amazing showcase apps, regardless of your team size. Okay. Um, but I'd say for the developers and designers out there that are just getting started, there are a lot of great resources out there. Um, you know, there's a there's a great Udacity course that okay. uh, me, uh, Nick Butcher, um, also from uh, from Google team here, um, and James Williams from Udacity put together, um, and that's available at udacity.com/google. Right. Um, and there's also a bunch of amazing resources on design.google.com, uh, which will kind of tell you about how to come to Android if you're doing iOS stuff, okay. for example, or how to kind of get started understanding what material design is. There's obviously the, the entire material design guidelines are there. Okay. So um, I'd say that the, the first thing, the, the Udacity uh, course, is probably the, the best kind of first step in getting started. Um, but there's there's a whole lot of resources okay. out there, and we link to others from the Udacity course. Okay. And Udacity courses, if you're not familiar with them, they are very Socratic in how they teach, right? It's it's short videos and then challenging you to do something, and then a short video and then getting you to do something. And it's a good way that someone can incrementally learn rather than be thrown into like a huge design doc or something yes. like that, right? So. Yeah, it's it's definitely there's a very clear progression. We specifically design that course so that you can kind of start with some of the basics, the most elementary basic things about a screen, like what is a pixel, mm -hmm. what is a density independent pixel, and then you kind of ramp all the way up to how do I make everything work on phones, tablets, and so on. Right, and I have to assume that a design course is well designed, right? Uh, we have some <laughs> we have some very nice color choices in our in our slides or our tablet drawings, so cool. hopefully. <laughs> so, 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 so back to material design again, it's like why, why material? What is it that so material goes back to that first principle. Right. Um, so the, this idea of uh, tangible surfaces, this idea that you know everything on a you know on on your screen and your device exists on a on a surface. Mm -hmm. uh, we like to think of them as pieces of paper. Um, so basically, you can think of um, a basically a sheet of material or um, the word material representing one of those pieces of paper. And the reason we don't just call it paper is because it actually is. It's a lot more than just paper. In the real world, paper, you know, once you rip it up, you can't really just, you know, put it back together and paper can't go from being, you know, a circle to a square or to a mm -hmm. rectangle. Um, and so we like to think of our digital pieces of material or sheets of material um, as kind of a, a smarter paper, a more kind of, you know, a still a constrained paper. You can't just do anything. You can't, it can't just, you know, do all sorts of crazy things, but it is a physical thing that exists inside of this kind of you know environment, this this right. kind of like faux environment, but it it is something that that has a lot of thought put into it. And so the word material, you know, to me really means the the sheets of paper that everything in this world exists on. But for me, the the main thing you know to think about the the reason that motion is so important in material design is that you know motion should always have meaning. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, try not to 
you know, like, you know, just do a, like a flip of a button or like a double rotation or something just to kind of draw attention. Every, every time something moves, it attracts our attention. And so it needs to be really thoughtful and, and really kind of carefully planned out. And so in material, we use motion or we kind of use just enough motion to convey the change in some object's state or, you know, try to get a little bit of attention. But you know, just enough motion, not too little, not too much. I understand Android Studio has some templates to allow developers to at least get started with uh, building material design into Absolutely. Apps. So one of the, one of my philosophies for a long time has been, you know, we can write about, you know, a material design. We can write about a thing. Mm -hmm. um, we can make suggestions about that thing and we can try to teach people about that thing. But one of the best ways to get, you know, the thing into people's hands uh, you know, in this case, material design, is to actually just, you know, build it into the tools. Just mm -hmm. make sure that, you know, as a developer that's just getting started, even just on Android, um, if I just go to file, new project, or new app, right, I should be able to get the latest and greatest. Mm -hmm. And so in, you know, in Android Studio now, we're actually seeing um, new templates uh, for material design. So you could do file, new project, and then your default activity templates are going to come with material design in them. Okay. So it's going to use the material theme. Um, it's going to use some of the some of the latest uh, support libraries for material design. So things like the Android Design Support Library, things like App Compat. Cool. And so you're you're just going to get a lot of great stuff for free right off. The nice. Track. So for someone like me, I'm I'm a coder, not a designer, <laughs> and so but so I can use Android Studio, get the, the effectively the scaffolding done for me in exactly. these templates and then learn from something like the Udacity course. Exactly. I, I definitely suggest, you know, even before you do the Udacity course, file new project, right? Just look yeah. around the code, um, see what you get. Um, I think that, that's a great way to get started. I always valued, as, as a kid, and you know, growing up learning programming and stuff, I always valued experimentation. Mm -hmm. So definitely experiment with that. Um, but as soon as you kind of you know, uh, you know, hit some sort of, you know, if you, if you hit an obstacle or something, Obviously, take a look at the guide and the reference and all that, but the Udacity course is a great way to say, you know what, let me just kind of see what Google thinks is the right way to kind of approach okay. understanding this, this uh, okay. system. Awesome. Well, thanks, Roman. This, this has been a whole lot of fun, and I've learned more about material design <laughs> in the last five minutes than I'd had in, in a year beforehand. So This is fun. I, and so I, can, I can always talk about this stuff. So, <laughs> They've um, told me that about you. <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this is my favorite thing to talk about. <laughs> it's cool. It's been awesome. Lot and I'm, I'm going to check out that Udacity course, and I recommend that you do so too. And if you're an Android developer, take a look at those templates. If you have any questions for me about this, or if you have any questions for Roman about material design, or other aspects of building for material design, just please drop us a line in the comments below. Thank you for watching this episode of Coffee with a Googler. Uh, for more great episodes of Coffee with a Googler and for more great videos on developer topics, please tune to the Google Developers channel on YouTube. Thank you. You just finished your app and it looks great. So let's call it a day because you're ready to rest, right? Wrong. I'm David East, and I'm here to convince you that you aren't done yet, because you need to build a widget. But first, what exactly is a widget? Well, a widget just consists of a single view that is passed to other apps, such as the home screen app, and this view gets displayed as a portion of their layout. And that single view has now become a window to your app from the home screen or even the lock screen. And this is where the magic comes in. Because you can use that widget to display information that your users will care about and to trigger actions that will bring them back into your app. This means that you have an opportunity to become the core part of your user's mobile experience. And how cool is that? Consider a simple non-interactive widget, like for a weather app. It can display the current temperature overlaid on a sunny sky to show the weather outside in a single glance on the home screen. Now you just gained a grateful user because they don't actually have to open up the app just to check the weather. But widgets are about doing things, not just showing off. So give that informative view a job to do. A click on the view should trigger a deep link into your app, but don't just open up your main activity. Instead, consider is there a better point of entry, such as the view for this week's forecast. Another use for a widget could be a control toggle. Perhaps you want to show how strong the Wi-Fi signal is right now. That's your view. And a click on that view could toggle the Wi-Fi on and off without ever directing the user into the settings app, which is super useful but these are still only scraping the surface of what widgets can do for you and for users. Think about a calendar widget. The view can adjust to fill whatever size the user gives it, listing out all the events for today. 
Clicking on an event can open up its detail view, and scrolling through the list can show you everything that doesn't fit in the view. And just because you're showing a list doesn't mean you can't provide space for a quick add action to easily create a new event in a single click. Widgets are great because they empower you to make your app useful to users even when they haven't specifically opened it. And then you can easily get users back into your app because you're enticing them with completing an action. So check out the documentation on widgets to learn how you can get started and what widgets can do for you. But most importantly, just continue to build better apps. I got to do it, man. <sighs> Why in-app payments are important? Well, as you all know, users like free applications. However, you need to make a living out of your work. Life is not as easy as it seems, right? For that, we got you covered with in-app payments. You can see it in many examples, Clash of the Clans, Netflix, Spotify, and many more. In this episode, you'll learn how to perform common in-app billing operations for your Android applications. In-app billing is a service hosted on Google Play that lets you charge for digital content or for upgrades in your app. You can request product details from Google Play issue orders for in-app products, and retrieve ownership information based on your user's purchase history. Google Play provides a checkout interface that makes user interaction with the in-app billing service seamless. It provides a more intuitive experience to your users. So now you need to set up. Before you can start using the in-app billing service, you'll need to follow these three steps. Add the library that contains the in-app billing API to your Android project. Why? Well, it's the definition of the interface that in-app billing expose. This will enable us to call its methods. Then, set the permissions for your application to communicate with Google Play. Last but not least, establish a connection between your application and Google Play. Now, you can place products for sale. Before publishing your application, you'll need to define the product list of digital goods available for purchase in Google Play Developer Console. Once your application is connected to Google Play, you can initiate purchase requests for in-app products. Google Play provides a checkout interface for users to enter the payment method so your application does not need to handle payment transactions directly. When an item is purchased, Google Play recognizes that the user has an ownership of the item and prevents the users from purchasing another item with the same product ID until it is consumed. You could also query Google Play to quickly retrieve the list of purchases that were made by the user. To ensure that in-app billing is functioning correctly, you should test the application before you publish it on Google Play. Early testing also helps to ensure that the user flow for purchasing in-app items is not confusing or slow, and that users can see their newly purchased item in a timely way. Want to know more? Follow the links below. Until next time, eat your vegetables, use in-app payments, and listen to your partner. Developing a successful app isn't easy. To reach a broad audience, you'll need to consider your iOS, Android, and mobile web users. And to build for these platforms, you'll need a back-end server to store data and support the apps. Of course, you want to get your users logged in, hopefully lots of users, which means your back-end will have to scale. Then after you've solved your scaling problems, you'll have to find more ways to spread the word to get new users. But have you found a way to measure all this activity? And, oh no, your app is crashing and causing servers to meltdown, and you haven't even made a dime yet. <sighs> Don't you wish this could be easier? This is why we built Firebase. It has all the tools you need to build a successful app. It helps you reach new users, keep them engaged, scale up to meet that demand, in addition to getting paid. From the beginning, with Firebase, you'll have test lab and crash reporting to prevent and diagnose errors in your app. Your backend infrastructure problems are solved with our real-time database, file storage, and hosting solutions. 
Acquiring new users is easy with invites, AdWords, and dynamic links. And using the authentication component, you can get those users logged in with minimal friction. Once installed, you can keep your users engaged with notifications, cloud messaging, and app indexing. Then, with Remote Config, you have the freedom to experiment with new features and optimize the user experience in real time. And of course, you can earn money with the same AdMob component that's been monetizing great apps for years. Last, but certainly not least, our all-new Analytics component, designed uniquely for Firebase, brings insight into how well these components are working for you and your users. With Firebase Analytics, you can measure and optimize your advertising campaigns, discover who are your most valuable users, and understand exactly how they are using your app. Now, all these components work great on their own and provide a solid infrastructure to build out your app, but they work even better when combined in creative ways. So let Firebase handle the details of your app's backend infrastructure, user engagement, and monetization while you spend more time building the apps your users will love. To get started right now with Firebase on Android, iOS, or the web, follow these links for more information. Then, to manage and monitor your apps connected to Firebase, there's a web console to view crashes, set up experiments, track analytics, and a whole lot more. And to learn more about Firebase and all of its components, you can read the documentation right here. We can't wait to see what you build. Hey folks, welcome to Totally Tooling Tips Season 3. Come check us out. We're going to be talking about progressive web apps, uh, some of the tooling around them. On first visit, we've got um, a relatively fast uh, time to first meaningful paint. Module bundling, accessibility. Do you know what the top four things to look at when it comes to web accessibility are? Uh, no, I can only think of two. Like, I only think of audio and then visual. So there's visual, hearing, mobility, and cognition. The first episode will be out on April the 27th. So subscribe to the YouTube channel, check out season one and two before season three starts, which will be happening soon. We promise that season three is going to be equally as mediocre as seasons one and two. So constraints, they're a great way for you as a developer to deal with the ever-expanding number of screen sizes, device rotations, and new form factors like slide over in the iOS world. But one unfortunate casualty in this brave new world of alignment has been the way we animate views. See, it used to be we could go around setting a UI view's position or frame with a fun little UI view animate with duration method and watch our view scoot around the screen. Oh, well, that was fun. Uh, but that's harder to do in a world full of constraints. Constraints don't necessarily play nicely with a view whose frame you're setting explicitly, as you can see here. Well, that leads us to this episode's quick tip sent in by Jacob Cho, a fan of Route 85 and a software engineer at Ensemble, a mobile app developer located in beautiful Vancouver, British Columbia. Jacob notes that many iOS developers forget that in addition to the old way of animating a view's position, you can also animate constraints in iOS. Let's look at how you might do that. Here's my storyboard, and as you can see here, I've got everything set up nicely using constraints. Now to move my UI image view on and off screen, I'm going to want to change this constraint here, the one that sets my image's leading edge to the leading edge of my super view. Right now it's set to minus 180, so it's off screen. So first I'm going to control drag from this constraint into my view controller to make it an IV outlet of type NS layout constraint. This allows me to access it in my code. Now I can adjust it with a standard UI view animate with duration call. In this case, I'll change the constant of the constraint from minus 180 to zero so that it appears on screen, and now we can give it a try. Huh, well that's weird. The, the constant definitely changed, but what happened to my animation? Well, it turns out to get this constant to animate nicely, I need to call layout if needed on my view controller's view within this animation block. We'll give it one more try and, oh. That's much better. I now have a constraint that I can change within an animation block and everything animates smoothly to its final position, except in cases where I want to adjust something besides my constraints constant. Let's take a look at...
Chris. So do you want to pace behind me? Sorry? Oops. Good afternoon. I'm Chris Wilson. I'm a developer advocate on the web team here at Google. Joining me is my colleague, Francois, um, also from the web team. First, I want to apologize for all the crowding and the long lines. We're working it out. We'll be much, much better next year. And for the web track particularly, it all goes uphill from here. We have three great talks in a row on the web track in the amphitheater right after this talk. So rush right over there afterwards. And we have a nice big room here. So we're here today to show you some recent advances in the web platform, some current work that's going on, and sketch out a bit of what's next for the web. I'm going to cover a ton of ground. I'm going to talk really fast. I'm very sorry. But you're going to see short links to additional references on almost every slide in here. So there's lots more to cover, um, lots more information you can get. And I want to start by saying, first and foremost, in case you haven't been paying attention, progressive web apps are amazing. I've personally been working on the web platform for over two decades, uh, 23 years ago as of a few weeks ago. Um, and now is the first time I can happily say my dream's getting realized. You can build really awesome, engaging user experiences using only the pure web platform. You can and should build on this stuff, build on service workers and manifests and everything today. We have a great stream of talks, starting with, with Rahul's talk. And um, that'll teach you how to build amazing progressive web apps. However, that is not what this talk is about. Um, I like to think of progressive web apps as what's now for the web. And we're here to talk about what I like to call the new shiny, the bleeding edge of web platform features. These are features and APIs that may not be shipping yet. They may not work across browsers. They may not work across uh, different devices. They may need you to flip on some experimental flags. I'm going to dive reasonably deeply into some of them. Some of them I'm just going to whet your appetite for. I also want to say there are a few new shiny features not covered in this talk, specifically these, credential management web payments, Houdini features in CSS, WebAssembly and some other ECMAScript stuff, uh, web components, Shadow DOM, DevTools. These, we have great talks on these um, later today and tomorrow, uh, or catch them on video, of course but I'm not going to cover them here. So with that in mind, I want to first focus on some of the web platform's recent advances in developer ergonomics and performance. And ergonomics is kind of a big fuzzy word in this context. So this is basically features that make your job as a developer easier by making common tasks easier or quicker. Um, in many cases, enabling developers to do deeper performance analysis or performance improvements. And I want to start by recognizing some of the stuff we've already shipped here, some of the stuff that's already out there in common practice, like promises. So I would hope promises aren't new to any web developers here. Promises are really just a way of creating a consistent pattern for asynchronous APIs, um, rather than the confusing mess of ever so slightly different callback mechanisms we used to have, or heaven forbid, in some cases, synchronous APIs that blocked. And we need to change the mindset of web development to be non-blocking. So promises are now common practice in new web API design. We've recast HTML media element.play to return a promise, for example. Something that's been out there for a while, but now it returns a promise because you can use this common pattern. Um, also, a bunch of the upcoming APIs we're going to talk about here, Web Bluetooth and Web USB and Web MIDI, they all use promises as part of the API, as well as the Fetch API. And who here is a web developer who has not yet used the Fetch API? OK, so I'm talking to you. Um, Fetch really just lets you make network requests. It's very similar to XML HTTP request, also called XHR, because XML HTTP request I can say about twice without stumbling on it. Um, the main difference is that Fetch uses promises, which enables a simpler and cleaner API. You can kind of understand what this code does without even really understanding anything more about Fetch. It avoids the callback hell and all the complex API of XHR. And it directly integrates JSON and other data types. XHR kind of grafted them on after the fact. So this code's pretty straightforward. Um, this is what it looks like in XHR. It's a little bit messier. You know, it's not too bad. But I am skipping the whole ready state monitoring that you usually have to do with XHR, which is pretty messy. And the real beauty of Fetch shows up when you combine it with arrow functions from ES6. Because then it gets this clean, and this looks super. 
Out of curiosity, how many of you use arrow function syntax regularly already? OK, that's, that's good to know. We're, we're trying to figure out uh, how adopted arrow functions are and how we can just talk about them. But the challenge with this, by the way, the challenge with this usage of fetch right here is that that JSON call is still atomic. We still need to get all the data. We need to fetch it all before we can pass, pass it off and parse it as JSON. So there's an effort underway to really unlock the power of fetch and a number of other APIs called streams. Now, streams is a fundamental building block. There's a bunch of different applications of streaming. A thorough explanation of all of streaming and how it works would take pretty much all the time we have left. But suffice to say that my colleague, Jake Archibald, um, he said back in January that streams would be the thing of the year for 2016. Now, Jake may be a little bit excitable. Um, I'm not quite as pumped as he is about the ability of streams to transform the word cloud into the word but in every document. But he is absolutely right that streams are a critical piece of building per performant progressive web apps. Because the point of streams is to enable progressive, pi progressive piping. And the really critically important piece, which we're still working on getting fully deployed, is being able to construct new streams and then progressively stream data through processing and rendering. You can process data as you're still fetching the rest of it and then progressively render it. This is especially important when you're building an app shell architecture because you're frequently fetching data from multiple places and you need to combine those progressively. Today, usually you're going to wait till all the resources come in, munge them together, and then pass it off to an HTML parse, and that's not very progressive. You'll actually have to wait till everything comes in. You'll hear a lot more about App Shell architecture in the progressive web app sessions, um, but Jake cooked up a little video demo that I wanted to look at. And this video shows a comparison of Jake's offline Wikipedia web app being rendered on the server on the far left and then a naive service worker client um, in the middle, then some hacks to make it faster, and then a fully streamed progressive web app architecture on the far right. So let's play the video. And it's worth noting, the server render actually is the slowest um, to get an initial render on the screen. It's nearly eight times slower than any of the other ones. But it's actually faster than any of the non-streamed ones at getting the final render on the screen. And this is because the non-streamed app shell architectures have to wait until all the data sources have been fetched before it can com combine them all and send them to the parser. So this is going to be critical for high performance progressive web apps. And in fact, for some types of apps, app shell architectures may cost you a little bit of performance today. Whoops. So I want to continue the performance theme. I want to talk about some other exciting features we've been building to help you build high performance applications. The first one of these is called a request idle callback. Now, many sites, and I'm sure a lot of your sites, have tons of script to execute. Not all of this script is associated with getting stuff on the screen for the user. For example, if you send analytics data while the user is scrolling the page, your web app is probably going to jank visually. We're Obviously, you're going to have a poor user experience in that case. So request idle callback lets you tell the system, hey, I've got this task. Run it when you've got some time. Make use of those idle gaps in this performance timeline. In the same way that adopting request animation frame let us schedule animations properly and maximize our chances of hitting 60 frames a second, request idle callback works together with request animation frame. It lets us schedule non-rendering work when there's free time for it. So it's really pretty easy. Just make sure you keep your tasks fine-grained. Obviously, if you have a 100 millisecond task to run, it's going to be a kind of a problem. And then call request idle callback whenever you have those tasks to be done and let it, let it take care of it. There are some ways to make sure that your, your script does actually run in a reasonable amount of time. Um, if you have long-running tasks, you probably really want to move those into web workers, just like now. Um, but both Facebook and Netflix are actually using request idle callback today to make use of idle time to do non-critical processing tasks. I had to get a cat picture in, so this is, this is the cat picture part. Another major initiative in continuing this mission to eliminate jank is a feature called passive event listeners. 
And I love this one because it ends up being so incredibly simple to do. This is a new DOM feature shipping in Chrome 51 that enables developers to opt in to better scroll performance. Smooth scrolling performance, obviously, it's critical for a good experience on the web, particularly on touch devices. And all modern browsers have a threaded scrolling feature that lets them basically render this scroll separately, even when there's expensive JavaScript running in the main UI thread. The problem, though, is that optimization gets defeated if you have touch or wheel handlers, event handlers, because they might prevent the scroll completely by calling prevent default. We don't know if it's going to call prevent default during the event handler. So we have to wait until the expensive JavaScript gets done. So passive event listeners let you tell the system that you're not going to mess with the, the default scrolling behavior. All you're saying is, I'm not going to call prevent default. So scrolling doesn't have to block on that event. Um, and it turns out this is far and away the most common case. In fact, in Chrome for Android, 80% of the touch events that get called that ended up blocking scrolling don't actually prevent scrolling. They don't call prevent default. So 10% of those events end up adding at least 100 milliseconds of jank to the, to the start of scrolling. And in 1% of the events, it adds at least half a second of jank. So let's take a quick look at how dramatic this change is. Um, this demo, let's go ahead and play the video. This is a CNN page with the touch events annotated as passive on the right-hand side. On the left-hand side, it's just the normal page. There's no other changes. And notice how it doesn't really affect the experience at all, except the one on the left keeps janking every once in a while, and it pauses. So you get a lot smoother experience. And CNN didn't actually have to prevent scrolling. They didn't, they didn't ever call prevent default. So unfortunately, the default scroll handler, if you have a, an event handler, is often janky. And this is easily preventable jank. Let's go ahead and go back. There we go. Um, so how easily preventable? This is it. All you have to do when you set up your touch and wheel handlers is just add a passive true option so that they'll, to say that they're never going to call prevent default. That's all you need to do. So pull out your laptops, get your code. Let's, I'll wait. That's cool. All right, maybe not. I really do have a lot to get through, so I'm not really going to wait. But Intersection Observer is the next powerful feature. This one you actually have to work at a bit. But Intersection Observer basically just enables you to understand the visibility and position of DOM elements. You can easily observe when elements come into view. You could do this before, but not very efficiently. There were a lot of problems with it. It was generally a little flaky. So let's look at the code to do this. You basically just set up some element that you want to observe, create an intersection observer object with a callback that checks for intersections. And then when you're ready to interact, tell the intersection observer what element to observe. Whenever it intersections change, it gets called. Your event handler gets called. This, by the way, is pretty much straight out of the code sample that we have online. Oops, sorry. That we have online that's linked at the bottom here. And I've now locked my screen. Hmm. And uh, I want to switch over to the demo machine. This is a, um, a demo that a, another teammate of mine, Surma, cre created. It's an infinite scroller that works by observing an element near the bottom and inserts more elements. So you can see on the scroll bar on the right, it'll suddenly, when I get to the end, it just keeps going, because it's adding more and more and more and more and more and more elements. Super fast. Like, that's the coolest thing, is it's really, really fast. There's a delay as it sort of simulates a network, uh, a network pull of this data. But this feature, actually, when you combine it with data caching via service worker, it's going to be so incredibly hot for doing infinite scrolling of photos and things like that. Let's flip back to the slides. And I did want to mention, by the way, another feature very briefly, link rel preload. This shipped in Chrome 50 lets you, surprise, surprise, preload resources. Um, we had link rel prefetch, but that was really for the next navigate, not the current page. So preload is destined for the current navigation. It, lets you, it has an as attribute that lets you um, set the right resource priority. So say this is an image or a script or whatever. And because it works well with reuse, it can also be used to load 
but not execute JavaScript. OK, this is a reminder for me to breathe at this point so I don't run out of time. Um, I hope you're still with me. We're not even remotely done at this point. But next up, HTTP client hints. Now, this is moving to a little bit of a different area. These are HTTP headers that enable content negotiation. But based on the user's device or environment, just like the accept header let browsers say what type of format they prefer, client hints let clients indicate what kind of specific preferences they have about um, appropriate data, like how big images should be, for example. So the client hints that we support are device pixel ratio, super handy for mobile devices, uh, preferred width for resource, the viewport width, sometimes you scale based on that. And there's also a new one, um, the save data client hint request. Uh oh. Whoa. My clicks got crazy. Uh, the save data client hint request, which lets servers know that users have, have a preference for reduced data usage. So either they have high transfer costs, um, like per byte payment, or they have a slow connection speed, or something like that. So you can say, hey, I want you to use a lower bandwidth version. So this basically, this is something built into the browser. You don't do this in your client code. But on the server, you can respond with one of these header, to one of these headers by passing back different versions, giving it a more appropriate version of the resource. If you know that it's a low device pixel ratio, probably send a lower re resolution image, and so on. Also in Chrome 50, we finally support two blob on the Canvas element. This has been a super long time coming. Like I think somebody said six years, but I didn't check back to make sure. This is great news, though, for anybody who generates images on the client side. Because if you want to upload these to your server or store them in IndexedDB or anywhere else for future use, you don't have to, to um, manipulate a base64 encoded string that you get from to data URL. You can now work directly with the encoded binary data. You can even draw image blobs to another Canvas context with a great new API, the Create Image Bitmap API also landing in Chrome 50. Because decoding images for use with a canvas, of course, is pretty common. The problem is that decoding images is also pretty CPU intensive. And you always want to get everything that's CPU intensive off the main thread. So image bitmaps let you manage these images um, without having to do that step between base64 encoding the data. That way, you can pass things back and forth across threads draw it in a canvas in the main thread, just like you would any other image element, canvas, video, whatever. And this lets you really optimize your image loading across threads. Another great way to avoid jank. Now, speaking of images, I know I'm going super fast here. I don't want to dive too deeply into the details of all the work across the media stack, because we've done tons of it across WebRTC and everywhere else. And you might expect, some of the, those of you who know me, might expect that I'm going to get up here and talk about all the web audio features, because I love web audio. But I'm not. I'm going to resist the temptation. Um, there are three media features that I want to mention. And the first one is so incredibly boring, I didn't even put an image on the slide. Because this isn't really a feature. This is actually a Chrome code change. Chrome now has a unified media pipeline that goes across desktop and mobile. And we don't pass off so much to the Android media stack. This unification means we have more consistency across platforms for features like caching, decoding, and encoding. And it makes developing and debugging across these platforms a whole lot easier, since it works the same. But the second and much more interesting media feature that I do want to mention is the Media Recorder API. Now, Media Recorder makes it easy, in fact, pretty much trivial, to not only capture video and audio, which we could already do, but encode it and save it, like get it as an encoded version of itself. And for all those people who have been pinging me on Stack Overflow for years with web audio questions about how do I get an MP3 file to upload to the server, this is how you do it, Media Recorder. So let's take a quick look at the demo. There we go. Hi. 
there's actually sound now too. But so this is obviously a really simple demo. Let's flip back to the main screen again, to the slides, I mean. Thank you. Um, the important part of this demo, though, wow, is this is the main part of the code from it. This is what does the heavy lifting. All you have to do here is create this media recorder object with the right options to say, this is the type of encoding. This is whether I want video or video and audio or whatever. And then as data comes in, there's an on data available callback. And all you have to do is handle it. And for most types, all you really do is stuff those blobs together. And at the end, you just say, OK, give me one blob. And that's your data file that's encoded already for you. You can save it to disk. You can upload it to a server. Whatever. You're done. The final media API I want to mention is media sessions. And media sessions is really about integrating with the app's platform media focus. So custom platform media controls or media keys like the play button on my laptop, those things are now exposed to the web. Some of these features are implicit, like media playing notifications. Some of them are explicit APIs you can write to. If you're developing any kind of media playback API or media playback app, Go take a look. Whew. All right. I want to recognize a few CSS features. CSS variables, uh, first of all, more accurately known, I guess, as CSS custom properties, landed in Chrome 59. Uh, these are great for reducing repetition in your CSS, also for easy theme switching. And if you build a lot of uh, simple sites, not a lot of DOM nodes, no widgets, you don't really, you're not going to care about this feature. Just you know, tune out for 20 seconds or so. On the other hand, if you build a lot of complex sites with lots of widgets, uh, use third-party widgets, for example, CSS containment helps you optimize the performance by containing the effects of those rules. And you can also use containment to protect your site from getting its performance affected by third-party widgets. Next up, CSS font loading. Font loading was first implemented in Chrome 35, so quite a while ago. But um, the font face set in interface, which just came in with Chrome 48, lets you check individual font faces and their download status. So all in all, you can really dig into how fonts are actually getting loaded and utilized by the web engine. And at this point, you're thinking, I'm just going to get progressively shorter and faster at dumping features at you and just tell you, go look it up. So I'm going to take a quick break from ergonomic features and talking about those. Switch gears. And before I talk about new bedrock capabilities, um, I want to talk a bit about how the Chrome team has changed their approach to moving the web platform forward over the past year or two. First and foremost, I hope you get Google really does love the web. Like At Google, everyone I work with absolutely loves the web. And one of the most important messages I hope you walk away from this with is that we believe we have a mission of moving the web forward. And when I say the web, I don't mean the Chrome web. We really want the web to, as a whole to be awesome. And we don't believe that our job is done until features ship interoperably across modern browsers. Because if they don't ship across all browsers, you don't really get to use them all the time. And as an example, we're not super bullish on the idea of vendor prefixing anymore, um, because that ends up building a single vendor web, which isn't great. Today, we have a four-pronged approach to being responsible at how we move the web forward. First and foremost, of course, we have different channels. Um, I think probably everybody knows something about the channels. We have a stable channel that's what average users use, all the way to the Canary channel, which is basically the latest and highly experimental features all crammed in. Um, but secondly, we put experimental features behind experimental flags. So if you want to use Web Bluetooth, which Francois is going to talk about, um, you're going to have to go turn it on in Chrome flags. It's not going to just show up even in Canary. Third, we're actually building new infrastructure. This is a, a new thing. Um, we haven't really talked a ton about this in public, although we have mentioned it before. Um, this feature called origin trials, which is a way of taking some of those experimental features and letting a web developer test it out in the wild briefly via a key that they have to ask for. 
So it's specific for them, but it is in stable builds. Like it's a feature that's going to get turned on for an average user. However, like you can get broad feedback then. Like you can see what happens when an average user uses this feature, but you, it shuts off after a given point in time. So none of these last forever. They're pretty short term. And additionally, if too many people are using this feature, it automatically shuts off too. Because we don't want these features to get baked into the web platform. We don't want people thinking, hey, this is just part of the web now, when they're not. And then finally, um, we have a core policy of incubating all of our substantial new features. Uh, we do this through a W3C community group that I personally co-chair, the Web Incubator Community Group. My co-chairs call this the YCG. I personally prefer Wicked, but you know, whatever. Um, this is designed to be a lightweight way to make and discuss standards proposals, like have a semi-organized fashion around it, but you know, not spend all our time planning charters and things but still properly managing intellectual property and getting all that contribution up front. So all of our new substantial features go through this community group. OK, and finally, by the way, uh, part of keeping the web platform healthy is removing APIs that are no longer necessary. When they get replaced by new APIs or their experiments that just didn't work out, we should pull them out. So this is actually just the deprecations from the last three releases of Chrome. Um, we're looking at removing bigger features, too, like uh, request autocomplete or even HTML5 app cache. But we do have policies about how we can remove them. So don't worry. We're not going to yank things out that people are, are still using. So let's talk about new capabilities that we're adding to the web platform. Before we talk about truly cutting edge, you know, stuff that is really experimental, since I am on stage, I'm going to seize the moment. I'm going to demonstrate the success of my personal pet feature. And somebody out here, I'm sure, knows what it is, because somebody asked me about it earlier, right before we, I went on stage. Um, make sure I'm set up here. Web MIDI. So I can tell a few of you know what MIDI is. Uh, MIDI is a more than 30-year-old standard for connecting uh, keyboards and synthesizers, music instruments, keyboard controllers like this one, um, to computers and each other. And a couple years ago, when I first started playing with web audio, I said, hey, I really want to control this from my keyboard controller. So I put together a standard, worked in the W3C, uh, and we shipped it in Chrome last year. Um, Firefox, incidentally, just started their code review for their implementation, which is awesome. And since last year, a lot of music vendors have jumped on board and started using the web platform to deliver their experiences. Yamaha shipped their Reface series of synthesizers um, with their SoundMondo web app as a way of doing editor librarian services. My new Novation Circuit Groovebox, you dump new samples on it by plugging it into the web. You don't have to install software. And the coolest thing, though, the absolute coolest thing that I've seen was last year, um, came from an artist. And let's go ahead and switch to the demo. So Mattion is a French EDM artist. He dropped an album about a year ago, a little over, and he put up this web audio-based remix board on his website. Let's make sure we have audio on here. All right. So. This basically let his fans, and I am one, by the way. I actually really like his album. Um, it lets his fans remix sounds from the tracks on his album. It's like a pre-laid out grid of stuff you can play. But the We Make Awesome guys that he worked with on this, um, they decided to take an extra step, and they hooked it up to this. Um, this is a Novation launch pad. It's one of the most common electronic music production tools. I own two of them. Um, and if you've heard of Ableton Live, this is kind of like a minimalist, preloaded version of this. And I can control this entire app from this device. Let's switch over to the camera. Let's see if I've got this lined up so you can see it. All right.
Okay. Ooh, left one on. So, <laughs> I really, <laughs> I really just always wanted to do that. So, go ahead and switch back to the slides. I could do that for hours, but I probably should move along. So my point here, though, is not just, hey, look at how awesome this is, or you know, whatever, because that, that I could say too. But my point here is that hardware device access unlocks some tremendous potential. Just like enabling accelerometer support really unlocks some amazing user experiences in mobile devices early on, that's true with other new hardware capabilities too. We want to continue to unlock those capabilities. So I want to dive into some more experimental features and bring up Francois to talk about Web Bluetooth. Thank you, Chris. By a show of hands, how many of you are familiar with Bluetooth low energy technology? Oh, OK, that's going to be fun. So I'm based in Paris, France, hence the accent. And I'm quite fortunate these days to work on a new web API that will allow a website to discover and interact with Bluetooth devices in JavaScript. But first, why Bluetooth? I mean, why Bluetooth? The word Bluetooth actually comes from the Danish king Harald Blatten, aka Harald Bluetooth. So I'm not going to lie here. We don't really know if he had Bluetooth or not, but what I can tell you is that at the end of the 10th century, they were not perfectly clean either. Oddly enough, in the Nordic runes, the H from Harald and the B from Blatten, once merged, consist in the official Bluetooth logo. Whatever. Bluetooth has grown a lot in 20 years, along its different version. The latest major one, the version 4, which is like six years old now, introduced a brand new technology called Bluetooth Low Energy, or BLE. So we are not talking about headset, mouse, or car, st car stereo system anymore. Unlike other technologies such as Wi-Fi and Internet, which have continuously broadcast, uh, increased the transfer rate over the version, BLE took a radically different approach here. They thought, let's try to design a technology that could e easily be integrated into thousands of devices that are not yet connected, and that cost almost nothing. It turns out that when you're trying to reduce the cost of manufacturing and maintenance of a device, you are looking directly to its energy consumption. Basically, if you want to create a device that consumes very little nowadays, you will probably use something like a CR2032 battery. OK, I'm sure I'm going to teach you something, Chris, today. Do you know what means 2032? No idea. 20 is actually the 20 millimeter diameter of a balance cell, while 32 is a 3.2 millimeter height. Just to give you a rough idea, the energy provided by this kind of battery allows your body to function for about 20 seconds. It's not that huge, huh? This explains the transfer rate, which are significantly lower in this new version of Bluetooth. Do not worry, though. It's not that bad. BLE is primarily targeted for connected objects for which the need for speed is low and the autonomy crucial. OK, demo time. Chris is currently holding in his hand a device, a BLE device, actually, called the Playable Candle. And this does exactly what you think it does. So can we switch to the computer? Yep. So I'm going to click on the Connect button here. The label candle is just here. I click on the Connect button, and now I can just change the color to red, blue, green, and <laughs> <laughs> and even set my favorite effect, the rainbow one. That's the rainbow. Yeah, it's OK. It's just a candle. <laughs> By the way, the Bluetooth Special Interest Group predicts that within two years, nearly 96% of all phones and tablets will have BLE. It's going to be everywhere. Can we go back to the slides? Now, before I show you how the Web Bluetooth API works, let's review together very briefly some basic concepts of how works Bluetooth. So there are two distinct roles in BLE, the central and the peripheral. The device known as central is the one that will search for nearby devices in order to initiate a dialogue. It can be your phone or your laptop. And the peripheral is the one that will continuously broadcast its presence to anyone who will listen. It can be a heart rate sensor, a beacon, or a fridge. Once connected, the peripheral will usually stop broadcasting its presence, 
And then the central can start to interact with the GAT server of the peripheral, which contains all the services exposed in the peripheral. There are Bluetooth standardized services, such as the battery service, the heart rate service, but you can, of course, create your own. Finally, each service contains one or several characteristics that have their own properties. You can read a value from a characteristic, like the battery level, or you can write a value to a characteristic and even be notified when a value changes. I will explain this later. So just in short, it's not that complicated. So how does that look like in JavaScript? My web application will play the central role, and the device I'm trying to connect to will be the peripheral. So first, I want to discover nearby Bluetooth devices. And for that, I will call device, which will show me a model picker in which I can pick a device from a list of Bluetooth devices. Keep in mind that this list is filtered with the filters key of the option object that is anything but optional. The goal here is to prevent the list to contain too many devices. In this example, for instance, I'm looking for a device that advertises a battery service. I did not mention it before, but when you broadcast your presence, you can also add some additional data. So uh, since the battery service is a Bluetooth standardized service, I can simply use the string battery underscore service. In short, once the user has selected a device and clicked the per button, you now have access to a Bluetooth device object that contains device name and the accessible services. There are two important things here to note. First, this function can only be called if the user interacts with the web page first. In this case, a click on a button is enough. Secondly, it only works on HTTPS secure pages. Do not worry, though, it works perfectly fine on localhost as you develop. What we want now is connect to the GAT server mentioned before. And for that, I will simply call device.gat.connect and get a GAT server instance when the peripheral is actually connected. And now let's read the battery level of a Bluetooth device. Once I get the battery level characteristic from the battery service, I can now call the read value method to get a data view JavaScript object which contains the remaining battery percentage of a device. Writing to a Bluetooth characteristic is as easy as reading it. This time, let's use the heart rate control point characteristic to reset the value of the energy expanded field to zero on a heart rate monitor device. What I'm doing here is calling write value with a byte of one. I promise there is no magic here. It's all explained in the official Bluetooth documentation. And now, to be notified when the heart rate measurement characteristic changes on the device, I only need to add the appropriate event listener to this characteristic and start notification. Then. Every time its value changes, the B function will be called with a new value. Demo time. Let me show you what I mean by notification. I'm currently wearing a BLE heart rate sensor, which measures my heart rate in real time. I'm usually between 60 and 80. But since you are all looking at me right now, I expect this to be a little bit higher. So can we switch, please? I will click on this little heart find my heart rate sensor, and connect. So let's see. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> now, to prove you that it's really mine, I will do some push-ups, and hopefully it will be higher. OK, let's try. It might go it's down. It's going to be hard, actually, because <laughs> OK. One, two, three, four. Is it going up? <laughs> it's not moving. I'm sorry. I can't do more. I'm just it me. It started a lot lower when oh. you were practicing this. Before. And the demo broke. See? <laughs> <laughs> OK. I'm not the only one having fun with Bluetooth devices. A colleague of mine, Liam, has plenty of Bluetooth toys at home for which he has created several web applications on his Chromebook. Enki Drive, for instance, is a racing game in which you control a car via Bluetooth. He also created a web application for a BLE printer. As soon as the famous BB-8 was out, he bought it and wrote a web application for that. Few weeks after that, another developer, Dan Jenkins, hacked Liam's demo to make the BB-8 uh, BB dance and change color to the Imperial March by using the WebAU APIs. More recently, he found a BLE-led device called Doddy at Fry's and couldn't reach it to hack it. Finally, he thought, let's insert a Bluetooth propeller into a stuffed grumpy hat. 
attach some balloon to it, make it fly, and control it from a web app. Because why not? If, like me, you like to understand how Bluetooth things work, I recommend you install their official Android apps and enable the developer option in the Android settings that allows you to capture all Bluetooth packets. From there, it is as simple as analyzing packets. Google and Opera are, as we speak, implementing this experimental web API in their respective browser. We are hopeful that other browser vendors will follow and eventually adopt this API when it goes through W3C. But the real question is, can you play with it today? And the answer is yes. It is available behind the experimental flag Web Bluetooth in Chrome OS, Chrome for Android Marshmallow, and Chrome for Linux. If you're on Lollipop, you can still have fun with Chromium build. And regarding Mac OS X and Windows support, we are working on it, like, really. So here are two things that will help you, hopefully. Get started with Web Bluetooth is a simple web app that will generate all the JavaScript boilerplate code to start interacting with a Bluetooth device. Enter a device name, service, a characteristic, define the properties, and you're good to go. If you're already a Bluetooth developer, then I suggest you give a try to the Web Bluetooth Developer Studio plugin. It will also generate the Web Bluetooth JavaScript code for your Bluetooth device. It is still early days, but I think you're going to like it. OK, so here we are. Website can now control Bluetooth devices just like native apps. Bravo. <laughs> OK, calm down. There is a big difference here. A web application, I can share it with a simple link that anyone can open in a browser. It may sound stupid slash obvious, what I just said, but this is the power of the web. Today, to interact with a Bluetooth device for the first time, here's what I have to do. Go to a store, accept the terms and conditions, authenticate myself, search for the app, install it, accept the permission, launch it, scan for nearby devices, and only then I can start to interact with the device. Wouldn't it be great if I could just keep the last step? That's exactly one mission of the open source project called the physical web. Make interacting with smart devices as simple and fast as possible. OK, so how does it work for real? I will be brief here as the physical web session already happened this morning. But again, this is very simple. Each Bluetooth device will continuously broadcast, in addition to its presence, a URL. So now, as long as Bluetooth is enabled on your phone, you will get to see in your notification bar some URLs filtered by your web service, which are broadcasted by nearby Bluetooth devices. Think about a bus that can tell you it's next stop, a parking meter that lets you pay with just your phone in the cloud, or even just a dark color broadcasting its owner contact information. It is already available to all of you on Chrome for iOS and Chrome for Android. So now let's step back a little bit and think about the integration with the Web Bluetooth API. Imagine if the website broadcasted by the Bluetooth device would allow me to interact directly with it from my phone. At no time, I'd have to install an application from a store. A simple click on this physical web notification would be enough for me to get to interact with the device. This is the power of the physical web. The Web Bluetooth is about to implement this feature with an upcoming object called Referring Device. This will allow you to access directly in JavaScript to the Bluetooth device that broadcasted the URL when user clicked on the physical web notification. So let's wrap up. I realize this might sound overwhelming, so I recommend you simply Google Web Bluetooth samples at the end of the day. We'll find all samples, articles, specifications, and demos. And we even have two code labs you can follow in the code lab area. One will take you through all the steps to create a web app to control the playable candle, and another one to learn more about the Polymer elements dedicated to web Bluetooth. And with that, I will give it back to Chris. Thank you, Francois. <laughs> so we are pretty much out of time. One final hardware API I want to mention that we're exploring is Web USB. Now, don't let the title scare you. The idea is not to let the web get access to every USB device in your computer or device. That would be a little crazy. Um, web USB is about enabling specific new devices that have their firmware available to be accessed by the web, that actually say, I want to be accessed by this domain. So this is really more about enabling a new class of devices than enabling current devices to get accessed by the web. 
I want to wrap up. Um, there is tons more going on on the web that we couldn't cover here. Web VR is awesome. Presentation API, motion paths and CSS, so much good stuff. There's even stuff that we haven't really even totally started designing yet. Persistent storage, uh, web intents to let web apps actually handle uh, other data and do something interesting with it. But we are out of time. I hope you're as excited as we are about the future of the web platform. Uh, watch developers.google.com slash web for more. And I'm going to personally be running over to Rahul's presentation in the amphitheater right now and hang out there for a while. But we do have mobile office hours uh, this afternoon from 5 to 6. And I think Francois and I will both be there if you have any questions. Thank you. already have it or the appropriate app store for their device if they don't. Once they're done installing your app, Firebase Invites can then send the referral code to your app through a deep link. And you can send your new customer the discount that they so richly deserve. And yes, this really does work even if that friend had to install the app first. Traditionally, deep links tend to get lost during app installs, but Invites uses Firebase Dynamic Links, which are able to survive the app store installation process. As an added bonus, many developers have found that not only are these kind of invites more successful at driving installs, but that users who join through this kind of personalized onboarding flow are more likely to come back to your app in the future. And Firebase Invites isn't just for referral codes. You can use it to share any content you want from your app. Have a recipe app? Firebase Invites can make sure that killer lemon meringue pie recipe gets the visibility that it deserves. And because Invites is a Firebase product, it works with Firebase Analytics to let you know when a user has opened or installed an app through an invite. So be sure to check out the documentation and give Firebase Invites a try. We can't wait to see what you build. Last episode, we used a decision tree as our classifier. Today, we'll add code to visualize it so we can see how it works under the hood. There are many types of classifiers you may have heard of before, things like neural nets or support vector machines. So why did we use a decision tree to start? Well, they have a very unique property. They're easy to read and understand. In fact, they're one of the few models that are interpretable, where you can understand exactly why the classifier makes a decision. That's amazingly useful in practice. To get started, I'll introduce you to a real data set we'll work with today. It's called IRIS. IRIS is a classic machine learning problem. In it, you want to identify what type of flower you have based on different measurements, like the length and width of the petal. The data set includes three different types of flowers. They're all species of iris, Setosa, Versicolor, and Virginica. Scrolling down, you can see we're given 50 examples of each type, so 150 examples total. Notice there are four features that are used to describe each example. These are the length and width of the sepal and petal. And just like in our apples and oranges problem, the first four columns give the features and the last column gives the labels, which is the type of flower in each row. Our goal is to use this data set to train a classifier. Then we can use that classifier to predict what species of flower we have if we're given a new flower that we've never seen before. Knowing how to work with an existing data set is a good skill, so let's import Iris into Scikit-Learn and see what it looks like in code. Conveniently, the friendly folks at Scikit provided a bunch of sample data sets, including Iris, as well as utilities to make them easy to import. We can import Iris into our code like this. The data set includes both the table from Wikipedia as well as some metadata. The metadata tells you the names of the features and the names of different types of flowers. The features and examples themselves are contained in the data variable. For example, if I print out the first entry, you can see the measurements for this flower. These index to the feature names, so the first value refers to the sepal length and the second to sepal width, and so on. The target variable contains the labels. Likewise, these index to the target names. Let's print out the first one. A label of zero means it's a setosa. If you look at the table from Wikipedia, you'll notice that we just printed out the first row. Now, both the data and target variables have 150 entries. If you want, you can iterate over them to print out the entire data set like this. Now that we know how to work with the data set, we're ready to train a classifier. But before we do that, first we need to split up the data. I'm going to remove several of the examples and put them aside for later. We'll call the examples I'm putting aside our testing data. We'll keep these separate from our training data. And later on, we'll use our testing examples to test how accurate the classifier is on data it's never seen before. 
Testing is actually a really important part of doing machine learning well in practice, and we'll cover it in more detail in a future episode. Just for this exercise, I'll remove one example of each type of flower. And as it happens, the data set is ordered so the first setosa is at index 0, and the first versicolor is at 50, and so on. The syntax looks a little bit complicated, but all I'm doing is removing three entries from the data and target variables. Then I'll create two new sets of variables, one for training and one for testing. Training will have the majority of our data, and testing will have just the examples I removed. Now just as before, we can create a decision tree classifier and train it on our training data. Before we visualize it, let's use the tree to classify our testing data. We know we have one flower of each type, and we can print out the labels we expect. Now let's see what the tree predicts. We'll give it the features for our testing data, and we'll get back labels. You can see the predicted labels match our testing data. That means it got them all right. Now keep in mind this was a very simple test, and we'll go into more detail down the road. Now let's visualize the tree so we can see how the classifier works. To do that, I'm going to copy-paste some code in from Scikit's tutorials. And because this code is for visualization and not machine learning concepts, I won't cover the details here. Note that I'm combining the code from these two examples to create an easy-to-read PDF. I can run our script and open up the PDF, and we can see the tree. To use it to classify data, you start by reading from the top. Each node asks a yes or no question about one of the features. For example, this node asks if the petal width is less than 0.8 centimeters. If it's true for the example you're classifying, go left. Otherwise, go right. Now let's use this tree to classify an example from our testing data. Here are the features and label for our first testing flower. Remember, you can find the feature names by looking at the metadata. We know this flower is a setosa, so let's see what the tree predicts. I'll resize the windows to make this easier to see. And the first question the tree asks is whether the petal width is less than 0.8 centimeters. That's the fourth feature. The answer is true, so we proceed left. At this point, we're already at a leaf node. There are no other questions to ask, so the tree gives us a prediction, setosa, and it's right. Notice the label is zero, which indexes to that type of flower. Now let's try our second testing example. This one is a versicolor. Let's see what the tree predicts. Again, we read from the top, and this time the petal width is greater than 0.8 centimeters. The answer to the tree's question is false, so we go right. The next question the tree asks is whether the petal width is less than 1.75. It's trying to narrow it down. That's true, so we go left. Now it asks if the petal length is less than 4.95. That's true, so we go left again. And finally, the tree asks if the petal width is less than 1.65. That's true, so left it is. And now we have our prediction. It's a versicolor, and that's right again. You can try the last one on your own as an exercise, and remember the way we're using the tree is the same way it works in code. So that's how you quickly visualize and read a decision tree. There's a lot more to learn here, especially how they're built automatically from examples. We'll get to that in a future episode, but for now let's close with an essential point. Every question the tree asks must be about one of your features. That means the better your features are, the better a tree you can build. And in the next episode, we'll start looking at what makes a good feature. Thanks very much for watching, and I'll see you next time. So constraints. They're a great way for you as a developer to deal with the ever-expanding number of screen sizes, device rotations, and new form factors like slide over in the iOS world. But one unfortunate casualty in this brave new world of alignment has been the way we animate views. See, it used to be we could go around setting a UI view's position or frame with a fun little UI view animate with duration method and watch our view scoot around the screen. Well, that was fun. Uh, but that's harder to do in a world full of constraints. Constraints don't necessarily play nicely with a view whose frame you're setting explicitly, as you can see here. Well, that leads us to this episode's quick tip sent in by Jacob Cho, a fan of Route 85 and a software engineer at Ensemble, a mobile app developer located in beautiful Vancouver, British Columbia. Jacob notes that many iOS developers forget that in addition to the old way of animating a view's position, you can also animate constraints in iOS. Let's look at how you might do that. Here's my storyboard, and as you can see here, I've got everything set up nicely using constraints. 
Now to move my UI image view on and off screen, I'm going to want to change this constraint here, the one that sets my image's leading edge to the leading edge of my super view. Right now it's set to minus 180, so it's off screen. So first I'm going to control drag from this constraint into my view controller to make it an IV outlet of type NS layout constraint. This allows me to access it in my code. Now I can adjust it with a standard UI view animate with duration call. In this case, I'll change the constant of the constraint from minus 180 to zero so that it appears on screen, and now we can give it a try. Huh, well that's weird. The, the constant definitely changed, but what happened to my animation? Well, it turns out to get this constant to animate nicely, I need to call layout if needed on my view controller's view within this animation block. We'll give it one more try and, oh, that's much better. I now have a constraint that I can change within an animation block and everything animates smoothly to its final position, except in cases where I want to adjust something besides my constraints constant. Let's take a look at another example. Here I want to adjust this center square to expand or shrink to be either twice or half the width of its neighbors. Now I could do that in theory by adjusting the multiplier on the center views width constraint, but it turns out that changing that multiplier in code doesn't work. See, constraint multipliers are a get only property and Xcode will give me an error. So how do I change it? Well, the answer is I don't. Instead, I, can cre I create two completely different constraints and enable or disable either one as necessary. As long as I'm still calling layout if needed in my animation block, this kind of change will still animate. Now there are two ways I can accomplish this constraint swapping. One way is to create both constraints in Interface Builder, like so. Now Xcode will complain that these are incompatible, and it's right. So first step, we'll uninstall one of them by checking this box here. Next, we'll control drag both of these constraints into our code to make them IV outlets. And then I can enable or disable these as necessary in my animation block, like this. Once again, you'll notice I make sure we're calling layout if needed in our animation block, and we end up with a nice smooth looking animation. Look at that. The other way to accomplish this would be to create a completely new constraint in code. This is useful when I don't know in advance what I'm going to want this multiplier to be, and I need to create it dynamically. So let's see that in action. This time in my animation block, I'll first remove the old constraint. Next up, I can create a new multiplier. Let's make it slightly random just for fun. Ooh, hey, that is fun. Okay, next I'll create a brand new constraint with this new multiplier and assign it to my center view width property. And then I can add it back in again to my view. Finally, I call layout if needed on the super view in the animation block, and I once again have some nicely animating views that use this new constraint that I've created. And because this is all done using constraints, you'll notice this works as intended on an iPhone, an iPhone in landscape mode, or even, say, a slide overview on an iPad. And once you understand that this trick simply involves removing an old constraint and adding a new one, you might discover a whole new world of animation is available to you simply by turning on and off various constraints. For example, on this screen, I can change all my views to be either left aligned or right aligned, simply by adding and removing two different groups of constraints and then calling our now familiar layout if needed method. Pretty neat, huh? Oh, by the way, one fun little quirk about all this, if you add your new constraints before you remove the old ones, iOS will complain about all the incompatible constraints it has to deal with in those like few milliseconds. So always make sure you remove the old ones first before adding the new ones. So thanks to Jacob for the quick tip. Jacob, you're going to get a very stylish Google t-shirt in the mail. But hang on, we're not done yet. You see, now that you know all about constraint animation, I have a couple more quick tips from one of Google's engineers about more efficient ways to implement it. So follow me on to the next video, because we're not done learning just yet. Click here. Click here. And uh, otherwise, I'll see you on Route 85. Bye. People love to use different mobile devices in different ways that suit their situation and lifestyle. Michael uses a phone.
Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Expert's Guide to Android Development Tools. I'm Tor Norby, uh, tech lead for Android Studio. And with me on stage here, I have a number of key members from the Android Studio team. So do you want to introduce yourselves? Hello, I'm Esteban. Hi, I'm Shiva. I work on the debugger. Hi, I'm Catherine. And hi, I'm Jerome, and I work on the build system. So the way this is going to work is that we're going to show you some of our favorite features and some features that we think you may not know, but that you'll find very useful once you do. Uh, if you're an expert Studio user, you might know some of these things. Uh, we we want to make sure that everyone has heard some of these secrets, even if you already know it. You can be very proud if you do. Um, so we hope that you'll learn something from this. And so first, we'll have an editor demo from Esteban. And then Shiva is going to be showing the debugger, Catherine, native tools, and Jerome at the end with the build system. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Esteban, who's going to be showing the source editor. Hello, everyone. Uh, we're going to switch to the demo machine now. Right. Can you guys see? Yeah, that's good. So in the next 10 minutes or so, I'm going to show you 10 of my favorite features of the editor. You know, you know how coding all day is, right? You, one of the things you try to avoid is touching the mouse, which is like 10 miles away from where you are, right? And learning all the shortcuts. So IntelliJ has several configurations of shortcuts. Uh, I will have, while I go through the demo, all the shortcuts written down there. But um, there's one tip. If you're on, if you're on multi platform, there are, there are two different shortcut setups for Mac. One that is uh, Mac friendly, and the other one that is compatible with other platforms. So if, I, if you hear me speaking a shortcut out loud, I'm probably going to be using the one that is common across all the platforms. So let's begin. Bef just before we, we do the editor part, there are two tips that I want to show you uh, for configuring the, the general IDE. The, the first one is the command line launcher. So I don't know if you guys know, but you can go and say create command line launcher. And that will create this file that you can call from anywhere to start Studio. That's cool. It's handy. You know, you're in a console, and you want to start Studio, you just type Studio. That's uh, pretty neat. But it does more things than that. So I just created that. I need to put in the password. And done. I'm going to go to a console. Uh, can you guys see? Yeah. If I do Studio, dash dash help, that's the shortcut that I just created. But you can see that there are more options than just Studio. There is diff, and there is merge. Uh, I'm going to have a diff that I ran before. This actually opens. Studios diff. Uh, where is it? It's gone. This is one of the best diffing tools that I've used. And it's really cool to be able to have it as a command line tool. You can set it up to uh, your Git tool or whatever, and then, then you'll be using this that you'll be uh, hopefully familiar with. And you can use this all the time. You can also uh, do merge from the command line too, uh, and it works. So that's one handy thing to have. The next one I want to show you is. You know, you have a large project, and effectively, you run out of memory in Studio, and things go bad, right? So if you wanted to edit the memory settings, you need to go to a VM options file, right? Uh, how many of you have been to the VM options file and changed the memory? OK, that's a lot of people. Uh, the main thing is, like, where was that file? You know, you go to like settings, slash, whatever. So there is an option here that was recently added that you can say, edit custom VM options. Uh, you guys know that you should not edit the VM options inside, uh, inside the Studio installation, right? The next time you update, it's going to say, oh, what did you do? So you do this one, and it asks, do you want to create a custom one? And it opens it up for you, and you can go and set all the flags you want there. If you want to know where it is, someone was super excited about this. <laughs> if you want to know where it is, the, you can press Alt F1, and it's, you can reveal this file somewhere else. For example, you can reveal it in Finder. Just pressing 8 or going down there will open the Finder to where this file is, and you can uh, do whatever you want. Right, that's for VM options. So I have everything set up now. And now we're going to go into the editing uh, tips. These are my 10 favorite tips of editing in Android Studio, powered by IntelliJ. The first one is Control Gist J, right? You guys know there are shortcuts to join lines. Well, this one is smart one. And if you are joining strings, it actually removes the operations and gives you the full string. I think you lost the, uh, you lost the ID. The ID. <laughs> That's me. <laughs> <laughs> can we go back to the demo machine? 
Try pushing the button. Hey. Let's do it again. I was saying, talking about, I'm looking at my screen. I hear it look beautiful. Uh, Control Shift J is a smart join, and it removes the plus operations when joining a string. So that's pretty handy. There is also the option of, and this is, this is quite powerful, if you open the intent menu on a string, a string operation with plus, there is the option to copy the concatenation text to the clipboard. So IntelliJ figured out that all the components here uh, are static, or they know the values. And the full string has been now copied to the clipboard. And I can paste it here, and it's the full thing. Uh, operations have been done. Thank you. <laughs> the next one I want to show is the difference between enter and tab. When you, when you want to change a function, in this case, uh, let's say we want to compare two strings, and I'm calling the function contains, but it should be equals, right? So I, I type e, this suggests equals, and I type enter, this happens. Could we switch back to the but you guys know that if you type tab instead of enter, there you go. It's good over there. That's a pretty handy one to know, because it's usually no backspace, backspace, like what did it? The next one I wanted to show you is the powerful of the context understanding that the, the IntelliJ editor has. If you are inside a, this is a common pattern, right? You have an object, you say, is this object an instance of something? If you are inside this if, things happen, right? So if I do O dot, the suggestions I get there are not for object, are for context. So the editor figured that out and was able to give me all those suggestions. And as soon as I choose one, the casting is done for me. More than that, if you are going to use context many times or O many times, open the intent menu, and it's suggesting to, to generate the declaration for you. Done. It actually put the name of the variable right on everything. Pretty handy, right? This, this, these tips are for you guys to speed up coding. You're if, I'll, I'll enter, go, 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 right? So that's intents inside an instance of. One of my favorite features is multi-cursor support. And uh, I'm going to show you what, what I do with multi-cursors and what, how you can integrate other features of IntelliJ when you have multi-cursors. So I have a list of names here that I'm going to copy and paste inside this function. And I want to I log all of them. I want to just add a log D to all of them. You know there is a completion, a template uh, for log D, right? So you can, you can select one and start spawning cursors on the next occurrence of the same word. If there is one that is repeated, you can use a shortcut to skip it, and you keep going. And now I have all these cursors that I can do many things at the same time. Thanks. Uh, one thing I can, for example, say log D. It suggests log D. I can use the template, and it puts it in all the cursors at the same time. Uh, you can use selection per word. Start removing things like this, for example. I'm going to copy. When I copy here, it actually has one clipboard per cursor. So when I copy and I go to the end, for example, and I want to, let's say this is an email that I want to complete, I do add uh, gmail.com. You can see all the clipboards were different, and in each line I pasted a different thing. So I'm like uh, coding at 10 times what I would be coding if it was one line. Uh, another cool thing that you can do with cursors is I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go back to these words. I'm going to select all the names. And you can use Command Shift A is a super powerful shortcut. If you, if you want to take one shortcut away from today, take Command Shift A. That shows you you can choose any action there and apply it where you are. So I'm going to use the toll case. Done. All the selections have been changed. And I'm logging all the names pretty quickly. Cool. The next one is navigation. Um, pretty useful. Command F12. It shows you all the functions in your, in, in your file. One thing that IntelliJ does that is super powerful is on every menu, even if you don't see that there is a search box, there probably is one. Just start typing, and things happen like this, right? So if you want to go to a function, Command F12, and type a few letters of it, boom, you're gone. There's a shortcut to go back to. Uh, to where you were, navigation shortcuts. 
There is another cool thing that are bookmarks. I, I use some of these uh, very often. You can bookmark a line, but this is uh, not the, the, the powerful thing, in my, in my opinion, is this one. You can bookmark with Control shift a number, and you can give functions in different files a number. And then by just pressing Control and the number, you navigate there uh, super fast. So this is quite handy. If you run out of numbers and you want to uh, use letters, you can. I've never got that many, but you could use uh, Control F F11 on Windows, and it opens this menu. You can choose A, for example, and there you go. You bookmark with an A. And to find them, there is this menu that shows you all the ones that you have uh, added, and you can press A, and it takes you there. So that's bookmarks. And this one is pretty cool. You guys know that you can extract a method in IntelliJ, right? So I'm going to go, this is for loop that I have there that I would like to be in a separate method. So I go to the middle of it, and I use the expression selection tool that it selects an expression going up and up, right? So here I have the line. Now I have the block. Now I have the if. Now I have the for loop. You know, you can go up and down depending on the configuration you have. And I selected the for loop. And now I'm going to extract it to a method. Let's call method test. What happened? So the font there is too small, but it pretty much says, hey, stop doing cut and paste and write the things properly, because IntelliJ just detected another instance of what I had in a different place. So it said, you had the same method. Do you also want to extract it? It's not using the same variables, but it figures out that if the arguments are the free variables, it's going to extract it. And both for loops are gone, and only one test method. That's the one I like the most. And you, you, you clapped on the tab versus center. This is, this is weird. Postfix. So you know you can do, if you have an array or, or something you can iterate over, you can do uh, post completion and say, for example, 4. And this generates a 4 for you. You can also do for i. And this generates the very familiar for loop that you guys know. And you can also do. Uh, for R, and it does the annoying reverse one for you, too. There, is, there are so many of these. Uh, just play around with them. For example, if you want an object uh, to check whether an object is null, you can, you can just post complete an N, and it'll do it for you, and many others like this. If you want to know them, just press Command-J. and No, I, well, I didn't press Command-J. And it offers a list of all the completions that you could use on an object. And you can write your own as well. Uh, number eight that is pretty useful is when you have a condition that is complicated, you have a lot of booleans, and, and uh, you want to simplify it, just check out what the in, in, intent menu has, because it will have things that will probably help you. So let's say I want to replace ors with ands, and this is the result. Or I want to, I don't know, split, split into two ifs, or revert the condition. Uh, you know, the, the, the cool thing about this is that you're not thinking. It just, you know, it just changes, and you know for sure that it's going to be the same uh, behavior that you had before. So there you go, a different way of writing the same function. Um, control space versus control shift space. This is um, a smart completion. So if you do control space here, you know that it offers you all the expressions that you could do there. Not, not all, but you know, a, a, a few chunk of them. And it, has, it chooses the one that are type correct at the top. But if you do control shift space, it gives you only the ones that have the correct type. And you can see that it's not showing the, before it was showing the same function as itself. But now it figures out that if you do that, you're going to probably recurse infin infinitely. So it's no longer showing you that. More than that, if I command this function here, that is the only other expression that it could use, uh, and I do control shift space, there you go. It just shows the only one thing that it could do, and it put it there. So pretty handy. And the last feature that I want to show you, this has saved me so many times. You know when you say, I'm not going to commit now. I'm sure this is fine. And then you screw up. Local history to the rescue. Uh, Command Shift A, local history. And you have IntelliJ has done a diff every time you were editing your file. And you have the history across your day. And you go back to the point and say, oh, this is, this is where I screwed up. Uh, and you can see here that it's showing a diff of everything I did during the demo. Two minutes ago, I was doing this. You can see the joins. 
this is super, super useful. So I hope you guys uh, enjoy this, my favorite 10 tips. And uh, Shiva is going to uh, show you debugger cool features. Thank you. Thank you, Esteban. Uh, that was a number of cool features. But if you're like me, you now have really clean looking code that doesn't work. So now you enter the debugger. Uh, so let's spend the next 10 minutes looking at some features in the debugger that might uh, help save the day. The first thing I wanted, and I wanted to talk about are uh, actually three different things. One is how do you attach your debugger to a process, and then about how do you actually uh, set breakpoints in slightly more interesting ways so that you can narrow down the area that you want to debug? And finally, once you're stopped, how do you examine uh, the state of your program? First, let's start with uh, connecting the debugger. Most, uh, the most often used is you would just launch the debugger through uh, Shift F9 debug app. What this does is it uh, does a bunch of steps that you specified in your run configuration. This has a number of cool features. You know, you can specify what APK to install, uh, and more importantly, what to launch. So you would normally launch the default activity, but you can launch a custom activity if you have activity aliases or some other activity that you would want to launch. Or you could also launch a URL. But what happens if you don't want to launch something, you don't want to install, you don't want to build, but you just want to connect? Uh, let's say someone brings you a device where uh, your program is stuck in a bad state. So in this particular case, I have a program, and uh, it's running over here, and I just want to directly connect to it. The uh, key is just saying attach debugger to Android process. This uh, is also present in the toolbar. Uh, you, when you select this, it shows you the processes that are running on your connected device. Uh, and as soon as you say OK, you select the process, then it immediately attaches the debugger to that process. Uh, so this allows you to uh, examine programs when they are in a messed up state. So this is good when your program has been running for a while. But what do you do if, uh, for instance, you want to debug either a second process in your multiprocess app, or you want to debug something that is, uh, you know, the, you want to attach the debugger as soon as the process starts. So Android has a nice API called debug.waitfordebugger. So what this does is that as soon as your program starts, uh, if it's not launched through the IDE itself, and when it encounters this API, it will just pause your program at this location so that you can then uh, connect to it. So in this particular case, uh, I'm going to launch this broadcast receiver. It obviously doesn't have to be this. It can be uh, anything. Uh, you go, so I go to the shell, and then I launch this. Uh, and now you see that the uh, active, whatever you launch is actually waiting because it's waiting for the debugger to connect. At this point, you can again attach the debugger, and now you see the second process. And this will come and, and pause right at that, uh, the next statement. So this is really cool when you have something uh, that you want to debug really early in your code. So that is how you uh, attach to processes. Now let's look at uh, thank you. Now let's look at a few things about how do you set breakpoints uh, in slightly more interesting ways. Let's um, go back here and let's run our app. And so I have I have a breakpoint set up. It's I mean the application you saw was a pretty simple uh, recycler view, and uh, if this breakpoint is set in the bind view holder, it's going to stop every single time. So you can keep um, continuing. But this gets super annoying really soon. So what you, the first thing that you probably want to learn is uh, there is an option called mute breakpoints, which will disable breakpoints throughout your program, all the, all the breakpoints that you set. So this allows your app to continue running without the breakpoints. And then once you have uh, your program in a certain state where you actually want the breakpoints enabled, you can enable it back again. Uh, that is like a hammer. It just disables all the breakpoints. If you want to be a little bit more, uh, if you want to have a little more control, then you start with uh, looking at conditional breakpoints. Uh, what I want you guys to think of is that breakpoints are not purely static. You, you get some control over when they are hit and what do you do when they are hit. That, that if you get that part, then you can just go through the list and figure out all the different options around breakpoints. Uh, the first one, let's say, is uh, I want to set a I want to say that I want to uh, I want to break on this position on this location only on let's say the let's say the tenth item. Uh, I'm not sure if that showed up properly, but uh, I basically said position equals ten as a condition there, and this means that 
this breakpoint will not be hit until this value, this variable position has a value of 5. And so all of 10. So now I go here and I scroll, and now it hits the breakpoint only when uh, position is actually 10. Uh, that's the conditional breakpoint. Now, there are actually a number of conditions that you can set. Uh, let's go here. And uh, over here, you see setting a condition is one. Another option that is really cool is instead of setting a condition, you can actually uh, evaluate an expression. And if you turn off suspend, then this breakpoint acts pretty much like every time the breakpoint is hit, we will just log this expression over here. Let's say I want to log an expression that says uh, position as and I do this. So now I go to the console. Um, the new feature in 2.3 already is that logcat gets streamed directly into your uh, debug console. So you see the logcat over here. And then we just added a breakpoint uh, at the end, which basically said every time it hits the breakpoint, it will log an expression. So when I uh, scroll over here, you will see that it keeps uh, logging. Whenever it hits the breakpoint, it will keep logging uh, whatever expression that you have given. So this is extremely useful because you don't have to, like if you just want to log something, then you don't have to do a whole rebuild and uh, deploy again. Uh, the next. Thank you. I just want to point out a few other uh, conditional um, options that are there in breakpoints, which is uh, there is one cool feature where you can say that I don't want this breakpoint, I don't want the program to pause at this breakpoint until a different breakpoint was hit. So if you specify this, then the program will pause at this breakpoint only after the subsequent breakpoint was hit. And you have even more controls. You know, there are instance filters, so you can say you only want to stop if it's a, for a certain uh, object, a certain class. Wow. So now let's go over from here. So now let's look at uh, another really cool feature that the debugger provides. So I have this. Uh... OK, so this is the data which is displayed by the recycler view. And I have a whole bunch of objects. What happens if you want to track one particular object throughout uh, the life cycle of your program? Let me go. So what I can do is, let's say I want to track what is going on with the eighth object in my list. I can attach a name to it. And this is what you do by marking that object. And so I say this is day eight. And what that immediately does is that it, uh, this is equivalent of you creating a variable in the debugger and saying that this variable points this, to this particular object. And any time in your program, as long as that object is visible, you will see it annotated with this particular name. And this is really cool because many times you want to track uh, one particular object. I usually end up used to end up writing it on a piece of paper, the object reference, then you would track it. Uh, but instead, you just have to mark the object. And then once this is done, uh, let's say you go somewhere else in your program. And over here, you can actually see, um, firstly, you can see that it is the same object. So in the case that it is a singleton, for instance, and you have properly marked it, you would, not, you would always see it annotated with this. Uh, not only that, you can actually use this as a conditional over here. So here I can say forecast or equals. Uh, day A. So this is the variable name I gave. And uh, if you, uh, the uh, IntelliJ convention is that you add underscore debug label as a suffix. And that variable is just available to you. So now if you do this, then uh, we will stop at this breakpoint only on the whenever the forecast matches the day we mark. So this is really cool when you want to track specific objects over the course of your program. Now I want to get into uh, evaluating expressions a little bit. So let's go over here. And I have uh, so I have this expression. Uh, and what this says is that if the current time, if it was more than a day since the last sync, only then show a notification. 
Uh, but it so happens that I actually want to debug. So if I uh, continue from here, if I step through from here, then I go into the if case. And I, but what I really want to debug, let's say, is the else case. So now what do you do? Uh, let's go back to the breakpoint again. The easiest thing to do first is you evaluate this expression. So now you see that current, so the result is true. So you're going to take the if case. But what I really want to do is figure out why the if case was true. So now I can see the last thing time. This is the timestamp in milliseconds, but it's pretty hard to see what exactly that means. Uh, so what you can do is you can say that I want to view this as a uh, timestamp. Now when you do that, it actually renders it as a timestamp. Thank you. And that's pretty cool, because now you see that the last sync was at uh, noon. And so obviously the if condition will always be true. Uh, now comes the next part. You actually want to force it. Uh, so what you do is you set the value to 0, and you close. And then you can evaluate the expression again. Now the result is false. And that's because we were basically just able to, from the debugger, set the value of an object. And you can do this actually for any, any field that you want. Uh, so now if you close and step, you can now get the else case without actually tweaking your program. You just change the value in the debugger. Uh, the last couple of things, so actually let me show one more thing here, is smart step. So normally when you, st when you have code like this, which is either uh, methods which are, oh, sorry. So I have a method like this. Then typically what, and if I want to step into one of these methods, what, I, what used to happen is that you would actually have to step into each one, and then you get out of it, and then you go back into it. So instead, there is an option called smart step, which will tell you exactly which particular method you want to step into. Uh, and this is really useful whenever you have methods, uh, uh, you know, functions being passed in. So, so the, you have a multiple parameters which take function values. And then you can select which particular method you want to step into. Uh, now let's look at a little bit about the view over here. Uh, in this stack frame view, everything that is colored yellow is actually coming from sources that are not in your project. Uh, one tip to know is that earlier, uh, so if I select this, we would take you to the platform sources. But the platform sources always corresponded to your target API level, not corresponding to the device that you're actually running on. In, uh, finally, in 2.2, in, uh, we have fixed it so that we now show you the sources corresponding to the, pla corresponding to the device. The only thing you have to do is make sure that that particular source is actually installed. Uh, we don't have a UI that comes up and say, says that you know, if you install this, it will properly show you the source. So just as long as you have the sources installed, it will pick up the correct sources. Uh, thank you. Finally, I want to say a couple of things about Instant Run. Uh, one really cool thing about Instant Run is that if you are debugging uh, and Instant Run is enabled, you can actually restart an activity from here. And that would immediately, uh, if I had launched it in Instant Run mode, it would pretty much restart the activity. You don't have to go kill it. You don't have to go to the device. Uh, and one other tip when you're using Instant Run is that you have to manually stop your instant uh, use the stop button to terminate the application before running again if you want to launch to a different device. This is just a little bit of it. Because Instant Run is new, many people get confused about that. Uh, that's what I had. Uh, hope you found it useful. Next up is Catherine, who will talk about C, C++. Hi, awesome. Thank you, Shiva. Uh, right, so C and C++. I'm going to cover a little bit of edit and a little bit of debug. So on the edit front, one, if anyone's ever edited many JNI methods, it's really, really easy when you author it in the C or C++ side to get some name mismatch, and then you get some runtime error. Um, we've actually got functionality in Studio, though, where you can completely avoid this problem, because when you start creating a new method, let's just make a clone of our string to JNI here. 
You can auto-complete it from the studio side. I don't know, where's my button? <clears throat> and it creates the whole stub in C++, so you don't have to worry at all about you know, whether you've actually gotten the right Java class path here. Um, once you start editing, there's a C++ tool called Doxygen, where it gives you Java-style autodocs. So let's say we want to create some sample function. Oops. Going to add the method. Or not. Eh, whatever. Um, so as I create this, I can put whatever I want in there. And then you can look up the whole list, but a couple of good ones are um, like brief is the heading. This is what I do. You can say author pram. And then when you go down and hit F1, I should, if I have spelled this correctly. Oh, sorry? Capital S. Small S. Oh, simple. Oh, gosh. <laughs> um, so once I actually get my letters correct, you can see all of my docs. Um, return is another super handy one. Your stuff right. <laughs> um, and yeah, it's a good way to get Java style, keep track of things. You don't have to tab back and forth all the time. Um, once you're done editing, we've added a bunch of functionality to the debugger for C++. So I think in the earlier talk, Tor mentioned the auto debugger. And I'm just going to start this. Um, if you ever start the debugger hoping to catch C++ code and you're like, why is it not catching any of my native breakpoints, the first thing you should always look at is, under your app configuration, do you have the set to Java? Um, if it's set to Java, you're going to be pretty sad. But when it's set to auto, native, or hybrid, well, if it's set to uh, native, you're not going to catch in the Java breakpoints. But I can step into my Java breakpoint. And then I can actually um, set a little known feature called a memory watch point. So I can right click on this and say add watch point. And this actually adds hardware support where whenever I touch this memory address, it's going to stop the debugger. So let's set this to any, because I'm going to be reading from it. And you can see I don't have any breakpoints set down here. Uh, just one at the very end. I start running. And since we're actually accessing the memory where I set the breakpoint, the CPU is going to stop and let us look at it with the debugger. So if you're ever trying to figure out what's going on with some crazy chunk of memory, this is a really handy way to do it. Um, it's officially supported on x86 and the Nexus 9. The emulator, though, is a good way to get an x86 debugger environment. Um, so once we've done that, let's take that away. And the other thing we've added to the debugger for C++ is STL support. So you can see up here, I've created a vector, and I've added a bunch of pairs to it. I can actually start expanding. It's fully aware of the STL. You can have some crazy map in here, and it should still render. Um, and you can interact with the STL when you're evaluating your Functions. So I can say like vec dot out of size. And voila. Um, similarly, you should be able to edit memory, see the results. So I think that's the debugger stuff we've added. Um, let's see if I can get us back on time. Oh, and then the other thing I should have mentioned under edit if you're used to using C11, you may have noticed that the NDK and experimental gradle do not default to it. So you're like, you know, auto variable error. Uh, a handy way to fix that is you can actually turn it on. So if you're using the experimental Gradle plugin and you want to use C++11, just add this to your NDK stanza, and you will have access to all of the handy 11 language features. And then a final tip for C++ is if you ever have a JNI error on a debug build in Studio on an emulator, you may notice that you get this expanded stack trace. So I have an app here that is actually probably not very social. Um, it's got this handy button for crash JNI. And if we hit this, uh, let's just keep going. If we hit this, it actually makes an invalid JNI call. So we can't call find class for something that's not a class. And we'll get this huge stack trace. Um, I know some folks have come saying, I'm getting all of these SIG aborts for my production build. What's happening? One thing to consider is that these stack traces actually only occur on debug builds from Studio by default and on the emulator. 
If you're using a real device with a production build, all you'll see is the abort. And there's a handy way to fix that, which is you can connect to a device with ADB and set check JNI to be one. And this will enable JNI checking, even if it's a production build, even if it's a physical device. So you're seeing you know, crazy aborts coming out. Try running this and try using it to see if you've got a JNI problem causing your error. Um, and with that, I'd like to hand it over to Jerome for some Gradle tips. Thank you. All right. Um, so as you know, uh, we've worked a lot on performance of build, whether the build should be incremental or full. And some of the effort that was led by this uh, performance work was the instant run uh, technology. Now, when instant run got delivered, a lot of people got confused about a few things. And I would like to clarify some of them today. So first of all, um, the way we do instant run is by doing bytecode instrumentation. And do, we do have a few fields and a few methods. So suddenly, some magic can happen, and you can reload a class in a living virtual machine without having to restart the application. Now, this adding of, of fields and methods have sometimes thrown people over the limit of the 65k uh, DEX file uh, limit. And that, a lot of people were confused by that and not knowing how to fix it. So I thought I should, uh, I should explain how it is. So basically, if you hit the 65k limit, which is just what happened here, I should probably make this a little bigger. So you should get a message uh, that will tell you that uh, you are over uh, the 65k limit. So as you know, the DEX file format only supports 65k methods or classes. Here I am at 70k. So to fix the problem, I just need to, uh, to define one more gradle thing to say, I want multidex to be true. Okay, so when that happens, and now we can try to build, uh, Gradle will start saying that we are allowing to build the application in separate different uh, DEX files. Um, now, there's two types of multidex in Android platform. There's what we call the legacy multidexing, and there is the uh, modern or native multidexing. And uh, depending on which platform you are you're targeting, we will use one or the other. Basically, the before 21, you will use the legacy one, and 21 and above, you will use the, the modern one. The problem here is that because we are targeting MinSDK 19, by default, the, um, the, the, the legacy multidex would be used. Okay? So we still got to build, and it's 12 seconds, which is going to be our baseline for today's demo. And we're going to see this number going down as I'm starting to improve uh, by different settings, this, this built environment. But first, I would like to change a little bit of code, just one line. And I'm going to change this, for instance. So we also get a baseline for the incremental build. So the incremental build, we just have one file. In theory, it should be much, fa much faster. But we're going to see that because we are using legacy multidex it's not going to be much faster. In fact, it might actually be more or less exactly the same uh, time. 11.5. OK, so we were at 12 for the full build, 11.5 for the incremental build. I cannot say that we are doing a great job at the incremental uh, building here. So first, what we should do is to try to switch to native multidex. Because with native multidex, the virtual machine is capable of understanding natively that an application can be packaged as several DEX files, and therefore, it is a lot less work for the build system to be able to handle this. So to do that, we're going to add a flavor. And this one is going to be, say, the legacy one. And that's where we're going to continue targeting 19. And then we have a new flavor that we're going to be calling modern. And this one will be targeting 21 and above. Now, if I go to the build variant, let's Let's think first. If I go to the build variant, I'm going to switch my legacy debug to my modern debug. So <clears throat> now that I'm going to rebuild, do not ask me this again, please. When I'm going to rebuild, I'm going to now rebuild with the modern uh, DEX file. And that's not going to make a huge change for the full build. So let's, let's wait until it's doing its job. 11.6, we were at 12, so it's not great, but slightly better. But where we're going to start seeing a big difference is when we switch, when we do the incremental build. Okay, so when, when the incremental build, 
uh, we were also at 11.5 seconds. Now we are at 6. So we already divided by 2 the build time. That's good, but I'm sure we can do better. Keep your claps for now. <laughs> First thing that you should always try to do is to use the latest Gradle plugin, because we always try to enhance stuff. Yes, sometimes we break stuff, but we try to fix it. But for most of the time, we try to make things better. And using the latest version will allow you to use the latest enhancements. So in this case, I'm going to switch to the latest version. And I'm going to continue building exactly the same way. But because I want to force a complete rebuild, let me clean it first. and run a full build. So here, I'm getting another type of message. And it's telling me that starting with 2.2, we made things better. You can now run your DEX in process, which is going to make things faster. But unfortunately, in this particular instance, you don't have enough memory. And therefore, we reverted to the old out of process stuff. So let's add more memory to the Gradle daemon. And I cannot stress how important this can be when you will start using the Gradle 2.2. You should really look into adding more memory to the Gradle daemon. So here I'm adding 4G, and I'm going to do exactly the same thing again. I'm going to clean the project so we get the new baseline for the full build. So in this case, the, uh, the message should be gone, and it is gone. So now we are now in process. and. We were about 12 seconds earlier. We are down to 9 seconds for the full build. It's pretty OK. Let's continue trying to see how much it would take to make an incremental change now. All right, 2.3 seconds. This is getting better. But we can do more. No, 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 we can do more. <clears throat> Next thing, instant run has been disabled so far. So let's put it back on. So when instant run is on, we will try to re-deliver the smallest set of changes each time you do a build. So again, let me clean it so we are sure to have a, a clean environment to start with. So Instant Run will not only try to reload classes in the virtual machine without even restarting the application, but it will also concentrate very much into re-delivering the minimum set of changes required. So in this particular case, <coughs> excuse me. In this particular case, when you change a single Java file, it will most likely only re-deliver the DEX file that corresponds to this single Java file. So that was the full build. Now let's change again this, and let's measure how much we are down to. 0 0.6. Now we are talking. I'm pretty sure. Right. Even better, I can go to 0 0.4. OK, so as you can see, we start at 12 seconds. We are now at 0 0.4. We have very little changes, very little work. We divided by more than 20 times the build time. Um, but let's do some other changes. For instance, let's take um, the, the, the source files here, and let's look into the main file. Oh, this is really small here. Actually, I don't have to do this. I can go to the app. So as you can see here, I've got a version code, which is 1. Let me change it to 5. And let's see how that influence the build. Three seconds. What happened? I was at 0 0.4, now I have at 3 seconds. Well, what happened is that we changed the main manifest. And when that happens, the only way we can re-deliver the manifest file is by re-delivering the full APK. So you can see how some of the changes that you make have a very strong influence. And knowing the tool, knowing what the tool does, is very important. Here, if you, for instance, are smart and try to change the version every single time you build by using the current time right now as your version, you're going to see that you will never, ever leverage instant run features. OK? So it's important to remember that. Um, but again, understand the tools. There's a lot of documentation about instant run. Um, I'm afraid we don't have time for QA. We have only 30 seconds. But uh, we will be uh, available outside for QA. And then we have the booth, which is right outside on this side for the Android Studio, where you're more than welcome to come and ask for further questions. Thank you very much.
were asking, uh, when is the Polymer team going to create a date picker in the material design style? Now, this is something that is not currently on the Polymer team's to-do list. We have a lot of elements that we've created. And right now, what we really want to focus on is sort of polishing those, closing bugs, and making sure that they work really well. So at the moment, no one is actively working on a paper date picker. And that, for a lot of folks, is sort of a dilemma. But if we go to customelements.io, we go to the search field, we can just type in date picker, or just date, whatever. And we can see right here, right away, we've got this paper date picker that shows up by this guy named Ben Davis. So let's scope that out. And looking at the component page on customelements.io, we get a lot of information really quick right here. So I can see, for instance, uh, how many stars this or how many stars this component has. I can see how many people have forked it and how many people are watching the issues on it. I also get the one-liner to install this on Bower. And what I think is, is maybe one of the most important aspects of the site, I get this activity panel here. And on the activity panel, I can see that the component was created a year ago. And most importantly, I can see that it was last updated 11 days ago, which tells me that this is still being actively developed. People are you know, contributing to this thing. They're patching it. They're fixing bugs. And, and it's getting a lot of love right now, which is important for anything that I'm going to add to my application. Also, we've got the uh, list of Bower dependencies down here on the right-hand side. And again, it's really valuable because I want to know that, hey, is this thing depending on the latest version of Polymer, or at least Polymer 1.0 and some version above that? I don't want an element that is Polymer 0.5 or, or Polymer 0.3 or anything. That's just not going to work in my app. So having all of this information just kind of at your disposal every time you go check out one of these elements is a huge, huge benefit and one of the main reasons why I think everyone should be using custom elements I.O. Now, the other thing that it does is it slurps in the readme for this element. So you can see here on the left, I've got kind of the, uh, the GitHub readme that's just been pulled into the website. And if you want, you can go down here and click on the, uh, the component page. And this is going to give you sort of the uh, classic Polymer docs style, right? You've probably seen these before. We can see properties that an element supports. You can see the methods that it supports as well. Uh, one of the things that I noticed was not showing up here. Usually up in the top right corner, there's a little demo button. It's not, it's not showing up on this page, but we can just add that by typing demo into uh, the URL bar. And now we've got our paper date picker showing up. And you can see this thing looks pretty nice, right? I can, I can go click around different dates. Uh, changing the month gives me these sort of cool material design ripple effects. Close it, and then I can click this button again to show you how it reopens. Uh, lastly, one of the things that's really important is making sure that the date picker is responsive. So I go grab the corner of my browser, start shrinking the page, and then boom, uh, you can see that it has changed its layout, which is really, really good for mobile devices. So that is just one element that uh, Ben Davis has produced. If you go back to his profile on customelements.io, you can see that he's got a few other items here, uh, uh, paper chip. Paper time picker, slightly different from a date picker. Paper full screen dialog. A lot of really interesting looking stuff there that hopefully we can show off in a future episode. So go find some elements on customelements.io. Go find the authors. Stock them. Stock them on GitHub. Stock them. Don't stock them in real life, but stock them on GitHub and, and on this website, right? So you can keep tabs on all the cool stuff that they're building. Another thing that happened last week was a lot of folks were asking, when's the Polymer team going to create a data table, something that is really sophisticated that I can filter, where I can you know, rearrange columns and do all sorts of stuff like that? Honestly, again, this is one of those things that it's, it's such a big undertaking. No one on the Polymer team currently has it on their to-do list. Because building a complex data table, you could, you could seriously just found a company just on making a killer data table. And in fact, uh, there's a group of folks who have done just that. So recently, a team called Vaadin released a set of elements, which they're calling Vaadin Elements. And very similar to the, the product lines that the Polymer team vends, things like iron elements and paper elements, they put out this set. And the bottom elements are split into kind of two categories. Uh, you've got these uh, business-oriented elements for things like data tables and combo boxes. They've even created an icon set of kind of businessy icons. Uh, and then they've also got a bunch of sort of data visualization components, bottom charts. Now, the uh, the core elements, as they call them, these these sort of business layout ones, these are all free and open source. They are Apache licensed, so you can use them in your project today. And then the chart elements, uh, those are a commercial license, which you have to pay for. Uh, but since a lot of you were asking about data tables, I thought this would be a really good one to highlight because it's available on GitHub, and, and you can mess around with it and use it today in your project for free. 
So if you go to their website, which is at vaden.com slash elements, they've got this little demo button. And if we click that, it's going to show us this cool expense manager application. So I'm going to scope out the live demo for this puppy. And we've got a really, really nice looking uh, experience here. So uh, kind of classic table layout, columns and headers. What I really like about this is there's these uh, these filters up at the top. So I can just like go and, and check some of these values. And for instance, checking in progress and reimburse. You can see over here the, uh, this, this, uh, the amount of items in the table is changing as I'm changing these values, right? You can sort of see them changing over here as well on the left. Uh, we can also look for different merchants. So I could say, oh, I just want to see uh, stuff from the, the taxi merchant, for instance. And we'll just get only the expenses related to that category. Uh, likewise, you know, we can search by min and max values. A lot of cool things you can do here. They've even got this little uh, floating action button down here at the bottom. So you can use that to open a dialog and actually add a new expense to this table. Really, really cool example. Really, really cool, powerful element. It's one of those things that, again, it's not on the Polymer team's agenda at the moment to build. But here you've got this awesome community-built project, which we can all start using in our own work. Uh, so yeah, that about covers it for today. I've, I know I've only shown a couple elements, but there's actually a, a big, long list of elements that I want to start featuring on this show. But before I get into that, if you out there, if you've got some stuff that you've built which you would like for us to show off, it can be elements, it could just be cool projects that you've built, please leave me a comment down there in the YouTube comments. Or you can ping me on Twitter at hashtag builtwithpolymer. That about covers it for today. So uh, as always, thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time. Ready? Yeah. 43, take two, second sticks. Hey there, Polycasters, Rob here. Uh, <laughs> I'm gonna pause for a second. Oh, Twitter notifications. Where where are we actually? Okay, glad you asked because I did think a little bit further than you. Since you've started driving and you've no idea where you're going, um, I thought since we went to the boozer in England, we could this time continue the trend but go to a vineyard. Ooh, yeah. that's uh... keep it classy. See now, look at this, right? I kind of feel like, yeah, all right. Like we did the pub before back in England. But I do think this is a slightly better view. Uh, how, how qualified do you feel? Not at all. Yeah, I know, I know you're going I'm, through this. It's, I know it's red or it's um, clearish kind of color. Um, uh, it's nice and it's not nice. It's one of those bi very binary with my wine yeah, tasting. And, and I have an upper limit of about five pounds or eight dollars. And if it's more than that, it's probably not worth it. Anyway, right. So I want to, since we're here, yes. I, I, we tend to talk about the web. Mm -hmm. And today I think is no different. I want to talk about libraries and frameworks. Ah, yes, because you're not big on the frameworks, are you? No, and neither are you. Uh, and on the other hand, I am not big on the frameworks. <laughs> yeah. Yes, yeah, so I don't think there's going to be much of an argument, but I do want to talk about it because it bothers me that I seem, I, I perceive that the default state of developers is I've got a blank page here. How am I going to fill it out? Ah, I need a framework. Which one do I use? That, that, is, uh, that is a problem I have with frameworks, that they have uh, a way of starting projects. Like they, they, There's a kind of expectation to use them from the offset. And yeah. I, I think if you're thinking, what, what combination of frameworks should I use to render this blank page, then I think something has sort wrong. of gone wrong. Yeah. Yeah. For me, it's, it's entirely from a performance point of view. Uh. I, well, no, it's not actually. But OK, step one, performance. If your page has to load a ton of JavaScript in order to make a request for the actual data it's going to display, yes. you've, lost the, you've lost performance. Yes. And you can sort of say, oh, but next time it's going to be cached. It's, it might not be. You and might have changed the code, busted the cache. And, and it's an assumption that somebody's going to come back again. Right? Well, well, it's, I mean, it's, it's your goal, I would say. It's your goal, but you don't know that somebody's going to. It's like paying a big, fat, hefty tax on the assumption you're going to get a repeat view. And That's you true. might not. That is true. You might not. Yep. And, 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 and stuff falls out the cache all the time. Yeah, exactly. So Not the service worker cache, though. Oh, you and service worker. Here we go again. Service worker! Da, da, da. One trick pony, Jake Archer. Uh, come on, but it's got a cache. You can rely on it. All right. Yeah. OK, performance, that notwithstanding. I think, for me, um, it's about code ownership somehow. It's about a level of trust that I don't necessarily feel. And what I want to do is I want to be able to 
feel like my application code is the thing that's running, that I'm not running through something else that I don't necessarily understand. Well, running through something else is fine because that's what a library is, right? That you've got, no, you're, 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 you've got hold both ends and you're running through bits okay. of library that you don't understand. Yeah. But that's fine because if one of them starts misbehaving, rip it out, <laughs> either Hot code spot. it yourself or find a, a replacement yes. library. But when, you, when you're going through something else, so well, you're in get... something else, I think, yeah, with okay. the framework. You're, 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 and, and the framework will vend you little bits of... It'll give you scraps, and then <laughs> please, you, you sir, do can something... can I have some more? I'd like to work with this application. <laughs> can you please send this data up More! <laughs> get out. But then the frameworks... You, you kind of... You're sat in a tiny bubble of, of the overall application mm. with a framework. And I feel like to get the most out of a framework, you need to understand how the framework is built. Mm. Like, and... And these frameworks are huge, so it's they really are. To do I that. actually feel maybe, and maybe this is wrong, but it feels to me like it's a kind of the decision is an ergonomics one. Like a developer saying, my ergonomics trumps the user's requirements. I want to feel like, you know, my job is easy, um, and what the user gets is what the user gets. Mm. And I, I've, my my whole approach is very much the other, other way. I'd rather go the extra mile, and all my users benefit, than my life is a bit easier and I'll take some of the, the bad performance or the, the tax of using that framework. Um, and so I don't think that frameworks are inherently evil and uh, to be avoided, but I think you want to be able to transition to one and say, yeah, now it feels like we're getting to the point where we're going to reinvent that. Mm -hmm. And I think you can only do that when you've got to a certain point with the build. So for you, it's start lights, start with libraries as when you need them, and then make the jump to frameworks only if you have to. Agreed. How you hey, doing? How's it going, Timothy? <laughs> I guess I'm screaming to the AO guys. You want to try it with me? Okay, let's do it. Ah! We're here at the ground floor of Google I.O. 2016. I'm here with Dion Almer. Dion, how are you doing? I'm doing really well. Yourself? I'm doing fantastic. It's go time. We are T minus two days. Yes. As you can tell from the forklifts and the array of things yet to be put in their place. We're going to make it, right? I think we're going to make it. Okay, I'm good. told we're going to make it. Good. We're going to sneak around and take a look at the I.O. grounds right before it gets done so you get a behind the scenes look at how I.O. 2016 came together. Let's do it. Oh, now this is a completely different micro environment. It's good. cool. It's very nice. And it's huge, too. I think there's going to be a lot of Android and some Firebase talks in here. Yeah, even some improv comedy. <laughs> is, is that in here, too? Yeah. OK, let's go find some people. OK, so Chet Haas is here to tell us about uh, the cool stuff that's getting set up. Have you had a chance to walk around at all? I walked into the tent where I was supposed to be. And did you get set up? I did. I did for uh, three different sessions that I'm involved in this week. Excellent. Is there anything that uh, you're going to announce that you don't want to tell our audience right now? Yeah, uh, we're, we're going to need to bleep out the following phrase and this next one too. Android... Not yet. Okay. What do you hope for this I.O. outside of your sessions? Really good developer engagement. Was that the phrase you were looking for? Yes, thank you. Excellent. And how are you going to achieve that engagement? So there's actually tons and tons of really good technical sessions yeah. that are going to be presented live in rooms where we can fit a bunch of people, as well as streamed live, most of them, as well as recorded. So they're available usually every year within about 24 hours of doing the talks. Um, <laughs> Thank you.
Hansen. Hi. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, welcome to day two of Google I.O. And uh, thanks for joining me this afternoon. Uh, hopefully the sun hasn't been too hard on your skin and you're not too sunburned. Um, so today uh, we'll be talking about uh, Project Tango and why we're pushing on this technology, uh, what we have today, and a little bit about, uh, I want to share with you a little bit about where we hope to go in the future. The road ahead of, ahead of us is really exciting, and I, I thank you for following us with on this journey. Slides? Nice. Oh, OK. So when we open our eyes, uh, something really amazing happens. Light and shadow uh, enter our eyes, and a large part of our brain, our whole visual cortex, starts to go to work and interprets these signals into edges and shapes. And we start to build a memory of things. We start to recognize what our environment looks like. Uh, we know what our room looks like. We know what our home looks like. And we start learning the space around us. And as we learn our space, we start to get familiar with where it's safe to walk, uh, where it's not safe to walk, uh, and how we adjust our movements, even in the slightest way, to avoid bumping into things. And if any of you are parents, uh, you are intimately familiar with or can appreciate the dangers and pains of misjudging your space around you, even just by a few inches. And some things in our environment are even more important to judge correctly. Even as adults, when the lights go out, we can sometimes take for granted that how important vision is to us. We start to fumble around and walk very cautiously. Uh, and the few inches can just be the difference between safe patch passage or a dangerous fall. Um, so our ability to navigate our space is pretty fun fundamental to at least our everyday lives. So just a reminder, Project Tango is our focused goal to you know, give our mobile devices and our tools this similar level of perception of space and movement. And ideally, ultimately, unify how people think about space and how our tools think about space. More and more, our phones have become increasingly sophisticated with more functionality. Uh, nowadays, uh, the, you phones used to be phones, and it's actually hard to remember that. Um, but now they have cameras that let us augment our memory, uh, communicate visually with friends and partners. Um, the sensors, which humbly started to help just with automatic screen rotation, now, uh, like accelerometer, accelerometers and gyroscopes, now provide the source of potentially health analytics uh, and even activity awareness for pattern recognition and context awareness. Uh, and now we're getting accustomed to simply being able to unlock our phones simply by touching them. And this then becomes the foundation for mobile payments. So the ability to track position and track movement and measure the environment are inevitable are such fundamental parts of how we operate as people that we see it as an inevitable direction. And in fact, we're starting to see uh, consumer products coming out in the past 12 months that start to incorporate these capabilities of positional tracking that enable new user experiences or advanced computer vision to do collision avoidance in the drone space. So just a quick reminder. Project Tango devices give three capabilities. Uh, there's motion tracking, which is the ability to respond to physical movement, so when I walk forward, left, or right. Um, depth perception, which is the ability to measure the distance to floors, the walls, and surfaces. And area learning, which is basically the device's ability to have some spatial memory, to recognize places it's been before. And that can be, done, that can be used to help with drift correction or allow, enable multiplayer experiences in the same space. Now, we've had a few sessions at Google I.O. going deeper into each of these, uh, some of these topics, so I won't be going into much detail here. But to achieve these cap new capabilities, we actually have to introduce new hardware. Uh, and if you've been following very closely, you'll be familiar with some of these. Um, but I wanted to give you a sense that this started about three years ago with a drawing that looked like this which is just a proposal for a tablet that had new, new sensors to do tracking, depth sensing, and immersion measurements units. And so a few months later, in 2013, we had our very first Android prototype. Now, it was a very clunky, bulky prototype. Um, and it worked, but it wasn't very pretty. 
And, but you can start to see that it has the first uh, components that we needed to do Project Tango. Uh, we have a sensor dedicated for motion tracking. Uh, we have integrated depth sensing. And then hardware accelerated vision processing uh, to do all the computer vision. A few months later, we pushed ourselves to uh, drive down on size. And we started using mobile phone class components and mobile phone class cameras. And this is important for manufacturability and cost down, as well as power reduction. Um, and so you, you may have seen these uh, as white phones uh, a few years ago. Then we decided to really push the limits on processing power with our tablet development kits. Uh, and this is what we showed off last year. Um, these include, again, the same three components. And the specifications for this tablet were actually well ahead of their time. Uh, the specifications in terms of processing power and RAM and GPU capability are only now being matched by phones being released today, uh, two years later. Over the past year, one of the things that we've been doing a lot is working heavily with Qualcomm to integrate support for these new hardware components into their Snapdragon processor board support package, or BSP. And for those of you who are familiar with how mobile devices are made, uh, the BSP is a package of software that phone manufacturers, or OEMs, receive when they want to build a new phone. And so this required creating new hardware abstraction layers, new uh, changes to the camera stack to allow not only the RGB camera to work, the motion tracking camera to work, and the depth sensor to work all at the same time, but also things like accurate time stamping. And so this means that any OEM that wants to build a Snapdragon-based phone will already have the major components they need to make a Tango-enabled device. So this unlocks the possibility for more forum phones, as well as more form factors, uh, such as wearables and robotics in coming years. And we're eager to see the incorporation of these features into those products. Now, the first of these products is the Lenovo phone that we've been working with uh, over the past year that you probably heard about from CES. And you can also see that it maintains the same pedigree in terms of the hardware components inside. We have the depth sensor, the motion tracking sensor, and our vision processing. Now, unfortunately, we won't be talking much about the phone today. Um, you'll be, have to wait for Lenovo's tech world uh, in uh, June 9th, in just a few weeks. Uh, but the event will be live streamed for those who can't attend. Now, the hardware is just part of the story. And in fact, most of the Project Tango team is composed of the software. So when you combine all this data, you have to put it together into a stack to interpret the signals into motion and, and sensing. So I wanted to give you a short video montage of some of the journey that we have from our very humble beginnings when we were a very small team to where we are today. If you could play the video.
So I'm also really happy to say that we've actually started to, we've actually incorporated the basic fundamental APIs for Tango into Android N. Uh, so what that means is that if you target an Android N device, you'll be able to see some new sensor types. You'll see the six-off sensor as well as a depth sensor camera type. And this means that you'll start to be able to write games that respond to the user's motion or be able to write apps that can measure the environment uh, and, as some, some of the things you saw in the video. Now, on, now remember, it's important to uh, know that these devices will only have the APIs enabled on devices that have the right hardware. This is similar to GPS. If you don't have a GPS module inside, the APIs won't be enabled. And on devices which meet our Project Tango specifications, there'll be additional libraries that help with things like area learning, depth, and meshing, as well as augmented reality samples uh, that have to do with things like time stamping and alignment with the RGB camera. But the integration with the Snapdragon processor BSP, as well as integrated, uh, integration into Android N, lays the groundwork for many, many new devices to come out with these capabilities. So let me give you some live demos of some of those components going, working in action. So if we could switch over to the tablet and uh, bring down the lights. Okay. So this is uh, just a reminder of what's happening underneath the hood. This is our motion tracking sensor. Uh, you can see it's a fisheye camera with uh, hardware accelerated feature tracks. And the, you see in the upper right hand corner how it responds to movement. And so this is the underlying piece of what the Sixtoff APIs will provide you if you write an app in Android in. And I can walk to this side of the stage, walk to this side of the stage, wave the device up and down. Oh, there we go. Wave it up and down, and it tracks. So one of the things we want to give to people who, who receive a Tango device, uh, a bit of a tutorial on uh, what it's like to uh, have these new capabilities in their phone. Um, so this is a, a, a sort of out-of-the-box experience that we've built uh, inside of Unity using our APIs. And so you can see it uses a depth sensor to actually provide a point cloud of the environment and kind of illustrates the fact that we're indeed capturing a 3D model of those scene. And we have some visitors. And if we walk forward, we can get closer to them. Uh, you see the edge of the stage there. So as I look around, I can get closer to the flowers, and it starts to build this virtual environment around me with plants and creatures. And they were visited by some friends. Oh, there we go. So you can create really wonderful experiences when you combine all the different pieces together. You combine tracking with depth sensing and the pass-through camera to transition between a handheld VR experience and a handheld AR experience. Now, we can get down to uh, perhaps slightly more uh, utilitarian use cases. Actually, I want to keep the lights down for this. Uh, and so this is our updated measurement app. Uh, we just call it Measure It. Uh, and what it does is it shows another way of combining the APIs to provide value to the user. So if we wanted to um, measure the width of this uh, cabinet, uh, you can see that we actually have a slightly updated UI here. We have this circular reticle with this green dot that wobbles around. The reason why there's a wobble is because what it does is it looks for interesting features to lock onto. So when I get close to this edge, 
you can actually see it snaps to the edge of the cabinet. And what this does is it allows me to get a very good snap of that wall. We can also do something a little bit fancier. So let me plus a marker there. And it also tries to maintain right angles. Uh, but what's also very cool is that we can now do volumes. So if I walk backwards, I can actually extract out a box. And you can see all the different measurements kind of overlaid onto the edge. So that's two foot four inches, thereabouts on each dimension. And if I take a picture of this, it'll save it to my gallery. And so if I'm working on some new cabinetry, cabinetry or kitchen work, I can simply take this picture. And you can see on the right side, it, it shows a picture on the left side, but in a schematic view on the right side, where it shows an orthographic view. And you can take this to the hardware store and say, this is, the, you know, this is approximately the size of the cabinets I'm working on. Now, being able to understand the physical size of things has been really interesting. So this is an app from Wayfair, who's one of the world's largest online retailers of furniture. And when you're shopping online for furniture, you typically have to scroll through a large set of thumbnails of couches and lamps. And you sort of have to guess. Oh, we keep the lights down for this, actually. You sort of have to guess um, you know, how big is it? Is it actually going to fit in my room? Do I have enough space? Um, so what Wayfair has done is they've started working with furniture suppliers to uh, acquire 3D models of, their, of the furniture in their store or their, their web store. So I have a small collection here. Uh, and we can select some items. And let me see how this chair looks. And if I pick a place on the floor, I drop it. It actually, that's the loading progress bar. <laughs> and it unpacks the box in front of me. So again, we get all the correct dimensions of the chair. We can look at it from different angles. Uh, we can decide if we like the fabric um, or how many chairs we can actually get into this space. Um, so let me pick another item. Uh, you can see I have this little lonely table right here. So let's uh, pick this um, lamp. Okay. Again, that's a 3D progress bar. And we can lay down the lamp on top of the table and uh, do the same thing. Now, you'll notice at the bottom, there's actually this uh, shopping cart with a plus button. Uh, I'm not connected to the Wi-Fi right now, but that button actually works. Uh, it'll actually populate Wayfair's main mobile app, and you can then make the purchase there. So this actually helps a lot, because one of the problems with online retailers is, especially in the furniture space, is that you often get a lot of returns. And so what this can do is re prevent or reduce the, the amount of uh, issues that you'll have. Now, we want to keep the, this one, we can keep the lights up. So you'll see I actually have this other little toy here. And one of the things, of course, we can do uh, measurement and shopping. But another thing that we can do is um, games. Now, some of you at I.O. last year may have seen a version of uh, this kind of mechanic. Uh, but this is a demo where uh, it's a much simplified version to kind of give you a sense of the subtlety and the type of interaction you can enable. So the volume may be a little high for this one. We'll check. We'll see. OK, there we go. So this is a, basically like a target uh, practice game. And uh, you kind of imagine you're in a training scenario. And I can look around and see all the different uh, targets. Now, if I just stand in one place and pull the trigger, it actually shoots this sort of um, uh, kickball back at me. I see this red ball and it comes and hits me back in the face. Now, in order to do well in this game, you actually have to dodge the ball that comes back. So if I shoot and take a step to the side, you can see that the ball goes past my, 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 my head. So if you actually really want to do well at this game, you have to constantly move. Come on. 
And then you can also see there's this tree here that you actually have to look around to see all the targets. So that's just another example of sort of the range of experiences you can do. Okay. I get to get the device out of the rig. There we go. So this last demo is actually from uh, the American Museum of Natural History in New York. And what they have there is an exhibit um, on the, the evolution of dinosaurs to modern birds. And this app was built in conjunction with the help of Guidego. What they've done is they've taken, sorry, I'm a little bit out of breath. Whew. But what they've done is they've taken the assets from their exhibit in the museum and uh, allowed you to create an AR experience at home with those assets. So let's bring the lights back down. Okay. So what we have on the right is actually uh, similar to the furniture shopping app. You can now search for dinosaurs. Um, so we all love the Velociraptor. Um, it's a very, you know, thanks to Jurassic Park, uh, it's a very um, well understood creature. Uh, so the polygonal model is actually the aesthetic style they chose for the exhibit. Uh, and they chose it to maintain sort of scientific accuracy because they don't actually know the exact details of the skin texture. And so rather than have a false texture, they decided to give a more abstract figure. So you can see he's here in front of me. He's interacting. If I push this little plus button on the right, he actually pauses and gives me some uh, these info buttons. So if I walk up to the tail, I can click on it. And it gives me a little bit more information about this particular feature of the body. Or I go here, and I can learn a little bit more about his wings. Now, what's also cute is if I could have my lovely assistant come up, Clay Bavor. Okay. Uh, let me uh, start it over so the animation will play. Uh, is that they've actually added this little camera button in the bottom. And you can essentially do sort of dinosaur selfies here. Here Three. Oh. There you go. <laughs> Three, two, one. There you go. And then email this to your friend. Thanks, Clay. Great. Actually, this, this one demo, we'll see if it works. I actually didn't test this one quite as much. But if it works, it'll be fun. So some dinosaurs are big. There you go. So he doesn't look too, too big, but if you look in the upper right, that's because he's at 20% size. And we have this little plus button here. And we can start to get a picture of uh, exactly how big he is in real life. There you go. Hey, buddy. There you go. Yeah, he's harmless. He's friendly. Okay. So let's go back to the slides. So you just saw, you know, five or six demos of apps that are either already in the Play Store or in progress for launch later this year. And this is just a small selection of dozens of apps that are already in the Play Store. So I want to give you a quick little montage of some of the other apps that are in progress that I didn't have time to demo today. So you can play the video.
So just a reminder, if you want to build a Project Tango-enabled app, you use standard Android development processes and tools and publishing. Your app just goes up on the Play Store, and your app has access to the APIs um, and detects them if they're on the device. So we have C, C++, Java, Unity, and Unreal support with sample code. Uh, and you can actually write one APK that you can distribute to all Android devices. And if you have the right code in it, if it gets downloaded on a Tango-enabled device, you, will have, you can check for those APIs and unlock new features in your app with a single distribution. So that's kind of where we are. But obviously, the thing we started with Tango is something sort of a, a journey. And we're definitely not done with that. Because we're very much in the early stages. And I know almost everybody says that. Um, but I actually really believe that. We're really just starting to scratch the surface. These APIs just start to unlock very superficial capabilities of what you can start to do with basic movement. But completely understanding our environment and the objects in it is actually still an open challenge. Uh, for example, I know that the podium here has uh, walls on the back sides of the, of the podium. But my device actually doesn't know that yet. The step sensor only tells it about the front surfaces. It also doesn't know that the podium is uh, potentially composed of many, many different objects. There's a shelf here and some equipment underneath. And it treats it basically as one large set of geometry. So uh, we also can't tell what, uh, for example, what the amphitheater might look like at night simply by seeing it once during the day. And that's something we've developed this immense human capacity and experience to actually be able to do. And these problems aren't actually going to be solved in the next one to two years. So we actually view that, uh, that it's similar to these other efforts of working on improved speech understanding so that you can have more sophisticated interactions with just your voice. We can allow cars to navigate traffic and ho safely transport us as home. Or investments in machine learning like AlphaGo to tackle increasingly difficult or ambiguous problems. So the Project Tango team is invested in focusing on giving our tools this perception of space and movement at a human scale. And we actually believe we can't do it alone. Um, the challenges here are so large uh, that many of the things, just like the ones I described to you, are built on decades of research. And Tango really is no different. Some of the same concepts used in our sensor fusion stack have pedigree in the work done for space exploration and robotics. The researchers had to combine the raw data from the cameras and the IMU data on the rovers to estimate its motion on Mars. And even some of the uh, researchers that worked on this original rover are involved in Project Tango in various ways. So we stand on the shoulders of giants. And taking on this understanding is really no small task. And it's actually the reason why we maintain a very open collaboration with research partners. Uh, and in fact, we have over 10 research partner institutions, either research labs or universities, uh, that we fund for doing uh, research work. Over 26 conferences, conference journals, uh, conference papers or journals, and 25 PhDs and master's students in various ways have been involved in the project, all contributing over 50,000 lines of open source code. Now, I want to show you uh, a quick video of things that are in progress or in development as part of these research efforts. Uh, some of these are done internally, but also some of them are done by our external partners. And these aren't things that are sort of committed to the product roadmap, but they're very much thinking about the direction we want to go and things we hope to one day become mature enough to be developer tools. So if we could play this video.
So just as with the introduction of GPS, it enabled new industries and new functionality that wasn't really possible before. But as these technologies find their way into phones and into our pockets, it suddenly became possible to navigate new spaces. You can now press a button, and the car, a car will appear and drive to you. You can find the nearest pizza or find a friend nearby. And the impact of the technology far exceeds what was, it was first initially conceived for. And so we imagine, like, wouldn't it be great to have a tool that allow you to find rooms and places that you've never been to before? Or wouldn't it be great to have a device that could help the visually impaired navigate through spaces with greater confidence or greater independence? It'd be great if emergency workers had a tool that could let them estimate the positions of their teammates in a, in a disaster area in real time. Or it'd be great to have the ability to walk through stories without tethers or cables. It'd be great to, if we could increase the speed or efficiency of package delivery, or even allow supplies to reach remote locations. And one day, it'd be nice to have robotic systems that share our perception of physical space to be better collaborators with their human counterparts. So we're seeking people who want to build the future with us. Uh, and we want to find colleagues in this space. So just a reminder, everything you just saw, including the things in the research video, were done with our Tango tablets and the data that they're actually able to capture. And these are available on the Google Store today. You can find the link from our website. And later this year, we'll see the first consumer device uh, with these capabilities in it with the project with Lenovo. Uh, I also want to give a shout out and thank you for all the partners that we have demoing here at the S Sandbox or were participating in the panel earlier today. Uh, if you haven't had a chance to go to the Sandbox, it's, I think, right by that corner. Uh, and you can try some of the demos. Uh, in the after hours this evening, we also have a treat for you. Uh, we actually have a 20-person multiplayer game where, where you can battle against uh, aliens in a game called Fantageist from Trixie Studios. Uh, it'll be in 8 p.m. in the Cassiopeia tent, which I think is in that direction. So that should be fun. Uh, there's also a dedicated session tomorrow on making Six Degree Freedom Gaming with Project Tango. So I encourage you to see that tomorrow at 10 a.m. Uh, and we want to help. Now, we don't have an infinite number of people on our team to do it, but there's some mechanics, that, ways that we try to help you create really great apps. Uh, first of all, we have periodic workshops. Uh, we have uh, developer engineering support. Uh, we also have the opportunity to feature your app on devices that may be coming out or featuring it in our Tango app portal if, the, if uh, you work with us. Um, we can connect clients with partners. Uh, we talk with a lot of different companies. And sometimes people have assets, and they simply need a viewing application. Or uh, there, are co there are opportunities for connections that we might be able to help with. And periodically, we have application RFPs or even competitions we'll announce. So to keep in touch, we have our website. Uh, we have our support email. Uh, we also have a, a, a reasonably robust uh, Google Plus page uh, with over 8,000 developers regularly posting updates about uh, related news as well as uh, their own apps um, and our Twitter handle. So I'll leave this page up uh, for those of you that want to take a picture of it. But um, thank you very much for coming. on the Android team like to say, perf matters. All right, thanks guys. I think we're done. Uh, who let him into the studio again? I just, I couldn't say no to Elijah Wood. But that's... Elijah Wood. Last episode, we used a decision tree as our classifier. Today we'll add code to visualize it so we can see how it works under the hood. There are many types of classifiers you may have heard of before, things like neural nets or support vector machines. So why did we use a decision tree to start? Well, they have a very unique property. They're easy to read and understand. In fact, they're one of the few models that are interpretable, where you can understand exactly why the classifier makes a decision. That's amazingly useful in practice. To get started, I'll introduce you to a real data set we'll work with today. It's called Iris. Iris is a classic machine learning problem. In it, you want to identify what type of flower you have based on different measurements, like the length and width of the petal. 
The data set includes three different types of flowers. They're all species of iris, Setosa, Versicolor, and Virginica. Scrolling down, you can see we're given 50 examples of each type, so 150 examples total. Notice there are four features that are used to describe each example. These are the length and width of the sepal and petal. And just like in our apples and oranges problem, the first four columns give the features, and the last column gives the labels, which is the type of flower in each row. Our goal is to use this data set to train a classifier. Then we can use that classifier to predict what species of flower we have if we're given a new flower that we've never seen before. Knowing how to work with an existing data set is a good skill, so let's import Iris into Scikit-Learn and see what it looks like in code. Conveniently, the friendly folks at Scikit provided a bunch of sample data sets, including Iris, as well as utilities to make them easy to import. We can import Iris into our code like this. The data set includes both the table from Wikipedia as well as some metadata. The metadata tells you the names of the features and the names of different types of flowers. The features and examples themselves are contained in the data variable. For example, if I print out the first entry, you can see the measurements for this flower. These index to the feature names, so the first value refers to the sepal length and the second to sepal width, and so on. The target variable contains the labels. Likewise, these index to the target names. Let's print out the first one. A label of zero means it's a setosa. If you look at the table from Wikipedia, you'll notice that we just printed out the first row. Now, both the data and target variables have 150 entries. If you want, you can iterate over them to print out the entire data set like this. Now that we know how to work with the data set, we're ready to train a classifier. But before we do that, first we need to split up the data. I'm going to remove several of the examples and put them aside for later. We'll call the examples I'm putting aside our testing data. We'll keep these separate from our training data. And later on, we'll use our testing examples to test how accurate the classifier is on data it's never seen before. Testing is actually a really important part of doing machine learning well in practice, and we'll cover it in more detail in a future episode. Just for this exercise, I'll remove one example of each type of flower. And as it happens, the data set is ordered so the first setosa is at index 0, and the first versicolor is at 50, and so on. The syntax looks a little bit complicated, but all I'm doing is removing three entries from the data and target variables. Then I'll create two new sets of variables, one for training and one for testing. Training will have the majority of our data, and testing will have just the examples I removed. Now, just as before, we can create a decision tree classifier and train it on our training data. Before we visualize it, let's use the tree to classify our testing data. We know we have one flower of each type, and we can print out the labels we expect. Now let's see what the tree predicts. We'll give it the features for our testing data, and we'll get back labels. You can see the predicted labels match our testing data. That means it got them all right. Now keep in mind this was a very simple test, and we'll go into more detail down the road. Now let's visualize the tree so we can see how the classifier works. To do that, I'm going to copy-paste some code in from Scikit's tutorials. And because this code is for visualization and not machine learning concepts, I won't cover the details here. Note that I'm combining the code from these two examples to create an easy-to-read PDF. I can run our script and open up the PDF, and we can see the tree. To use it to classify data, you start by reading from the top. Each node asks a yes or no question about one of the features. For example, this node asks if the petal width is less than 0.8 centimeters. If it's true for the example you're classifying, go left. Otherwise, go right. Now let's use this tree to classify an example from our testing data. Here are the features and label for our first testing flower. Remember, you can find the feature names by looking at the metadata. We know this flower is a setosa, so let's see what the tree predicts. I'll resize the windows to make this easier to see. And the first question the tree asks is whether the petal width is less than 0.8 centimeters. That's the fourth feature. The answer is true, so we proceed left. At this point, we're already at a leaf node. There are no other questions to ask, so the tree gives us a prediction, setosa, and it's right. Notice the label is zero, which indexes to that type of flower. Now let's try our second testing example. This one is a versicolor. Let's see what the tree predicts. Again, we read from the top, and this time the petal width is greater than 0.8 centimeters. The answer to the tree's question is false, so we go right. The next question the tree asks is whether the petal width is less than 1.75. It's trying to narrow it down. That's true, so we go left. 
Now it asks if the petal length is less than 4.95. That's true, so we go left again. And finally, the tree asks if the petal width is less than 1.65. That's true, so left it is. And now we have our prediction. It's a versi color, and that's right again. You can try the last one on your own as an exercise. And remember, the way we're using the tree is the same way it works in code. So that's how you quickly visualize and read a decision tree. There's a lot more to learn here, especially how they're built automatically from examples. We'll get to that in a future episode, but for now let's close with an essential point. Every question the tree asks must be about one of your features. That means the better your features are, the better a tree you can build. And in the next episode, we'll start looking at what makes a good feature. Thanks very much for watching, and I'll see you next time. So constraints, they're a great way for you as a developer to deal with the ever-expanding number of screen sizes, device rotations, and new form factors like slide over in the iOS world. But one unfortunate casualty in this brave new world of alignment has been the way we animate views. See, it used to be we could go around setting a UI view's position or frame with a fun little UI view animate with duration method and watch our view scoot around the screen. Oh, well, that was fun. Uh, but that's harder to do in a world full of constraints. Constraints don't necessarily play nicely with a view whose frame you're setting explicitly, as you can see here. Well, that leads us to this episode's quick tip sent in by Jacob Cho, a fan of Route 85 and a software engineer at Ensemble, a mobile app developer located in beautiful Vancouver, British Columbia. Jacob notes that many iOS developers forget that in addition to the old way of animating a view's position, you can also animate constraints in iOS. Let's look at how you might do that. Here's my storyboard, and as you can see here, I've got everything set up nicely using constraints. Now to move my UI image view on and off screen, I'm gonna to wanna to change this constraint here, the one that sets my image's leading edge to the leading edge of my super view. Right now it's set to minus 180, so it's off screen. So first I'm gonna control drag from this constraint into my view controller to make it an IV outlet of type NS layout constraint. This allows me to access it in my code. Now I can adjust it with a standard UI view animate with duration call. In this case, I'll change the constant of the constraint from minus 180 to zero so that it appears on screen, and now we can give it a try. Huh, well that's weird. The, the constant definitely changed, but what happened to my animation? Well, it turns out to get this constant to animate nicely, I need to call layout if needed on my view controller's view within this animation block. We'll give it one more try and, oh. That's much better. I now have a constraint that I can change within an animation block and everything animates smoothly to its final position, except in cases where I want to adjust something besides my constraints constant. Let's take a look at another example. Here, I wanna adjust this center square to expand or shrink to be either twice or half the width of its neighbors. Now I could do that in theory by adjusting the multiplier on the center views width constraint, but it turns out that changing that multiplier in code doesn't work. See, constraint multipliers are a get-only property, and Xcode will give me an error. So how do I change it? Well, the answer is I don't. Instead, I, can cre I create two completely different constraints and enable or disable either one as necessary. As long as I'm still calling layout if needed in my animation block, this kind of change will still animate. Now, there are two ways I can accomplish this constraint swapping. One way is to create both constraints in Interface Builder, like so. Now, Xcode will complain that these are incompatible, and it's right. So first step, we'll uninstall one of them by checking this box here. Next, we'll control drag both of these constraints into our code to make them IV outlets. And then I can enable or disable these as necessary in my animation block, like this. Once again, you'll notice I make sure we're calling layout if needed in our animation block, and we end up with a nice smooth looking animation. Look at that. The other way to accomplish this would be to create a completely new constraint in code. This is useful when I don't know in advance what I'm going to want this multiplier to be, and I need to create it dynamically. So let's see that in action. This time in my animation block, I'll first remove the old constraint. Next up, I can create a new multiplier. Let's make it slightly random just for fun. Ooh, hey, that is fun. Okay, next I'll create a brand new constraint with this new multiplier and assign it to my center view width property. And then I can add it back in again to my view. Finally, I call layout if needed on the super view in the animation block, and I once again have some nicely animating views that use this new constraint that I've created. 
And because this is all done using constraints, you'll notice this works as intended on an iPhone, an iPhone in landscape mode, or even, say, a slide overview on an iPad. And once you understand that this trick simply involves removing an old constraint and adding a new one, you might discover a whole new world of animation is available to you simply by turning on and off various constraints. For example, on this screen, I can change all my views to be either left aligned or right aligned simply by adding and removing two different groups of constraints and then calling our now familiar layout if needed method. Pretty neat, huh? Oh, by the way, one fun little quirk about all this, if you add your new constraints before you remove the old ones, iOS will complain about all the incompatible constraints it has to deal with in those like few milliseconds. So always make sure you remove the old ones first before adding the new ones. So thanks to Jacob for the quick tip. Jacob, you're going to get a very stylish Google t-shirt in the mail. But hang on, we're not done yet. You see, now that you know all about constraint animation, I have a couple more quick tips from one of Google's engineers about more efficient ways to implement it. So follow me on to the next video, because we're not done learning just yet. Click here. Click here. And uh, otherwise, I'll see you on Route 85. Bye. People love to use different mobile devices in different ways that suit their situation and lifestyle. Michael uses a phone to play games on the go, while Tony enjoys using a large tablet as he relaxes on the sofa. And Jen carries a small tablet in her purse for reading on the bus. But they all want to use your app on the devices they prefer, so you'll want to make sure they each have a great experience regardless of screen size, OS version, and the features of the app they use the most. It can be taxing to test each one of these situations so that all your users can be happy. We know you'd rather not have to buy and store stacks of devices and test your app in all these circumstances. That's why we built Firebase Test Lab for Android to make it easy and affordable for you to test your app with a variety of devices and be sure it works great for all your users. Our device lab, hosted in the cloud, offers a variety of physical devices ready to test your app. The selection of devices is always growing, so your tests will stay current with the latest hardware and operating systems. The easiest way to use Firebase Test Lab is to run a robo-test. This is an intelligent, automated test that crawls your app to discover and exercise its features. You won't need to write any additional code to make use of a robo-test. For more advanced testing, you can also script the interactions with your app to simulate specific use cases and verify that everything works as expected. Test results include a detailed report for each device used, including screenshots, device logs, and any crashes that may have occurred during the test. This allows you to verify that your app is working correctly on the variety of devices and configurations you selected. It's easy to make Firebase Test Lab a part of your daily development routine, and we have multiple ways to help you test regularly and spot errors early. First, you can use the Firebase console to upload and test your app. There is also a command line interface for testing with continuous integration servers, so you can automatically test every build. During Android development, you can deploy your app directly to Firebase Test Lab using Android Studio 2.0. And finally, in the Play Store Developer Console, there is a special automated launch test that will run for Android apps published to an alpha or beta channel. To get started using Firebase Test Lab and learn how to regularly test your app on different devices and configurations, you can start with the documentation available right here. Happy testing! Let's be honest, you're an awesome engineer with an awesome app and you are using threading to the max. Sadly though,